Hey, if you want to skip my little speech and get right to the content, here's the timestamp. For the rest of you, I'm guessing that this video will look a little familiar to you, huh? Yeah, well, I'm finally taking that next creative step I teased back at the beginning of the year. With all the changes that this new setup and graduation were going to bring, I knew I needed to buy myself some time, hence this upload. If you're down to watch all these videos again while you wait, you're a champion. I mean that. Thanks for being patient. Also, if you're looking for something new, I actually have some clear ad themed presents for you. First is an AMV of sorts that I made as kind of a thank you to the series and everything it's done for me. I used one of my favorite songs and all that and I think it turned out alright. The second, at the request of our good friend Fujikabidabidabida, is a compilation of all the funny moments I shared with two of my friends while I showed them clan ad over the pandemic. Now both of these videos will probably be struck down on YouTube, so I have them up on my Patreon completely for free. I noticed the other day that they let you do video now and it just seemed like a no-brainer since it's the only other social media that I have. I should probably expand that sometime soon, huh? So yeah, give those two a watch if you're interested. Thank you all once again for all the support over the last year. Also, special thanks to Bendy for providing the art for all the transition slides. Twitter and Pixiv are in the description. Give them a look, because there's a lot of great stuff there. And please enjoy the entire Clan Ad is Perfect for Me journey from start to finish. In the summer of 2020, I learned that I wouldn't be going back to college for the fall semester. There was, you know, a world situation going on. Honestly, I still don't know if we're allowed to say the P word on YouTube. So I was forced to stay indoors. I admit that it was nice to have so much free time at my disposal, but being cursed with extroversion, it got old pretty quick. Nothing I could do about it though. Nothing ever changed. And most of the time when things did, it was for the worse. But even so, I wouldn't trade the time I spent over the last two years for the world. You know, it's a little embarrassing to admit that I was taught that by a video game of all things, but here we are. I ended up buying Clan Ad on sale one day because I knew I needed something really long to play to keep myself busy during downtime, and that Kyoto Animation was the studio behind the anime adaptation. My friends caught wind of this, took a look at the price tag, and immediately jumped on my case about it. $50 for a glorified book? You know better, you stinky farmer. Ass. I can't believe Tota just took out a mortgage to buy the $50 visual novel. <laughs> Hate to break it to you guys, but nowadays, yeah, I think we're a little past 50 bucks. Obviously, I loved it. I loved it so much that even after four videos going in depth with the franchise, I still feel like I could talk about it for hours. So why don't I? This video series will cover the entirety of the Clan Ad visual novel from my own weird personal perspective. If you're down to indulge me in this, thank you, genuinely. Now, let's start this uphill climb, shall we? My name is Tota, and I've got about half a terabyte of footage to burn through. Clan Ad was originally released in Japan on April 28, 2004 by developer Key, known for their heart-wrenching slice of life, drama, comedy, romance, uh, action. There's some sports stuff in there too. I think it's safe to say their games encapsulate a lot of genres. And all of it was spearheaded by Jun Maeda, the original creator, one of the scenario writers, and composer of a good chunk of the soundtrack too, because fuck it, right? If I'm going to be born on this earth, I might as well be good at everything. So what is this game? What type of game is it? Well, it's a visual novel. For those uninitiated, it's like a choose your own adventure book for your console or computer. Text boxes move the story forward while character sprites and backgrounds visually convey what's happening to the player. The most famous example of one is undoubtedly the Ace Attorney games, with others like Danganronpa and Doki Doki Literature Club experiencing some mainstream success. From these examples, you might think that visual novels are heavily tied to anime, and you'd be right. They stand alongside manga and light novels as material that is frequently adapted into anime. Fate's Day Night, Higurashi, and Steins Gate are all great examples of this. By the way, that last one has an in-universe parody of Clan Ad called Kladan. As Itaru here explains, it's a visual novel that teaches you the meaning of life. Which, hey, he said it, not me. 
yet. So where can you play this life-changing work? Well, anywhere really. They kind of went nuts porting this game over to anything with a hard drive. Steam, PlayStation, Switch, you can get the game right now on all their digital stores. These ports are thanks to a Kickstarter from 2014 by Sekai Project, a visual novel publisher dedicated to western localization. It ended up raising almost four times more than its goal and the rest is history. Sekai delivered on everything they promised and then some, ensuring that anyone who speaks English could properly experience this game for years to come. By the way, if the name Sekai Project made your eyebrows twitch, then I'm guessing you've also had your eyeballs inappropriately touched by school days. The funny thing is, this isn't just a coincidence. Sekai Project was originally created by fans of School Days HQ who wanted to localize it, meaning that my ability to experience one of my all-time favorite pieces of media owes its existence to one of the worst franchises out there. Life sure is hilarious sometimes, huh? I'll tip my hat to you just this once, School Days. You win this round. Anyways, Xbox. You're a bit of a problem child, aren't you? If you want to play the game here, your only option is to get a physical copy for Xbox 360. You know, while searching to see if the game was on the Microsoft Store, I found a tweet from the official Xbox Twitter recommending the clan ad animated people. Kind of ironic that the only company out here actively praising clan ad's adaptation doesn't have the original game available for purchase. But hey, Xbox was never that big in Japan. By the way, Microsoft, here's my recommendation for you. There's a Patreon link in the description of this video. You should check it out because, you know, I, I heard it's pretty cool. Like, we're, we're, we're both clan ad fans, right? Yeah, yeah, you get it. I'm proud of you. Something worth noting is there are some pretty hefty differences between the PC and console versions of this game. The Steam version uses the older real live engine, while the Switch and PS4 versions use the more modern Luka engine, which was used for games like Little Busters. I'll be going over the differences between these two versions as they come, but for now, just know that real life has more options, like being able to name save files and skip through lines you've already read, while Luka Luka has a proper widescreen display and a sleeker UI. For the purposes of this series, I'm playing the PS4 version so you don't have to look at stretched footage for 5 hours. Speaking of playing, that's kind of what you do with video games, right? I think that's about all the history lessons I can take for one lifetime, so we're gonna jump right into the first route in the game. It's one of 13 in Clan Ad's first half, and once you complete a route, you go back to the beginning and make different choices to do a new one. Pretty simple, but where to start? Well. Luckily for us, Clanad has a route that's tailor-made for introducing us to all of its wonderful characters. So how about it? Are you guys down to play some baseball? Well, we'll get there. But first, we've got a ridiculous amount of prep work to do and a lot of new faces to meet. Upon starting up the game, we're greeted by a simplistic menu and a lone tree in a secluded area. Gameplay recording paused because you entered a blocked scene. Welp, uh, that must be the police. Okay, they told me they'd let me off the hook if I mentioned that this background is a stellar example of foreshadowing and symbolism, and that the menu music is equally important for reasons that I'll be getting into a long time from now. When you hit new game, you don't hop right into the meat of Clan Ad. We're first introduced to a side story that develops alongside each route. You'll remember this as the illusionary world story if you saw the anime. And while it's super cool and important for the true ending of Clan Ad, we aren't going to be there for a very long time, so let's put a pin in this and come back to it in about 40 hours. Tomoya Okazaki is a senior at Hikarizaka Private High School. His mother died when he was little, and he couldn't be on worse terms with his father. His right shoulder was dislocated during a routine fight with his dad over his gambling and alcohol problems, leaving him unable to lift his right arm above his shoulder for the rest of his life. Being a star basketball player, this destroyed his ideal path in life as well as any reason for him to live like an honest student. He's infamous around school as a delinquent, although it mostly manifests in him showing up late all the time and being about as approachable as an armed claymore. It still seems like he's the guy anyone would point to if asked to find the dictionary definition of the word worthless. So it's understandable that the first words we ever hear out of him are, I hate this town. There's just too many memories here I'd rather forget. Every day is the same. Go to school, see friends, 
dreams come home to a place I can't stand. Nothing new ever happens. I wonder if anything will change if I keep living like this. I wonder if my life will ever change. Already, you might notice some parallels between that monologue and the story I told at the beginning of the video. All I can say is get used to that. While walking up to the foot of the hill to school, hours late as usual, he finds a girl standing by herself who appears to have the opposite problem he has. She says out loud that even if people find fun and happy things to enjoy, everything will eventually change, taking them away. Tomoya asks this girl why she looks like that, to which she replies, this was Key's third visual novel and is far from their best looking work, but you get used to it pretty quick. By the way, the character designer, Ataru Hinoe, calls all the female characters she creates her daughters, which is pretty neat. Oh, that's cool. And about that first thing you said, just go find new stuff to be happy about. Simple as that. And so, they begin to climb the hill together. That evening, Tomoya visits his closest friend, Yohei Sanahara, at his dorm because screw going home while his dad is still awake. He's getting great by a member of the rugby club for playing his music too loud. Ladies and gentlemen, meet your comic relief. This guy is stupid. He's insensitive. He's like a feral fucking dog sometimes. And he is also one of the best bro characters a delinquent could ask for. You're never going to be bored while listening to the crap that comes out of his mouth, that's for sure. Tomoya, being the ideal role model he is, constantly abuses this guy and gets him into trouble, sometimes for good reason, most of the time not. They've got a strange relationship to say the least, and I know what you're thinking, it's not as tasteless as it looks. We'll get into why things are the way they are when Sunohara's time to shine comes. For now, just understand the character archetype he falls into. After choosing whether or not to record over Sunohara's one-of-a-kind mixtape with an improvised rap, yes, this is the first choice you make in this game, we see Nagasa Furukawa at the foot of the hill the next day. Her story is that she has a frail body, and a fever that afflicted her for months last year robbed her of graduate. Situation. The few friends she had left for college or the workforce, leaving her all alone, unable to find the courage to even go to school anymore, which is why Tomoya crossed paths with her yesterday. If that wasn't bad enough, this poor girl motivates herself by saying the name of the food she wants to eat for her next meal. But it's not all doom and gloom for Rip Van Onpon here. She's got the two best parents in the world who will be meeting soon, and yesterday, out of nowhere, some guy in the same grade as her took upon himself to give her the push she needed to take a step forward, even if he doesn't realize it himself. In between classes, the class president, Ryo Fujibayashi, comes to talk to Tomoya. While appearing similar to Nagasa, she distinguishes herself with this layer of boldness and craftiness hidden underneath her timid exterior. It's a somewhat difficult trait to notice without going down her route, but Kaginato, a crossover show for several key franchises and the best thing ever made, amends this by dialing that shit up to 11. I highly recommend it, and I'll hopefully be referencing it several more times in the future. But for now, back to Little Miss Fainthearted. And Fainthearted indeed. Tomoya lightly picks on her when she tries to hand him papers, and she starts to cry. Now, I know this looks bad, but for the sake of doing this route correctly, we're going to have to pretend we didn't notice. Fourth period is about to start, but this class sucks, so let's just walk out and head to the library to kill some time. You know, it just hit me that nothing says freedom and gameplay quite like social deviance. Swinging open the door, we find Kodami Ichinose, a genius girl who's exempt from going to classes because she's just that smart. You wouldn't think that after meeting her though, because not only is she a total airhead, she's currently using a pair of scissors to show a page from a library book what for. Tomoya obviously stops her, and after talking to her for a bit, she seems weirdly friendly towards him, almost as if they've met each other before. Eh, I'm sure it's nothing. If anything, thinking about it will only distract us from the biker gang that just pulled up to the school. As Tomoya and Sinohara watch from a window along with the rest of the class, a lone girl steps forward and confronts them. She beats them all up in like four seconds, causing Sinohara to cry BS. Little does he know, Tomoyo Sakagami is the real deal. A proud honor student that appears so respectable, it'd be hard to believe that she used to be one of the wildest delinquents this town has ever known. We meet Masai Sagara back at Sinohara's dorm, the dorm mother who basically runs the place. She's kind of similar to Tomoyo in the sense that she seems pretty responsible and often finds herself reprimanding others for being dickheads. I wonder if those two would end up getting along if they met each other. Also, I want to pause the introductions for a bit because I have to talk about this game's sense of humor. I understand that it isn't the type to tickle everybody's funny bone, but
but it matches mine perfectly. If you couldn't already tell from the way I write my videos, saying or doing something stupid with a straight face is peak comedy to me, and Tomoya here understands this all too well, while advising Sunahara on what to say to Tomoya in order to seduce her for this stupid plan he has. He tells him to rapidly do Hindu squats while saying he's seriously looking for a girlfriend, strike a perfect bowling pose while asking her to make him breakfast every morning, and when Tomoyo gets weirded out and tries to leave, he says this is the critical moment, take off your pants in order to lure her back. Tomoya's narration is overflowing with personality and charm, effortlessly creating funny moments from little more than his inner thoughts. Take this scene where his teacher calls on him. Instead of statically describing what happens, he chooses to narrate like this. A voice calls out to me right as the period ends, but I quickly realize it's just my teachers. Like a good student, I decide to ignore it. This isn't limited to just him either. Believe it or not, every character we've met so far has a metric ton of funny lines to throw our way. For example, when Sinahara gets shoved to the side by Tomoyo out of nowhere for blocking the doorway to her class, he gets called weak by Tomoya. This prompts him to respond with even a Buddhist master can't win against a surprise attack. Anyways, while looking for somewhere to kill time, Tomoyo finds Fuko Ibuki sculpting a block of wood in an empty classroom. She runs away and tries to hide from him the second he sees her, plus she exclusively refers to herself in the third person. Well, this is already promising. One thing I'd like to mention is that by now, you might notice that Tomoya has incredible chemistry with every character he's interacted with so far. You know the feeling. Their conversations flow effortlessly and every new idea they bring to the table is bounced off of perfectly. And there isn't a single character in this game who does this better than Kyo Fujibayashi. She's Ryo's twin sister and her polar opposite. A violent, sharp-tongued, yet excessively charming girl. And for my money, the best female lead a visual novel route could ask for. As you might have guessed, she and Tomoya are two peas in a pod, always riding on the same wavelength, especially when they're bullying Sinahara. Check this guy out. He's concerned about that now. <laughs> By the way, Kyo has a pet boar named Botan. You might recognize him as that little pig you see to the left of the subscribe button you just pressed. Thank you, by the way. While looking for a good spot to sleep during class, Tomoya remembers the reference room exists, and it's there where he meets Yukine Miyazawa. She's an incredibly kind and attentive girl who makes Tomoya coffee right after meeting him. Seeing how far he can go with this, Tomoya jokingly asks her to dance with him, and she happily says yes. Wait, what? Okay, you're weird. See you again in some other route. The next day, Tomoya gets roped into a dispute between an electrician working on a lamppost and a disgruntled passerby whose car was dented right under the streetlight. He accuses Yusuke Yoshino here of dropping one of his tools, which he denies. He also drops some lines out of nowhere that are so embarrassing I can't help but find them hilarious. After the incident clears up, Tomoya helps Yusuke finish his jobs, and it's absolute murder on his body. Yeah, that's a one and done for sure. I doubt he'll ever choose to have a job like that in the future. That evening, he learns from Sunohara that this man used to be a famous singer, and that his sister is a massive fan of his. The next day, Kyo tries to ram Tomoya with her bike at 40 miles per hour like the merry prankster she is. But, should we choose to jump right after sensing the danger, she crashes into somebody else. Meet Kape Haragi. Who the fuck? Okay, so this is the only prominent clan ad character who didn't make his way into the anime in some form, so I doubt that most of you recognize him. Sorry, I just, uh... You're not terribly important to me. <laughs> I wonder why he wasn't included. Maybe it's because he turned in this god-awful resume he drops on the ground to Kyoto Animation. I don't know too much about the world of business, but I'm pretty sure threatening to sue your potential employer for no reason isn't the greatest strategy for getting hired. That night at Sunahara's dorm, Masai walks in to tell him that his sister is on the line. But he's in the middle of something right now, and for the sake of this route, we're going to refuse to speak to her in his stead. Sorry, May, but you've officially been kicked out of the introduced in the first video. 
video club. However, through the power of editing, we can invite her back in. Her whole shtick is that she's related to Sinohara, yet is somehow not a dipshit. In fact, she's about as capable as they come. Her funniest moments are the ones where she handles the situation like someone who's been dealing with stuff like this for decades. Okay, we're almost through with introductions now. There's just one more guy we need to meet before we can play some baseball. But, in order to get to him, we're going to have to shoot him first. One day at the dorm, Sinohara menacingly puts a gun and a strange device on his table without saying anything before explaining that this is just laser tag equipment. As far as we know, there are four other people playing. Sinohara, Kyo, Tomoyo, and a mystery man who recruited Sinohara in the first place. The losers have to grant any request the winner asks of them. Tomoyo joined because she wanted to force Tomoya and Sinohara to come to school on time. Kyo joined because she heard Tomoya was going to be playing, which is about as ominous as it gets. Thanks to my input, Tomoya decides to join too, and thus kicks off the greatest game of laser tag the world has ever known. The carnage begins the second Tomoya agrees to play, because Sinohara here never intended on giving him a fair fight. Unfortunately for Sinohara though, he makes a tactical error by imagining what he's going to force Tomoyo and Kyo to do if he wins, giving Tomoya enough time to grab the gun on the table and put him down. His next steps are to go home and get changed considering how late it is, but walking the streets is a dangerous game. To increase his chances, he elects to bring Sunohara along as bait. The second he steps outside the dorm room, another door from across the hall bursts open. A shadowy figure rolls between the two dumbfounded men and fires one shot, killing Sunohara for the second time. It disappears into the night, never to return. While Tomoya is safe for now, he begins to doubt his chances of surviving tomorrow. During break, Tomoyo approaches him in the courtyard, spouting some nonsense about how being late to school is bad and how having a good sleep schedule can only improve your life. The mad ravings of a hired gunman. As focused as Tomoya is though, he knows he won't be able to beat Tomoyo in a standoff. Even after Sunohara creates a distraction by getting kicked in the face, he reconciles that it's not enough. Instead of pulling the trigger, he decides to warn her. By the way, Tomoyo, you know you're also breaking school rules by bringing a toy, right? His gambit works, and a stunned Tomoyo is swiftly defeated. Back in the classroom, Ryo walks up to Tomoya as both him and Sunohara reflexively point their weapons at her. <laughs> She hands him a Joker card and says if he goes to the bathroom right now, something good is waiting for him. Noticing the obvious trap, Sunohara takes initiative by holding Ryo hostage. They slowly make their way towards the men's room as he makes his demands for Kyo. Either come out with your hands up or we're tossing your sister into one of the bathroom stalls. Not much of a threat, but hey, what can you do? Even so, Tomoya decides to stop him because he feels bad for dragging her into this, but as he goes to do so, he sees sees the barrel of a gun reflected on the bathroom mirror. He twists his body as he readies his weapon, opening fire on the mirror. One of the shots bounces off and claims a confirmed hit on Kyo. That's two out of three down, however the greatest threat of all still looms. Assuming they're safe since only students can enter the school, Tomoya and Sinohara return to their classroom. The second school lets out though, a man leaps through the classroom window even though it's on the third fucking floor and fires several shots off while snaking his way through the desks. Tomoya decides to make his way to the athletic grounds, removing his opponent's ability to take cover. Just as they get there though, they notice the baseball team sprinting towards them. Looking behind him, Tomoya notices a mountain of dirty magazines. They've fallen for his trap, and the barrel of a gun swiftly appears behind Sunohara's shoulder. He dodges, and the perpetrator reveals himself to us. He mocks Tomoya for being cocky after only defeating three opponents, saying that he took out 20 other people already. Ready, giving way to this legendary line. However, respecting his grit, he offers him a fair fight. The wind kicks up dust from the ground as the two men stare each other down. Tomoya makes the first move by grabbing his bag and throwing it towards the man. He takes off after it, and in a split second, it's over. Tomoya's gun is placed firmly against the man's chest and vice versa. The triggers are pulled at the same time, and both alarms go off. Turns out though, the man only tied because he's 
stopped to pick up some bread that fell out of Tomoya's bag when he threw it, saying it's an old habit of his. This is a Kyo Furukawa, the best thing about Clan Ad, no question. If somebody tells you otherwise, they haven't played the game, and they're lying if they claim they did. He's Nagas's father who lives in a bakery that's run by the family. This includes his wife Sanai, who's been the title holder for the Sweetest Woman Alive competition for 18 years and counting. Anyways, the next day Tomoya bumps into him and he demands that he assemble a baseball team to play with him, citing the game from yesterday as grounds to force him to do so. Tomoya is hesitant, but Akio is a benevolent man, so he offers him a choice. Either play baseball or I'm pouring barbecue sauce in your eyes. Well, look on the bright side, after meeting so many people over the last few days, I'm sure we'll be able to assemble a team no problem. Sinahara joins because Tomoya strokes his ego. Kyo and Tomoyo join because they lost the laser tag game. Masai joins thanks to Tomoyo's desire to play with her. They bring Fuko on board because she's a slippery little bastard. Yusuke joins the team after Tomoya tells a romanticized lie about the essence of youth or some shit. Mei gets called over by Sinahara because, as I said, she's a big fan of Yusuke's. And that makes nine players. Thankfully, everybody shows up, including Fuko, who drops the best line in the visual novel upon arriving. The ensuing baseball game is genuinely fantastic. I won't narrate it like I did with the laser tag game because time is precious and it took me 40 minutes to read through the entire thing, but I'll at least give my two cents on it. This game's primary goal is to reward the player for investing the time to meet with as many characters as possible in one run. It shows off several dynamics that we see very little of in other routes. For example, we learn Masai and Yusuke knew each other from high school, and they have this weird dynamic where they appear hostile towards each other despite it feeling like there's no bad blood between them. Also, I believe this is the only time in the game where Kyo and Ryo meet Akio, which is super cool. When you love every character in this game, seeing them interact in different combinations of each other is one of the most exciting things that can happen in the story, even though it's pretty trivial plot-wise. Regarding the actual game, it's pretty engaging if you're into baseball. Tomoya narrates the whole thing from start to finish like a play-by-play -play commentator. The action is fast, and Tomoya's words are precise and to the point, giving you a clear picture of what's taking place without an ounce of padding to get distracted by. It's also worth mentioning that everybody's personalities really shine in the way they play. Sinohara is ridiculously cocky and pays for it by ruining every play he's a part of. Tomoyo hits a grand slam at her first at bat, gets self-conscious about her overwhelming strength, and spends the rest of the game trying to hit the ball like a normal person. Fuko exclusively hits Texas leaguers for easy singles. When Nagasa has to replace Akio as the pitcher after he gets injured, she's awful at everything. But good luck staying mad at someone as sweet as she is. Mei is far more capable than she has any right to be. And whenever Yusuke gets on base, he gives this grand monologue about how he's providing these kids with a formless gift known as a memory. And you know, for once, he isn't completely delusional. See, one thing you need to know about Clan Ad is it places a heavy emphasis on the importance of relationships, especially those between people who consider themselves family. There's only so much you can accomplish without other people by your side. There's only so much you can tolerate. There's only so much you can grow. The first of many points Clanad is going to convey to us is just how much we need each other, baseball being the perfect metaphor for this theme's introduction. Akio says it himself, you can't win at baseball on your own. And while this ragtag group may have no business going up against some of the best this region has to offer, they'll be damned if they go down without putting up a fight. Tomoya must have thought the same thing as he stepped into the batter's box during extra innings, Akio's words of encouragement propelling him forward, words so meaningful that Tomoya must have missed a part where he told him to bring victory to a town that he hates. But who knows, maybe he's starting to change a little. Either way, as the pitch is thrown, we catch a glimpse into the future. The high schoolers on the team all graduated, most of them are in college now. Masai is still a dorm mother, and the Furukawas still work at the bakery, but Tomoya has no reason to visit either of them anymore, so he stays away. Yusuke is still doing electrical work. However, after a while, Tomoya stopped seeing him around town. Sunohara went back home to the country after graduating to find himself a job. It seems like everybody grew apart after that day, and honestly, who could blame them? It was a miracle that they all came together in the first place. Every now and again, Tomoya thinks back to that one game of grass lot baseball, and it never fails to bring a smile to his face. This beautiful snapshot moment where several people from
from all walks of life came together to make something great happen. Just remembering it is enough to restore his spirits and propel him to take on each new day. It was never about winning or losing, it's the camaraderie that counted. And, well... I guess Tomoya's walk-off home run was pretty cool too. As the credits roll, we see everybody's stats from the game. Sinahara should be embarrassed. Nagasa is one of the worst ERAs in the history of the sport. And for some ungodly reason, the opposing team is called the Smells Like Teen Spirits. Well, sorry, Clan Ad, but while stuff like that would normally make me laugh, your mistake was having one of the greatest credit themes in the history of fiction. Although, you know, the name doesn't seem too applicable for this particular route. Nine shadows stood victorious on the field that day, each one harboring one of the most precious memories they'll ever have. Godspeed to the glorious Furukawa Bakers. You might have been the biggest oddballs at the party, but hot damn, you sure were the life of it. Legend has it there is one place in Hikari Zaka High where one must never go. It is known as the library, and no, you shouldn't avoid it just because there are books there, for something far worse lurks in the shadows. While she appears to be little more than your average high school girl, you would be wise not to underestimate her. Her destructive output is catastrophic, and her weapon is the violin. Any human within a three mile radius of this device's sound wave blast must escape within half a second, because if they don't, they will succumb to a severe medical condition known as death. And if you don't believe me, I have a recording here of this monster in action. Don't worry, the audio has been adjusted to make it relatively safe for human ears. Now you fully comprehend the dangers of dealing with the... Wait a second. YouTube has, like, rules against showing carnage like this on screen, right? That's, uh... <laughs> uh sorry. Sorry about that, guys. I, I was just kidding about all that. Kodomi Ichinose is a kind and innocent a girl who would never commit such atrocities. And now, on to our regularly scheduled super wholesome program that does not and will not contain any of the following. Murder. Enjoy the video. Welcome back to Clan Ad is Perfect for Me. Today, we're diving into our first character route, and one of the main five at that. See, Clan Ad may have 13 routes in its first half, but Nagisa, Kodomi, Kyo, Tomoyo, and Fukos are the main attractions. They're the ones that you see on the cover of every box, and it's clear that more thought and care was put into their stories compared to the others. In short, you're in for a treat today. And seeing as how this route has very little connection to the others while still being a great introduction to several of our main characters, it only made sense to do this one next. On April 15th or 16th if you missed it the first time, Tomoya makes his way to the library in order to get some shut-eye during class. Little does he know, Kodomi Ichinose is also playing hooky here, and she catches his eye by pulling out a pair of scissors and committing unspeakable acts to this book. Are you fucking kidding? I, I just said murder was off the table. Thankfully, Tomoya stops her, and the awkward yet engaging conversation that ensues plunges us headfirst into one of my favorite things about this route. You might remember my first Clanad video where I used Kodomi's anime arc as an example for Clanad's superb use of foreshadowing. Well, this route is still the king in that regard, and since the visual novel has a hundred times more dialogue than the anime, we get a metric ton of hints dropped at our feet. For example, here are a handful of things we see during Kodomi and Tomoya's first few interactions. When Tomoya catches her cutting up the book, he asks her if her parents ever taught her how to take care of public property. Kodomi seems very relaxed and easygoing around Tomoya. She doesn't seem to understand what's embarrassing about feeding him during their first interaction together, and she tries to get him to sit with her shoulder to shoulder. This is all coming from a girl who's absolutely terrified of meeting new people. On top of that, she gets confused when Tomoya asks her for 
for her name. Tomoya himself mentions that something seems familiar about her. They also set up a callback by having her tell Tomoya she'll see him tomorrow. I'm sure everyone watching who knows this story is banging their heads against a wall right now wondering how they never noticed any of this stuff. To be fair though, Tomoya does a pretty good job covering the game's tracks. See, he's the type who likes to stay out of other people's business, and he tends to make incorrect assumptions about things due to his low self-esteem. Depressing stuff, I know, but it sure made life easier on the writers. He never considers the possibility that Kodami is specifically interested in interacting with him, even when he describes his absurd interactions with her to Sunohara. Anyway, the library you obviously didn't know about is down the hallway. A mysterious cute girl is there by herself reading really complicated books. If you talk to her, she'll give you a snippet of a page as a gift. She feeds you lunch sometimes too. I realize that saying it out loud makes it sound really fake. Despite making that realization, he sends Sunohara in anyways because why would he expect him to be treated differently than he was? And about keeping out of other people's business, there's a scene where one of the lunch ladies straight up says Kodomi's parents were great scientists, and he doesn't think twice about it. The best part is, these reactions Tomoya has work twofold. Not only is every little hint being slowly swept under the rug before it becomes too obvious, we're getting some great characterization for our main protagonist too. This isn't where this whole foreshadowing thing ends either, but you might find that this next piece of the puzzle has an entirely different gatekeeper. Now, if you all will, please turn your textbooks to page 576 and read the assigned passage. Oh wait, sorry, that's just my Patreon page. <laughs> How did that get in there? Uh, no, turn to page 577. The Dandelion Girl is a 1961 short story by Robert F. Young that follows Mark Randolph, a 44-year-old man taking a two-week vacation in a cabin by a lake. He's all by himself since his wife got called into jury duty and eventually the boredom got to him. He makes his way through the forest, searching for something to pass the time, eventually finding himself on a hill staring at Julie Danvers, a 21-year-old who claims to be from 240 years in the future. Their conversations begin with playful intrigue as Mark admires her youthful outlook and outlandish storytelling, but as the days go by, he finds that his interest evolves into love. Good going, dipshit. The wife leaves for two weeks and you go and find yourself somebody half your age. He tries to shake off these feelings, however, every time they part, he always finds himself asking if she'll be back to tomorrow. On the final day they meet on the hill, she mentions that her father passed away and she feels as though she has nothing to live for. Mark comforts her and asks if she'll come back tomorrow as always, but she says she only has one more use of her time machine left. She never returns, and Mark's wife appears a little more dejected and fearful than usual upon returning home. One day she leaves to go play bingo, giving Mark time to sift through the attic. It's there where he finds one of Julie's dresses, weaved with material he doesn't even recognize. It's here where he learns that she was telling the truth about being from the future, and that she used that final time travel to meet him when he was 21 and become his wife. It's a nice little story whose strength lies in the mystique and wonder it instills in the reader. Kodami seems to agree, because several times throughout her route, we see her quoting Julie's most famous line. <laughs> You probably don't get where I'm going with this yet, but trust me. By the end of this video, you're going to be writing a strongly worded letter to the CEO of plagiarism. That sentence was brought to you by somebody who doesn't know where you go to complain about plagiarism. I find that Kodami's character shares a lot of the same strengths as Julie's. She's a very strange and mysterious person, and the things she says serve to pique your curiosity further. But seeing as how Clanad has a much higher word count than Daffodil Female here, Kodami is going to need a lot more more than intrigue to keep us hooked. Luckily for us, her likable personality and excellent chemistry with the other characters is more than enough to drive interest. Here's a perfect example of what this genius space case has to offer you. Tomoya decides he'll read a book one day and asks Kodami for a recommendation. She offers him books from two languages he doesn't speak and one about how the human brain has special functions that can't be replicated by computers. Um, how about something more normal, like a best-selling novel? She tilts her head to the side and returns to her books, pulling out a rather depressing looking one coated in all black. She tells him it's not really a novel, but it's a bestseller in many countries. Oh great, that sounds really- <laughs> It's the fucking old- 
Testament. I'm a simple man. I see funny, I'm interested. And as usual, Tomoya's winning personality shines through in all the little observations he makes while interacting with this strange girl. But best of all, these two are far from alone. A big part of the first half of this route is devoted to helping Kodomi find more friends, as she isn't making any just sitting in the library and reading all day. Let's think about this. Who does Tomoya know at the beginning of each route? Well, there's a certain pair of purple-haired twins who come to mind as well as this one girl who he found standing still at the foot of the hill to school the other day. He introduces Kodomi to them one by one, starting with Nagisa. As you might have guessed, her people skills are as awkward and hilarious as they come. Hey, master. I am a scientist. It's so cool! Instead of a bitch. Surprisingly though, these two hit it off immediately. Nagisa has the uncanny ability of matching the pace of whoever she's conversing with, leading to these overwhelmingly adorable interactions. If Kodomi introduces herself in some strange way, Nagisa will introduce herself back exactly like she did. If partway through their conversation, Kodomi starts a random word game, Nagisa will happily follow along. And while Tomoya did the same thing, he would stop it early on with some kind of retort, while these two could very well go on forever. On the opposite end of the spectrum, Kyo is thoroughly unamused by her introduction. Whether it's out of genuine principle or just wanting to be mean to Tomoya, probably a little of both, she argues that friends are something that you make, not something others give you. Which is why three days later, she approaches Kodomi herself and befriends her. Ryo gets into her own tomfoolery by having Kodomi participate in her fortune-telling hobby. She tells Kodomi me she isn't going to make any friends tomorrow, which is about as uncalled for as it gets. The thing is, she doesn't even own tarot cards, so she uses playing cards to read fortunes instead. These things have no meaning. You could have just said she's going to make a bunch of friends and leave it at that, but no. I wasn't lying last video when I said this girl is crafty. She's a schemer through and through. Do I really look like a guy with a plan? Yes, yes you fucking do. Anyways, the five of them all meet up in the drama club room to hang out, and thus one of the greatest group dynamics I've ever witnessed is born. I'm just gonna like gush for a minute because these five are so much fun. I love these characters so much. They perfectly capture that exhausting yet endlessly warm and rewarding feeling of having a lively group of friends. The kind that you hang out with for so many hours that before you know it, the day is over and you can't wait to do the same thing tomorrow. No cares in the world, no talks about the future, just having a good time in the present moment and staying like that for as long as possible. They've got their own inside jokes, like Nagasa being branded as the evil drama club president whose spite and malice knows no bounds. Kodomi Ichinose Mark 1 is an all-purpose appliance robot that everybody should have in their homes. And Kyo is known far and wide for her favorite hobby, bullying the defenseless. <laughs> Okay, I know I've been kind of mean to her throughout both this video and the last one, but don't get the wrong impression, because during this part of the route, Kyo steals the show. Her extroverted personality is the driving force behind everything this friend group does together, and her dynamic with everyone else is undoubtedly the strongest out of all of them. She serves as the much-needed straight man to this group's unusually high number of timid and clumsy girls. If she wasn't here to help mediate when these three get up to their usual antics, I'm pretty sure Tomoya would have gone insane. The cherry on top is Nagasa and Kodomi actually adapting to Kyo and Tomoya's verbal abuse over time and learning to retort themselves. Speaking of which, giving Tomoya a like-minded person to talk to while Nagasa, Kodomi, and Ryo are off in La La Land was a really good move. She has this great conversation with him where she mentions that Ryo and Kodomi both have feelings for him. Tomoya is pretty indifferent about it, which is to be expected, but the intrigue comes from why Kyo is even telling him this. It seems innocent enough, but the way she says it makes it feel as though this is anything but someone simply informing their friend about an observation they've made. Made. Couple that with their ridiculously stellar chemistry and I soon found myself fighting the urge to drop Kodomi's route then and there to migrate over to Kyo's. All in due time though. Anyways, I could go over the many hilarious jokes that come from these five, but we really should be getting back to the plot of this route soon. I'll just wrap this part up by mentioning that when they all first start hanging out, there's a day when Nagasa enters the drama club room while everyone's inside and then immediately leaves. For context, she's been sitting in here after 
school by herself for days because nobody wanted to join the club. A short while later, she comes back into the room and says I saw a bunch of people having fun, so I thought I was in the wrong room. <laughs> so far, the story has been just this, fun moments with friends while in the background you can see every little bit of foreshadowing being meticulously stacked up into this glorious structure. You've got everything I've already talked about plus this strange man who Kotomi avoids and refers to as the bad guy. There's the fact that Kotomi and Tomoya start dating after Kotomi asks him out. There was the whole violin thing where Kotomi's playing is so bad that it just straight up, uh... It makes it so people fall asleep, but forever. And finally, Tomoya's been having a lot of strange dreams lately. Most are related to a fire that he can't put out, and then there's this one which has the best line in the visual novel. All of these things feel like random events, like they don't go together whatsoever, so I wouldn't even blame you for missing the setup. But when Clanad decides to topple all the pieces over, you feel it just as much as you hear it. Out of the dozens of hours of footage I have recorded of this game, my audio capture only peaked once right here, and the reason it did was because of Kotomi's presumed overreaction to a grim misunderstanding. See, Nagasa heard that a bus got into an accident in town and knew that Ryo was currently riding one to school. She assumed she must have been the one on the bus that crashed and rushed to tell everyone. Ryo shows up shortly afterwards and informs them that she's all good, and so are all the people who were in the crash, but that doesn't stop Kotomi from going into hysterics. They take her to the nurse, and she quickly stops coming to school afterwards. The news hits the group pretty hard, and Tomoya's initial reaction is so incredibly sad, yet so beautifully indicative of who he is as a person at this point. Earlier I mentioned Tomoya's negative viewpoint of himself, how he's unable to see how much the time he spends with others means to them. When Kotomi works for hours to make a lunchbox, specifically to share with him, the only thought he has is I'm such an ass for eating half her food. He constantly put up walls while interacting with her, insisting to himself that they live in completely different worlds, that there's no way they'd have anything in common. This is far from the last time he does this, and for those of you who know Kotomi's route well, you might not believe me when I say this isn't even the most ironic example of it. Kotomi's personality doesn't help his situation much either. There's this tinge of guilt that comes from hanging out with somebody who only wants to do what you want to do. Because because no matter what they say, it always seems like they're straining themselves for your sake. When Tomoya oversleeps the day of his first date with Kotomi, he rushes over to their meeting spot, and she tells him with a smile that she's only been waiting for an hour and ten minutes. No frustration, no concern. What the hell is he supposed to make of that? But regardless, while Tomoya may have a knack for losing his cool in the moment, he always tends to come to the right conclusion after thinking things through. Who cares that he thinks he doesn't know enough about her. The fact of the matter is he cares about her, so let's go fix this. Hey, super cool homeroom teacher who I wish the game gave a name to. Give me her address so I can go find her. After cleverly checking to see if Tomoya has Kotomi's best interests at heart through casual conversation, the teacher lets us in on some important information. 1. Kotomi used to be bullied quite frequently as a kid due to the widely televised success of her parents, giving context to her fear of bullies which has been prevalent up until now. 2. There have been talks about Kotomi Kotomi studying abroad in America, and she just gave them the go-ahead this morning, as if to confirm that she plans on running away from this. And finally, Tomoya is given her address on a small slip of paper. The teacher asks him if he's dating Kotomi, a question that he dodges twice in a row, causing her to change it to this. Do you think that you being around Kotomi is having an influence on her? Tomoya thinks to himself that this is an even harder question to answer, but ultimately he says yes, stepping past his self destructive thoughts and acknowledging the fact that he means something to her. It's a positive change for sure, but the teacher's comments afterwards bring light to the trade-off. The burden of saving her has now been placed firmly on his shoulders. If I let her go overseas, I'll never see Kotomi again. Tomoya makes his way to her house, a place far too large for just one person to stay in, and as he reaches for the front gate, he stops himself. This wasn't the way he used to get in. He makes his way to the 
the back of the property and goes through a hidden entryway, landing him in an overgrown and hopelessly unkempt garden. This isn't at all how this place is supposed to be. He makes his way through the house and into the study where he sees Kotomi lying on the floor surrounded by scraps of paper. We learn that Kotomi's parents passed away several years ago in a plane crash, and I would just like the court to know that it was a freak accident, not murder, so we're still clear on that front. Uh, anyways, a lot of the puzzle pieces the first part of this route laid at our feet are now falling into place. And in order to fill in a few more, how about a flashback from Kotomi's perspective? Her parents are two of the greatest minds of the era, and they're currently researching a newly discovered hidden world of sorts, where true happiness manifests itself into balls of light. That sounds pretty interesting. Maybe we should keep it in mind for later. But being big shot scientists leads to busy schedules, and the two end up needing to take a flight overseas to attend to quote unquote sudden business during Kotomi's birthday. Kotomi is obviously not okay with this. She was looking forward to her birthday for weeks. Mom was going to make a ton of great food. Dad was going to get her a giant teddy bear as a gift. And who knows, maybe that guy Tomoya who she made friends with recently will come too. She tells her parents that she hates them over and over again as they head out the door, despite their endless apologies. They leave her with these parting words, be a good girl and wait for us. Why they didn't just hire a babysitter is beyond me, but I guess they just trust her enough to let her be by herself. Admittedly, there are three or four instances in this part of the story where you can nitpick the actions of some characters, but ultimately I feel these complaints are trivial in the face of this route's phenomenal storytelling. Of course, seeing as how her parents are getting on a plane, you probably know what happens from here. And, okay, this is gonna sound really bad, but I think the prolonged focus on the despair that Kotomi feels afterwards is fantastic. Her parents' colleagues, including that man who we've seen a couple of times now, come to tell her the news, and she locks them out of the house. Their minds understandably appear to draw a blank on how to handle this situation, so they decide to hang back and just watch over her for now. Kotomi finds herself all alone in her home. The phone rings constantly, and whenever she picks it up, it's a member of the press trying to get an interview. Eventually, she cuts the phone line to make it stop. She becomes hyper aware of her environment. Noises such as the static from the TV that she never paid any mind to previously now make her jump, a telltale sign that her mind is currently being ruled by fear. She remembers her parents mentioning once that God is watching over her, so she looks up into the sky and prays, saying that she thinks the plane crashed because she was a bad girl who said she hated her parents, and that if they came back home, she'll be a good girl from now on. She questions what she'll do once the meals her mom left in the fridge for her run out, leading to a line that made my heart sink even though I was reading it for the second time. Tomoya never showed up to her birthday despite receiving an invitation. Little did Kotomi know he didn't come because he was ashamed that he couldn't convince any of his friends at school to come too. Same old Tomoya, I doubt he even considered that just him showing up would have been more than enough. And finally, Kotomi makes her way into the room she's sitting in today and burns what she thinks is the last surviving copy of her parents' groundbreaking research paper. Of course, after the fire started, the men moved in and put it out. It's all so much. Tomoya knew her in the past, but forgot all about it, possibly out of shame. Kotomi's lived her entire life since then studying so that she can understand her parents' work, and she cuts their names out of every book she could get her hands on as a way to atone for what she did to them. And this is the problem that he chose to solve. What can he do? What can he even say? All he musters is a request for her to come to school tomorrow. She refuses, but he insists once again before leaving. The next day, he finds himself once again at Kotomi's doorstep after she doesn't show up to school. Nagasa is also here after getting her address from that same teacher from before, and she lets it slip that the rest of the group is planning on doing something for her birthday in three days. She also reinforces the responsibility Tomoya has to Kotomi by telling him that he's the only one who can fix this. Inspired by her words, he decides to do something for Kotomi on his own. And what could be more meaningful than restoring the place where they played so often as kids to its former glory? Their own little hill in the forest clearing, if you will. I think this is my favorite part of this route. The next three days are spent mowing, trimming, picking, planting, and painting until Kotomi's yard looks exactly like he remembered it. They take you through the entire process, from screwing up initially to researching the proper 
proper methods to working himself to the bone day and night to get everything done on time. It really makes you appreciate the amount of effort that's going into this gift for her, and it doubles as a beautiful indicator of how much Tomoya has grown since this route started. See, he's been subtly changing ever since he got in touch with Kotomi again. We first see it when he agrees to Kyo's request to go buy drinks for everybody while they're hanging out, much to her surprise. We see it again when he asks Kotomi if she'll read to him, a request that she made to him several days earlier which he fervently denied. And now here he is, the aloof and apathetic delinquent, dipping into the savings he was going to use to leave his father's home and cutting class much more than usual because to him, there's something much more important that he needs to focus on. Of course his mind wavers from time to time and we're actually given the option to give up twice while he's doing this. The first one comes when he finds out that the violin the girls were going to give to her as a birthday gift was severely damaged by a reckless biker. The second comes when he continues to work on the yard into the night. After choosing to press forward the second time, we see a strange orb of light descend upon the garden and it disappears as quickly as it appeared. At this point in the overall story of Clanad, I doubt this means much to you, so let's just take it as a sign that we're on the right path and keep going. After his work is complete, he gazes upon this wonderful little yard and takes a seat at the freshly painted table in the middle. He remembers the book that Kotomi gave him a while back, containing a story that she loved very much as a kid. You might recall its name, which- <laughs> wait. He fell asleep. I know that they did this so that he could have a dream sequence that ends with Kotomi coming out of her house once again, but I can't help but adore the fact that this dude just straight up fell asleep reading an 11 page story. Anyways, Tomoya recalls that she and him memorized the first conversation the two main characters in that story had, and he decides that these should be the first words he says to her as she stands in the doorway to the garden. I suppose you traveled here by time machine. These are the words of a man who met the person he's speaking to in the past but was unaware of this fact. The girl he's talking to is someone who was devastated by the loss of her only family, and she ended up falling for the man, only to meet him again while he's at a much different age and do it all over again. I think this is one of the best examples of taking inspiration from another work and making it your own, and we see Clan Ad's spin on it clear as day in this exact scene. Just when Tomoya thinks he has her, Kotomi puts her head in her hands and laments that doing this won't bring anything back. What she did can't be undone, and the memories she made with Tomoya as kids can never be relived. After she mentions that she should have died alongside her parents, Tomoya runs up and hugs her, begging her to never say that again. She tells him she's scared. Scared because no matter how much you care about somebody, one day they're going to go away. It's a sentiment that anyone who's experienced the opening minutes of this story is all too familiar with. Fun thing things, happy things, they'll all eventually change. But even so, can you still love this place? Tomoya reassures her that no matter what happens, he'll never truly leave her. And then they make me remember that this is one of those special stories where romance actually has a purpose. It deepens the route's connection to its inspiration, and it makes the conflict so much more emotionally meaningful than if they were just friends. While I love the anime to death, its inability to let Tomoya get too close to any one but Nagasa hurts its adaptation of this route in my eyes. Anyways, we've still got some business to attend to before we ride off into the sunset for today. The girls give Kotomi a voucher for her violin because it hasn't been repaired yet, and Nagasa drew Dongo characters from this big Dongo family children's franchise that she's super into all over it. As they're about to go to class, a teacher tells Kotomi that the man who, like that one teacher, unfortunately does not have a name, would like to talk to her. Tomoya says he's not a bad guy at all since he's talked to him quite a bit already, and Kyo suggests that they go hear him out together. When they arrive, the man directs Kotomi's attention to a briefcase sitting on a table. It's pretty beat up, but it looks as though it's been repaired quite a few times, as if it's been passed through the hands of several people. Upon opening it, she finds a teddy bear and a letter. The letter's envelope asks whoever finds this briefcase to please take it to the writer's daughter, and while the signature is cut off, Kotomi can tell that this 
suitcase came from her parents. The man explains that they believe the suitcase was thrown out the window as the plane crashed, and it washed up on shore after a very long time. Whoever found it and opened it up became compelled to fulfill the letter's wish. Nobody knows how many people it was passed on to. Nobody knows how many countries it traveled through to get here. But here's something we do know. As the man explains, that envelope Konami burned when she was little did not contain a copy of her parents' paper. It was actually a catalog for teddy bears. So I'm glad it got burned. Think of all the things we learned for the people who are still alive. I'm going to hell. And in the spirit of replacing research for stuffed animals, the man explains that Kotomi's parents, in their final moments, must have taken the actual research paper out of their suitcase in order to make room for their daughter's birthday present, hoping that maybe, eventually, it will reach her. The letter, beginning in her father's handwriting, explains that the world is beautiful and that no matter what happens, it's always important to keep your head up, mirroring the words Tomoya spoke to her back at her house. After picking up the teddy bear, Kotomi breaks down and tells her mother and father welcome home as this wonderful song that only plays during this route begins. There's this collage of the message on the back of the envelope translated into several different languages, showing us just how many people made an effort to fulfill the request of these loving parents, which is a callback to something that Kyo said an hour or so ago. I think that's really cool, and what's this weird liquid shit coming out of my eyes? In the last video, I mentioned that Clanad puts a heavy emphasis on the importance of family, and I gotta say, after experiencing this route again, I can understand why clear as day. And it's wrapped up together perfectly by the last thing we see before the credits roll. A well-maintained backyard, which you can tell somebody has cared a great deal for. There's a table with two chairs in the middle of it. In one chair you'll find a precious gift from Kotomi's family, and in the other you'll find exactly the same. Things may change, family may be forced apart, but even so, nothing will stop this girl from looking ahead and enjoying her time with the people she holds dear in this spacious garden of hers. And before we get kicked back to the title screen, we see Tomoya's outstretched arm accepting a familiar looking ball of light into his hand. I don't know about you, but something tells me we'll be seeing more of these things in the future. I've never cared too much for sea stars. Sure, I loved Spongebob growing up just as much as the next early 2000s kid, but I've always found the real things to be unsettling. I mean, they're basically indestructible because they can grow back any part of their body that's been destroyed. They eat stuff by ejecting one of their stomachs outside of their bodies to begin digesting it, and some of them can have up to 40 arms. It just looks creepy. Honestly, I think there might be something wrong with you if you find these things cute. Cute and oh wait, so that's how this wraps around to Fuko. Huh. I'm not a very good writer, am I? <laughs> Welcome back to Clanad is Perfect for Me, and out of all the characters in this game's cast I could be talking about, today we're getting stuck with the runt of the litter. Not to suggest that she's a bad character, in fact I'd easily put her in my top 5, but let's just say this might be the first time in history where liking a character has its own learning curve. See, Fuko is... Fuko. She was born in Tokyo Bay and grew up as a tetrapod. She's renowned in her neighborhood as being the most fair player of all. She talks about herself in the third person, and her sister's name is Isogai Taguchi. These are all bits of information we're given throughout this route, and only one of them is true. I'm like a minute into this, and I've already given myself a headache. You know, I think I need to get my facts straight before we dive into this route, which works out nicely, since during the beginning, you're mostly hanging out with Nagasa. You have to go pretty deep into her route before pivoting into Fuko's, about halfway by my count. All because Nagasa is a very important character in Fuko's story. We'll see why soon enough. For now, I'm going to spark notes this stuff so we can get to the little starfish gremlin faster. So Nagasa wants to reform the drama club, but can't because no one will join. Tomoya helps her out because he notices that he feels happy when he's around her. Sunahara joins in and they act as temporary members in order to reform the club. But when the choir club wants 
wants the same advisor as them, Nagasa gives him up because she's too nice. And that's about where she gets introduced to Fuko. While you're going through this part of the route, it's your job to actively seek Fuko out and interact with her, learning all these little tidbits as well as setting yourself up for the greatest achievement in video game history. It's no secret that Fuko is a big fan of Starfish. And another thing we learn really quick about her is that she goes into this weird state of euphoria whenever she thinks about them. Tomoya being Tomoya is not going to let these openings pass him by, and we're given a slew of pranks to pull on her whenever this happens. The best part is the circumstances of each opportunity are different every time, so the same prank can have a different outcome depending on where you are in the story. Plus, every time you do one, it levels up. To get a prank to max level, you need to do it twice, and if you get them all to max level in one playthrough, you are awarded with the Fuko Master achievement. So let's get this straight real quick, because I don't think you understand the magnitude of what I just said. There is an achievement in this video game where you are rewarded for bullying one of the main characters, and your progress in being a professional asshole is represented by skill increases as if you were playing an RPG. This is the dumbest and most wonderful thing I've ever seen in a game. Words cannot express how much I love this small edition. Speaking of things I love, Clan adds characters. A lot of them get a chance to shine in this route, and they all do a phenomenal job. Fuko's up first. Our favorite little weirdo can be found in an empty classroom scratching away at blocks of wood in order to create these little starfish sculptures. She's doing this because she wants to invite a bunch of students to her sister's wedding, and she estimates that she'll need about 700 of them. Putting two and two together, Tomoya quickly realizes that this is the entire student body. That's absurd. Beyond stupid. And Tomoya makes sure to let her know that. Even so, her commitment to this goal is so strong that it's impossible to not find it admirable. Time and time again, she brushes aside any and all distractions in order to keep her eyes on the prize. Sure, she might get her carving wood by stealing it from the art room. And sure, she might have illegally set up camp in this classroom to make starfish day in and day out. But forget about all that for a second. I said that liking this character has a bit of a learning curve, but the best gateway into being enamored by her insanity is growing a fondness for her unwavering determination. Hey Fuko, you've been at this for like 13 hours, and I'm pretty sure you aren't even going to class. Do you want to take a quick break to go eat or something? The only thing Fuko's hungry for is victory, motherfucker. <laughs> And once you're on board the Fuko train, you'll learn real quick why she ended up gaining an in-universe fan club of devoted appreciators. Like with almost every clan ad character, it all comes back to chemistry and humor. This dastardly trio of stupidity, overconfidence, and stubbornness combines to make some of the most charming character interactions I've ever witnessed. For example, hey Fuko, try saying Tokyo Tokyo Kyokaku, yeah I can't say that. For example, hey Fuko, try saying this phrase three times fast. Yeah, sorry, but that's not going to cut it. I sentence you to the $1 million tier on my Patreon for three months. I don't actually have one of those, so you better get used to making alts, buddy. Thanks in advance. As always, Tomoya's observations and retorts bounce off of her perfectly, and on top of that, he's the same wonderful character we all know and love. I know it's probably dumb to applaud a story for keeping its characters consistent, it's something that's just expected, but I think you have something really special on your hands when you can throw a character the audience understands and adores into a new situation while keeping them intact. If you've seen the other videos, tell me if his actions in this route sound familiar at all. Tomoya befriends Fuko, becomes aware of a goal that she has, and gets so personally invested that he drops everything to help her. You could consider it him fulfilling his own crushed dreams of being a basketball star vicariously through her. He changes from an apathetic bystander to a devoted advocate, and while he's doing this, he questions if anything he's doing is really helping her. But after getting the full story of her circumstances, he realizes what he needs to do and goes out of his way to take action and be there for her when she needs him. If you played this route after finishing any of the others, you'll notice so many beautiful parallels. Low self-confidence, huh? Oh, that must be my boy! In all seriousness, as trivial as this seems, I absolutely adore this about the writing in Clan Ad. And now that we have a route or two under our belt, I can finally talk about it. No matter which path you take in this 
this game, no matter how much he grows and changes, he's always himself. And as time has gone on, I've realized that this is an aspect of good writing that I really appreciate. Speaking of good writing, Mitsui here is a wonderful foil for Fuko's big dream and a grim reminder of her unusual circumstances. You might remember me saying that Fuko lives at school, which is a little odd. Well, apparently she got into a car accident on her first day as a freshman and now she's a senior. It's unknown how much time she spent away from school, but Mitsui here tells us indirectly just how isolated she is now. She's introduced as Fuko's only friend, and when she interacts with her, it seems like they're little more than acquaintances who have only seen each other once or twice. This nails home the fact that she was unable to make a single friend when she started high school, and this loneliness really spoke to Nagasa, who's going through something similar after repeating her senior year. Nagasa is absolutely wonderful in this route. She has so much personal stake in Fuko's story, and it was effortlessly implemented without a single element feeling forced. There's the connection she made with her own circumstances to Fuko's. There's the fact that Fuko's sister Koko was an art teacher during her first senior year who gave her courage, much like Tomoya did at the start of this year. And finally, her caring personality ensured that she would never be able to leave Fuko alone. In fact, she's the one who initially convinces Tomoya to help Fuko out. She tells him it'll be exciting, which is a callback to the excuse Tomoya gave her when he was trying to explain why he wants to spend time with her. She's such a sweetheart that she internalized this throwaway excuse and then brought it up again when she saw an opportunity to use it to make both him and Fuko happy. Like, <laughs> just turn the video off, we're doing Nagas's route now. Oh, looks like the police are back. <sighs> Alright, I am now obligated under the law to continue talking about Fuko's route. I guess I can meet them in the middle and talk about how great Nagas' parents are in this story. I've mentioned it several times before, but for reasons that we'll get into soon, Fuko is kind of homeless now. Nagasa decides that she should stay at her place, and Tomoya is hesitant because he doubts her parents will accept a complete stranger into their home. His fatal mistake was underestimating the warm and inviting nature of the these two. They take her in and instantly treat her like family, a running theme we'll be seeing a couple more times in the future. It's almost aggressive how quick they are to accept and love new people. Welcome to the family, son. Hey, you. Finally awake. It's something Coco wishes she'll be able to say to her sister sometime soon. To explain, after that accident her freshman year, Fuko was sent into a coma that she has yet to wake up from. This means that the Fuko we see is some kind of ghost. And if you weren't aware that Clanad has supernatural elements in it, here you are. It's actually foreshadowed in a pretty clever way. If you're in your classroom on the 23rd, you'll hear two guys gossiping about a ghost girl who was in a traffic accident. I believe you can experience this in multiple routes, so it can serve as a nice little teaser as well as some slight misdirection. Tomoya does this himself in the anime when he wonders if Kodomi was the ghost girl they were talking about. Anyways, Koko. She's Yusuke Yoshino's fiance, who you'll remember is that electrician guy who used to be a singer. She's quite similar to Sanai in terms of temperament and personality, so the two of them get along well. And you can tell just how much she cares about her sister from the way she acts. For example, she always buys extra bread from the bakery whenever she visits on the off chance that Fuko wakes up today. Some of this kindness is driven by guilt, however, as before Fuko got into the accident, she was ignored by Coco for some time. She thought it would be a good way to force her to make friends, but obviously that didn't happen. This contributes heavily to Fuko's loneliness and longing for familial love, something that Akio, Sanai, Nagasa, and Tomoya give to her without Coco's knowledge. That's cool in its own right, but this guilt is the the cause of something much more important for this story. As she explains, Coco is holding off on having her wedding until Fuko wakes up, and now you see the problem. While Fuko's ghost works tirelessly to invite people to her sister's wedding, Coco is passively waiting around for Fuko to wake up in order to have said wedding. And on top of that, Fuko can't meet with Coco to explain the situation for reasons we don't understand yet. The person behind it all can't find out. It's a catch-22. 
and none of that was fun. Now, that, that sounds horrifying. Why would you even ask that? Anyways, two quick things before we find out why these two can't meet. First, take note of the fact that Coco wishes a hospital would be built in this town. I'm gonna blow your mind in like 10 years with this when I finally get to After Story. Second, Sinahara does a great job inserting himself into the plot of this route. As we'll soon see, he plays a pretty big role and shows up quite often, which is a great change of pace from Kodomi's story. I barely talked about him during the last video because once Tomoya finds a girl to hang out with, he just tosses Sinahara to the side. You can't keep getting away with it! Props to the writers for constantly finding natural ways to reintegrate him into the story. Alright, now it's time for the moment you've all been waiting for. The first hour or two of every clan ad route is full of lighthearted buildup with tons of funny moments. And then the game takes a septic tank and pushes it through a fan. <laughs> this guy doesn't have a clue what he's talking about. This clan ad ain't shit. Things start to go wrong right before the Founders Festival. For the last few days, Fuko has been handing out her starfish wedding invitations like always, but recently she's gone from having mixed reactions to being straight up ignored. The number of people who do this increases by the day, and Nagasa's encouragement is the only thing that keeps Tomoya and Fuko's hopes up. Tomoya thinks to himself that he has to get Koko and Fuko to meet, that if he can get these two together, Fuko won't have to endure this any longer. He goes to Koko's house where he finds Yusuke, who's also waiting for her. This is their first time meeting in this route, and we initially see Yusuke take a standoffish attitude towards Tomoya. Once he hears why he's here though, he softens up tremendously and tells him inviting Koko to the festival would be extremely meaningful to her, given how much she cared about her teaching job. You know, Yusuke's demeanor kind of reminds me of someone, but I'll have to hold that thought because Koko is here now. She agrees to come. And hey, stick in the mud, Mitsui here ends up accepting a starfish at the festival after Sunahara tells her to stop making excuses. We're two for two now, things are looking bright, and she can't see Fuko. Uh, well, there's a lot of people here, so you know, maybe she's a little hard to see or something. But Nagasa shoves Fuko right in front of her to confirm that she's vanished from her view as well. On top of that, Coco tells us that Fuko's status keeps getting worse and she may never wake up again. Grasping at whatever hope he can salvage, from this news, Tomoya asks Koko to go through with her marriage, pleading that it's what Fuko would have wanted. He thinks to himself that Fuko must have known all about the likelihood of her passing away, and seemingly out of an understanding of Tomoya and Nagasa's relationship to her sister, Koko asks them to stay with Fuko until the end of her dream. That last word hurts the most to read, as if to say that everything we've been through so far has been little more than a fruitless fantasy. Tomoya has this great line a few days after this as more and more people forget that Fuko ever existed. The unnatural is fading away, the status quo is returning. It's a brilliant addition to the theme of change that Clanad always seems to come back to. Tomoya makes it seem like the world is fighting against positive change, that when anything good happens in this town it's considered a problem that needs to be solved, bringing us back to the unchanging and unfulfilling status quo. It's a mindset that we'll see fully explored later down the road especially as we move towards the true ending of the game. And while whether he's right or wrong is still up in the air, what we do know is that he's not letting Fuko go without fulfilling her dream first. Tomoya asks Komura, one of his old teachers and a fantastic one at that, if Koko can have her wedding at the school. He gets the okay and convinces Koko to go through with it too. But don't get filled with too much hope just yet because Nagasa comes down with a fever and has to stop coming to school, just like what happened to her the year before. Before. This only serves to deepen the loneliness Fuko feels, as now the only people she can talk to at school are Tomoya and Sinahara. Sinahara initially seems like a crummy friend to have around, as unlike Nagasa, he just stands there in silence as Fuko gets ignored by everyone. That night at the dorms, however, he reveals to Tomoya that he was keeping tabs on the people who ignored her and went to talk to them after the fact to investigate. He was unaware of Fuko's coma before this, and decides to go visit her at the 
the hospital to confirm the rumors. Tomoya yells at him not to do it, but he insists. The next day, he comes to school happy as can be, saying that he woke up in a different town and had no idea why he was even there. Well, that explains why Coco, who visits Fuko every day, couldn't see her ghost. Sunahara's role in the story doesn't end here either. He has this great scene where he remembers Fuko briefly after he holds the starfish he was given. It's one of the few instances where we see that he's not as bad of a guy as we all thought. <laughs> Anyways, this leaves Tomoya as the only person who can be by Fuko's side. And I really appreciate this progression of responsibility as we'll call it. Nagisa was the one who ultimately got Tomoya to help Fuko out. And her parents as well as Sunahara were able to pick up Tomoya's slack in the beginning. Well, you know what happened to Sunahara, and as for the Furukawas, they fell victim to a phenomena that affects even those who don't visit Fuko in the hospital. Everyone will eventually forget her, and the worst part is, that feeling of missing something excruciatingly important to you lingers. We see how hard this feeling can hit when it finds its way into the two people who took this girl in and treated her like family. Akio acts relatively calm, but he can't shake the feeling that he's missing something. He then abruptly stands up and goes outside to practice some swings, as if the anger and frustration he feels has become far too much for him to bear. Sanai then comes into the room and and calls out to Fuko, restoring hope to the player. But when she kneels down to hug her, she's facing the completely wrong direction. She then breaks down and says that she knows Fuko is here, but she just can't see her. She tells her that she and Akio love her, and that she can stay as long as she wants. Do you guys ever have one of those moments when you're reading or watching something and you just go, God, that was so damn smart? This misdirection plays perfectly into Sanai's character. She's the type who will always put up a front if she she thinks it will benefit somebody she cares about. And on top of that, it's such a powerful reveal. By far, one of my favorite moments in the entire game. Anyways, Fuko and Tomoya. So far, they've had this whole frenemy relationship going on. Fuko would always call him the weird person, which then escalated to the worst. And I mean, that's fair. I will admit I did shoot juice up your nose, push you into the men's bathroom, and make you give the principal a concussion. But on the other hand, you're an annoying little runt. Regardless, it's hard to deny that they enjoy spending time together. There's this nice scene where they go out into town and just have a good time. Tomoya even buys her this little party set after she gawks at it like a six-year-old who just stumbled into Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. There are so many little moments where their true feelings for each other break through the clouds of snark and stubbornness, and it all culminates into this moment here, where Fuko and Tomoya celebrate Coco's wedding the night before in an empty classroom. It's a cathartic moment that shows off how how deep their friendship has become and uh can i kiss you what what no 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 hold on the, the story does not need any of that it's fine as it is plus fuko I love you, man, but there's just something inherently revolting to me about this option. We're just going to stay like this for now, and hopefully that decision doesn't bite me in the ass later. Anyways, Tomoya wakes up and forgets all about Fuko, but the MVP Komura here reminds him when he's questioned about why there's a wedding being held here today. <laughs> I love the way these two interact with each other so much. Also, Fuko's back now. The ceremony goes off without a hitch, and we can see Coco sporting the laziest wedding dress known to man. Thanks for fixing that, Kyoani. And as the bride and groom step outside, we see people. Dozens, no, hundreds of them all gather to send warm regards to the happy couple. They're all students from different grades and backgrounds, but the one thing that brought them all together was a wooden carving of a starfish and a desperate plea from a determined little ghost girl. Tomoya congratulates Fuko for getting her feelings through to everyone, even if they don't remember who brought them all here. She then thanks Tomoya for sticking by her to the end, telling him that he made every day feel like a festival, referencing a dream she had a few days prior when Tomoya took her to a starfish festival, and with that, she disappears, but not before appearing in front of her sister as she walks through the school gates. She hands her a starfish carving and congratulates her on getting married before disappearing for the final time, and this song that I can't believe it's taken us three videos to get to begins to play. Anna, or Anna, not sure, is a very emotionally moving song. I imagine that everybody who listened to it for the first time 
said to themselves, that was beautiful, I need to look up the lyrics for this, and then they got a noise complaint because the sound of somebody falling onto the floor out of sheer disbelief is quite loud. Let me see how far I can get through it, and believe me when I say I'm not making any of this up. <clears throat> the place changes and goes, like a wind, like clouds, like the traces of the heart, no halt at the place, the place is so far away, be far apart, people's hand does not reach. So merely has the worship, the place is a lofty lord, can't meet, nobody put on, uh, we will lose the place, so lofty which changes. Not all were desired, however, we're never sad, still, there is the place, far away, far away. The wind blows through the place, and endless with all, like, it with the- <laughs> Uh, what the fuck? <laughs> These lyrics are wonderful. They're so good. And if you expected me to say otherwise, you probably don't know me very well. I'm the guy who, in the notes for this video, wrote Call Fuko Fucko because it's funny. Of course I'm the type of person who laughs at this. No disrespect to the singer or writer either, because the words themselves match the themes of Clan Ant to a T, and the singing is just mesmerizing. It retains its status as a cry-on-demand song despite its awful the wall lyrics, so in my eyes, that's a two for one deal. And speaking of tears, listen, you guys know me, I'm a bit of a crybaby. But out of the hundreds of video games I've played throughout my life, I can only think of nine instances where they've gotten some tears out of me. The first was the ending to Metal Gear Solid 3, the second was the ending of Red Dead 2, and the other seven were all from Clan Ed. Take a wild guess which song was playing during most of them. It has the miraculous ability of matching the emotions of every scene it's in and amplifying them tenfold. It really is a work of art and you're doing yourself a disservice if you've never listened to it. Anyways, we're given one final scene before the game kicks us back to the menu. Tomoya is sitting in class with his friends as he overhears people gossiping about Fuko more. Rumor has it there's a girl who goes to this school who was hospitalized during her first day. And despite having no real attachment to her, the student body collectively holds out hope that she'll open her eyes again. Tomoya Oya, Nagasa, and Sinahara all remember how she loved Starfish before a dream sequence shows Fuko reintroducing herself to her dear friends, bringing the route to a satisfying close while also leaving the player waiting for the day she wakes up. As for me, I have no doubts that the day will come eventually, because if Clanad is as good as I think it is, there's no way that this is the end of her story. Oh, uh, it kicked me back to the title screen without giving me my second light orb. Alright, Alrighty then, uh, so scratch that last thing I said because Clan Ad is being a dickhead right now. As it turns out, you have to pick the romance option with Fuko in order to get her light orb, even though the only thing that changes is you get a slightly different ending. It's not too bad of a punishment as it can be corrected in less than 5 minutes thanks to the fast forward button, but it just seems a little mean. I sure hope we don't see anything else like this during our playthrough, but even so, I doubt whatever they could throw at me would be enough to tarnish such a wonderful story. Story. Only time will tell though. You know, the power of friendship really is something special. Whoa, 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 hold on, listen. I know how that sounds. This is going somewhere, trust me. Man, retention is hard these days. Anyways, bro characters. The main protagonist, ride or die player two, who can always be counted on to believe in you more than you believe in yourself. It's a necessary archetype for sure, but I think it grows stale pretty quick. So many of these guys just blend together into this nameless, faceless mush to the point where I can't even remember their names. Sure, there have been a lot of standouts over the years, but if you want to make it as a bro character, you better be unique in some way. Enter Yohei Sanahara, a character who stands out due to his intriguing dynamic with Clan Ad's protagonist, the depth he possesses thanks to some exceptional characterization, and most importantly, the fact that he's also responsible for almost making me cry by conveying one of the most done-to-death messages in the history of fiction in such a powerful way. How did he do it? We'll find out soon enough. For now, all I'll say is that he had a little help from his sister. Welcome back to Clan Ad is Perfect for Me, and I gotta apologize right off the bat because I misspoke a few seconds ago. I only mentioned Mei when I talked about the characters who give Sunohara's story a boost, but I meant to say Mei, Sanai, Nagasa, Tomoyo, Fuko, Masai, and Yusuke. Why are so many characters involved in a route that's less than three hours long? Good question. See, while following the walkthrough, I mean my intuition, I ended up doing way more prep work than I initially anticipated. Granted, 
good chunk of this stuff is justified in my opinion. Because they go the One Piece route of laying the groundwork for future major players dozens of hours before they become relevant. We get a lot of information on Yusuke's background naturally integrated into our conversations with both him and his biggest fan. Sanai gets a lot of great characterization here. We see so many sides of her that crush the misconception that she's just another one-dimensional mom character. She's kind, oblivious, mischievous, attentive, heartwarming, prideful, and wise all in the same route. And then you have characters like Fuko, who you would only talk to if you want to see the scene where Tomoya and Sunahara kidnap her in order to force her to pretend to be Sunahara's girlfriend. And also if you want to see them do it again... <laughs> Come on, just give her a break. I already discussed Clan Ad's humor in the other videos, but this route utilizes a unique technique, say that five times fast, to make its humor hit harder. I don't know if there's an official term for it, but I'm going to call it joke heightening. Essentially, it's when you repeat a joke you've already made, but enhance it with new information that's come to light since you told it the first time. It's a little like how I keep bringing up my Patreon in every single video. The only difference being that Clan Ad isn't annoying. For example, when the boys finally land on Sanai as the person who will pretend to be Sinohara's girlfriend, Tomoya has this daydream where he imagines what it would be like if the two of them went out for real. It's so cheesy that even Kojima couldn't handle it, but that's what makes it an amusing read. I heard you got yelled at by the teacher again. <laughs> it's because I just can't do anything right no matter what I do. That's not true at all. You can do a lot if you set your mind to it. Later, when Sanai and Sanahara are getting ready for a practice date, Tomoya tries to convince her to call it off because, well, it's Sanahara we're talking about here. He rattles off some fun facts about him, some true, some false. Like he's an idiot, he's a pervert, he likes running around in the street naked, yada yada, but regardless, Sanai says that she wants to go through with it anyways. She tells Tomoya it's fine if he is all those things. And as for his hobbies, to each their own. Tomoya then slips back into his daydream and revises its contents to this. I heard you went running around naked again. <laughs> It's because I'm a pervert who will do just about anything. That's not true at all. To each- <laughs> To each his own, remember? There's the scene where Mei tells Tomoya that he's just like her brother. Upon hearing that vile insult to his character, he thinks about it for a second before saying something that I'm gonna err on the side of caution and say I can't repeat on YouTube. He opens a window and Mei pulls him back into the room, saying they're on the first floor so all he'd do is get his clothes dirty. With this knowledge in mind, a few minutes later Mei tells him that Sunahara seems like his best friend. Tomoya then walks over to a dictionary, flips it to the phrase best friend, and after reading the definition, he... <laughs> Come on, guys. I think you get the picture. A mediocre joke plants the seeds for a hilarious one, and the payoff is always worth it. Something that I don't think pays off all the time for Clan Ad, however, is the way Sunahara is treated. I think we all know that the guy is a douchebag. Pull up a list of everything that could be wrong with a high school boy, and he probably fits the bill for most of them. But let me stick up for the guy and say that the excessive punishment he receives in this game by every single character isn't funny or charming, it's just kind of irritating. He gets his ass kicked by the rugby club, gangsters, Akio, Masai, Tomoyo, Kyo, Fuko, basically anyone within swinging distance at any given time. Sure, sometimes he deserves it, but half the time it seems like the writers needed to get him out of a scene and couldn't think of a good way to do it. You might say, bro, why should you care? It's just Sunahara, but come on, I still like the guy. He's funny as hell. And beyond just physical torment, the way Tomoya treats him would be enough to make anyone snap. He's always putting the guy down at any chance he gets. And I admit, friends throw playful insults at each other all the time, but there's a limit to that, and Tomoya never lets up. It seems impossible for him to say even one nice thing about his supposed best friend. I will say though, this behavior makes sense for Tomoya. He's never been one to hold himself in high regard, and he takes this out on Sunohara because of how much he reminds him of himself in both circumstance and general outlook. It is some pretty cool writing, but that doesn't mean I always have to enjoy reading it. Like, really, one of your only friends is telling you they want to impress their sister but knows they'll have to lie to do it because they live a poor lifestyle, and your response is let's get you a fake girlfriend, this'll stave off my boredom for a while. Honestly. 
All right, that's the plot of this route, by the way. And since I already gave it away, you also know that Sanai is the unlucky lady. Mei shows up as Sunohara is off on a practice date with Sanai, and she's the same as she was in the baseball route. Kind, shrewd, capable, and super suspicious of the fact that her brother managed to get a girlfriend. Tomoya actually does his due diligence and goes along with Sunohara's lie. So she demands to tag along during a date to make sure this is actually a thing. And said date somehow goes worse than any of us could have expected. Sunohara has a meltdown when Sanai tells him she ate lunch before coming. He takes her to this special restaurant he planned to go to anyways, which is actually just his dorm room. And I especially like this part where Mei asks if Tomoya would take a girl to an arcade, and he's all like, no way, only human scum would do that. And then Sunohara's all like, yo, let's go to the arcade. <laughs> Alright, I'll admit, Sunohara abuse can be pretty funny sometimes. He gets pissed off at one of the rhythm games and attacks the machine. Then he drags Sanai to a CD store to give her his favorite song, Bomb Ahead. He mentions this song several times throughout the visual novel, and he's the only one who seems to like it. While to my knowledge, there was never a Bomb Ahead song composed for Clan Ad, there is this obscure 2004 anime named Tenjo Tenge that brought this dream to reality with its opening. And it's, you know... The perfect gift for a woman in her early 40s, don't you think? To end off the date, we see Sunohara notice a couple of kids bullying a little lost girl, and he decides to completely ignore them. Obviously, the other three don't let this stand, and they disperse the bullies as well as spend an hour or two trying to find the little girl's home. Sunohara pouts the entire time this happens like a child, which works wonders for pissing off the player and setting up the main conflict of this route. See, Sunohara being Sunohara is treating Sunohara as if she's his real girlfriend. And even though Tomoya convinced her she was just Nagisa's sister rather than her mother, it's still beyond delusional. As he obsesses over her during every waking moment, he takes a passive-aggressive stance towards his sister. He says she only came here because she loves the city and wanted to get out of the countryside for a bit, not because she wanted to check up on him. So what's with him? Is he still trying to prove how cool he is to Mei? Is he pushing her away because he thinks he doesn't need her anymore? Mei even tells Sunohara that she's dating some dude in his late 20s. Then she says she's stepping out to go meet him. And even though Sunohara is clearly upset by this messed up situation, he doesn't run after her because he might miss a call from Sanai? Jesus Christ! Tomoya ends up running out to stop Mei. And once he realizes she lied to get her brother to show that he cares about her, he decides to take her into town to cheer her up. I neglected to mention this, but in between all the Sunohara being a poo head scene, we see Tomoya and Mei fostering a genuine friendship. She ends up staying at Tomoya's place so she doesn't have to sleep on the floor in her brother's dorm, and this opens the door to this really cool bit of storytelling. Clan Ad loves its character parallels, especially when it comes to Tomoya, and as you know, Sunohara arguably has the most in common with him. They were both robbed of their chances to succeed in sports. They both turn to delinquency because of this, and they always tend to agree on serious matters. One thing I was interested in going into this route was how Mei and Sunohara typically act while living together, and we never get to see that dynamic, but we do see it with Tomoya. As Mei lives with him, she wakes him up every day, vacuums his room, plays pranks on him, hell, even feeds him. We get to see how Mei usually treats her big brother through the eyes of Tomoya, which I think is super cool. So cool, in fact, that when they did this again in After Story, it shot the route in question up next to my all-time favorites. But anyways, back to Mei. She's getting so into the parallels here that she's even calling Tomoya Onichan now, and he likes it? This is bad. Very bad. This route is going in a direction that I swore I would never follow. I mean, really, the only people who are into this kind of thing are only children who don't know what it's like to have a dipshit sibling by their side. However, Clanad has never steered me wrong before, and I need to understand everything about it properly if I'm going to make the definitive series of videos about it. <sighs> All right, Clan Ed. I'll sniff the sweaty socks of degeneracy just for you. For the sake of clarity and content, I'll become the loser you need me to be. Bottoms up. Oh, hold on. 
on, stop. Th that's, uh, yep, that's the police again, isn't it? All right, I told them it was just a prank and they let me off the hook. And good thing too, because this Onichan bit lasts all of about three minutes before it's kicked. But traces of it find their way into this Hail Mary white lie that Tomoya tells Sunohara when he catches Mei kissing him on the cheek after their day out. He says that he was the boyfriend all along, hoping that Sunohara would finally prove himself and jump in to defend his sister from him. But once again, he does nothing. He curses and yells, but he doesn't do anything to separate the two. Well, that was a bust, and now it's going to be pretty awkward around him, so Tomoya steers clear of him the next day. And in a scene that I really wish the anime would have included, he actually gets invited to eat lunch with some old friends of his. While talking with them though, he finds it hard to connect or relax. These aren't the kind of friends he wants anymore. And he finds himself thinking about Sunohara as he leaves the cafeteria. He wants to come up with a way to help him, not out of pity, not out of boredom, but a genuine attempt to get his friend out of this stupid streak he's got going. Using his own life as a guideline, he traces all of Sunohara's problems back to the moment he was kicked out of the soccer club, and thinks that maybe he could turn his life back around if he was playing soccer again. He finds Mei after school, and it turns out she thought of the exact same thing. Here's the part of this route that everyone remembers. Tomoya and Mei head to the soccer club to beg them to let Sunohara back in. Obviously, they're all hesitant, because it was Sunohara's fault that the team got disqualified from competing that year. But beyond that, every single one of these losers and their dickhead managers seem like the type who would take their date to an arcade. It's nothing but bullying, harassment, and humiliation for these two over the next few days. And while the club seems unrealistically malicious at points, you can't deny that they do an exceptional job of making the player hate them. They string Mei and Tomoya along by telling them if they keep shagging, cleaning, and obeying their unreasonable requests, they might let Sunohara back on the team. After they've had their fun though, one evening they mention that they're never going to let him back in. After seeing how much this upset Mei, another one of them pushes further by saying that Sunohara knows all about the trouble these two are going through for him. See, Tomoya got into a shouty match with Sunohara the other day when his bravado ticked him off, telling him to go find out for himself how much Mei is struggling for his sake right now. Turns out he went and asked one of the soccer club guys about it, and yet after hearing the full story, he's nowhere to be found. Once again, he failed to protect his little sister, and as Mei starts to cry, the soccer club seizes the opportunity to pick on her further. Any desire Tomoya had to endure this whole thing for Sunohara's sake melts away, and he steps forward to deliver some much-deserved frontier justice. Just as he begins to move though, Sunohara rushes past him and delivers a beautiful kick to one of the players. He screams that nobody is allowed to pick on Mei and starts going wild as the other members try desperately to subdue him. Tomoya turns to Mei and tells her not to worry, because her brother isn't going to lose. He then rushes in and joins in on the action. Unfortunately, we don't get to see this epic 2v, like, what is that, 7? Brawl of the Century, but we do know the aftermath. Tomoya and Sunohara are lying down on the ground looking up at the sky. Tomoya recalls the soccer club running away with their tail between their legs, calling the pair crazy all the while. Well, since they're here, Tomoya takes the opportunity to call Sunohara an idiot and tells him he needs to apologize to Mei. He responds by asking if he's picking a fight with him, and Tomoya says yeah, I guess. We then see the two of them drag their beaten bodies back up and prepare to start throwing punches yet again. Tomoya makes the first move by tackling Sunohara and unloading on his head, all the while demanding an excuse for his behavior if he's not gonna apologize. Sunohara then catches his fist and reveals that he thought it was okay because Tomoya was there. As he counterattacks, everything begins to fall in place. He didn't chase after Mei back at the dorm because he knew Tomoya would go after her. He didn't attack Tomoya when he told the lie about dating Mei because he trusted him enough to let it happen, and he laid low while the soccer club bullied her because he believed that Tomoya would protect her. The dramatic irony resonates beautifully here as the two of them continue to trade blows. Their wounds reopen, their blood stains the athletic grounds a dark color, and I was left in utter disbelief my first time reading. I couldn't believe that Sunohara had that much trust and respect for somebody else, no matter how much sense it made, because it just never crossed my mind that this would be the driving force behind his actions. I thought about the scenes Tomoya had where he became more appreciative of the carefree days he spent with Sunohara, and all of this 
this evolved into a burning desire to see these two stop fighting and go back to being best friends. Thankfully, Mei intervenes, and Tomoya leaves the two of them holding each other so he can clean up and go to bed. Well, that's one relationship reconciled, but something tells me the next one won't be so easy. The next day, Tomoya waltzes into the classroom around noon and plops down in his chair. Not long after, a weird-looking blonde kid with bandages all over his face enters the room. He hesitates for a bit, but then makes his way over to Tomoya's chair. The two stare each other down for a few seconds before Tomoya's guttural laughter breaks the silence. Sinahara begins to laugh too, and after a while, Tomoya asks him if he wants to go get lunch. Sinahara says he's broke, then suggests some instant ramen, and they're instantly back to the way they used to be. It's a scene very reminiscent of how the two of them met. Both had just gone into separate fights, and by seemingly random chance, the two of them crossed paths. Tomoya couldn't help but laugh at how messed up this guy's face looked, and Sinahara returned the favor. From the very beginning, it was a relationship that provided essential comfort for both of them. Their lives were going nowhere, and they probably would have dropped out, but in this moment, they both thought, if I can spend my high school days doing dumb stuff with this guy, it might not be so bad. Sure, there's Tomoya's spiteful behavior, but high schoolers are just stupid, man. And it felt so good to see Tomoya find some clarity when he reflects on his relationship with Sunohara at the end of the route. There's nothing to be worried or uneasy about, let alone to be truly troubled about. The resentment that had been lurking in my heart all this time, I could feel it melting away as if it had all been a lie. As Mei is about to head back home, Sunohara gives this great speech about how high school is where you find your greatest friends. The people you'll always come back to through getting a job, getting married, starting a family, anything. They'll always be there for you to meet up with and laugh together. And while there may not be some big dramatic moment that makes you realize how much you appreciate them, pretty soon you'll find each other inseparable thanks to all the small joys piling up. It's a touching thing to see for sure, and I think it's elevated even further by how unique the feelings it evokes are. Clanad gets a lot of tears out of people by expressing just how important human connection is, but most of that theme focuses on romance or family. This is one of the only routes that zeroes in on friendship, and I think that alone makes it more than worth including in the game. We get a new light orb, unlike Foucault's route, sorry about that, that was a mistake. We're brought back to the title screen, and then we hop right back into the game because we're doing two routes in this video. See, the route we just did technically belongs to Mei, which begs the question, what about our boy? Well, while making Clan Ad, the writers thought about what would happen if Tomoya went through the game rejecting as many girls as possible. I'm talking Nagisa, Tomoyo, Masai, Kyo, Yukine, and Kodomi. Turns out that Sunohara becomes your last line of defense to finish the game without a bad ending. He mentions that he wants to try to become a model, and asks if you think he's handsome. If you say yes, Tomoya will turn from resenting Sunohara to confessing to him. So if you ever wanted to go gay for Sunohara, and I know you do, then this is the route for you. It also gives you an achievement too, which is pretty cool. That's about all there is to say about it though. This episode of Love Battle is sponsored by me. I, I made it myself. Of the many types of bonds that tie people together, few can claim to be stronger than those between twin siblings. But give them something to fight over, and you'll bear witness to peace and quiet's most bitter adversaries. Like Kyo Fujibayashi, the aggressive older sibling. And Ryo Fujibayashi, the timid fortune teller. He's Pee Pee and I'm Poo Poo. And it's our job to analyze their style, charm, and chemistry to find out who would win a love battle. You know, I told you before we started this that I didn't want to be called Poo Poo. It's degrading. And I told you that if you tried to change our names, I'd walk. What? Why is this the one thing you can't compromise on? Because it's funny, Poo Poo. Now read your lines. No, it's really not. All right, I don't need this. I'm out of here. Why don't you go promote your Patreon some more? You know what I will. Link in the description. Fuck you. <sighs> well, this script is worthless now. 
All right, let's take this from the top and straight from the heart. Because despite with that elongated intro where I pretended to be funny might have suggested to you, today's route is very special to me. Not only do I think it's one of the best routes Clanad has to offer, not only is it one of the most important parts of the game today given how subpar its anime adaptation is, it's also one of the most impactful and meaningful stories I've ever been told. No jumping around in this one, we're doing this disappearance style and going through the entire story from start start to finish. Now, you might be asking yourself, isn't that going to take forever? Yup. On April 15th, Tomoya gets a surprise visit at his desk from Ryo Fujibayashi, who I think you've met before. You also probably remember that I've been taking pot shots at her this entire series, and thankfully, today's the day when I give you all the payoff for those insults. Why do you suppose I just hurled a chair at your head, Neiman? I, I don't know. Sure you do. She starts her new calling as a troublemaker off without a hitch by reading Tomoya's fortune with a deck of playing cards. We get a lot of readings done for us throughout this route, and I don't recall a single one ending well. For example, Ryo tells us that Tomoya is going to be late tomorrow because he'll help an old lady cross the street. The next morning, he makes eye contact with said lady, prompting me to give in to the demands of fate and help her out. When he talks to her, though, she starts to scream for help, causing passerby to say stuff like somebody call for help he's going to beat that old lady to death <laughs> what <laughs> turns out though she was just trying to buy enough time to snatch up a 500 yen coin from the pavement before anyone else could get to it oh thank goodness i really thought she was going to be beaten to death <laughs> did you really <laughs> well that could have gone a lot better and what's this another fortune this time she doesn't even bother letting tomoya pick his cards apparently tomorrow we're going to have an intense encounter with a gentle girl and her justification for this is the queen of spades she says the spade represents a sword so in other words she's someone who protects others like a knight tomoya sees this in the opposite way though thinking a sword would represent somebody dangerous Hmm. So we have the idea of a gentle girl being pushed onto Tomoya, but all he can envision is an aggressive one. That sounds like a detail worth keeping in mind. Pretty soon, Kyo enters the scene, and instantly we see the chemistry she has with Tomoya on full display. Sure, you can point to her reading his mind, the way they know exactly what buttons to push to manipulate each other, and the fact that they're always trading playful insults. But for me, the biggest indicator of how strong their connection is lies in their conversation flow. Have you ever talked? to somebody and just like melted away into the conversation everything feels so smooth so natural that it feels as if this person was put on the planet specifically for you to talk to them that's the vibe i get when i see these two talk to each other everything they say builds on what the other just told them responses are immediate and always satisfying and you see this in scenes like this one where kyo almost kills tomoya by ramming him with her scooter Yeah, that intense encounter with a gentle girl was anything but. And at this point, some of you might be questioning my undying affection for this character. Because after Tomoya threatened to stick gum in her bike's keyhole, she runs him over again and tells him she'll stick chopsticks under his fingernails if he does that, which is fucking horrifying. If you've never played or watched Clanad before, you might think that you'd see how unreasonable and violent she is and just turn the game off right then and there. But trust me, she must be doing something right if me, so many people I've talked to, and even these guys who don't like Clanad's characters are particularly fond of her. The characters are like the worst archetypes of every kind of anime <laughs> ever. Except Kyo. Yes, I love Kyo. Yeah, Kyo's the best. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Man of taste. Yeah, Man of taste. I love Kyo. Okay. Yeah. And if you take a look at what Kai, one of Clanad's scenario writers, had to say, this doesn't appear to be an accident. If by making her cuter, he meant giving her a winning personality, then congrats, man, you did it. She's rough on the outside, selfless to a fault on the inside. She's very upfront with people. She excels at taking charge of situations and taking care of others. She has a wonderful dynamic with every member of the cast. Her jokes are phenomenal, and her presence in the story is impossible to ignore and even harder to forget. And all of this charisma makes this chat she has with Tomoya on the 18th all the more jarring. She cuts the flow of conversation off abruptly and asks him seriously if he has any girls he likes right now. He says he doesn't after recovering from the whiplash, and then she asks if there was a girl who liked him, would he go out with her? She expands on her foreshadowing a few days later when Tomoya jokingly asks, 
asks her if she can read Ryo's thoughts because they're twins. She mentions that especially when they were kids, when one of them saw the other was hurt, they felt they were hurt themselves. When the conversation turns to Tomoya admitting he'd just drop out if he was forced to repeat a year, Kyo gives us this quote, Don't you think it's a shame to give up on something you've started no matter what it is? It kind of feels like you've lost to yourself, no? This all might seem pretty random, but as you all know by now, a lot of the fun in dissecting clan ad comes from seeing just how far back the seeds for the narrative were planted. They're going to bear some gnarly ass fruit in due time, don't you worry. By the way, Botan is here. And aside from being the best character in the game, he's here to provide the perfect example of a gripe I have with this route's translation. Typos pop up every now and again in all versions of clan ad, which is to be expected considering the script has almost as many words as the entire Metal Gear Solid franchise. I know stuff like this is easy to slip through the cracks, and who am I to judge when I'm not the bestest at grammar myself? But when it comes to the PS4 version of the game, the mistakes in Kyo's route are hard to ignore. For example, this translation change from the PC version ruined one of my favorite jokes in the entire game. It's simple. Kyo tells Tomoya that Botan is a piglet, he responds with pig shit, and she says I'll kill you. You see, this is, this is funny because lit rhymes with shit, you know. Believe it or not, this joke made me spit water all over my monitor when I first read it because I have the brain of a child. But then switch over to the PS4, Kyo tells Tomoya Botan is a piglet, and he says pig poop. Pig poop. Who the hell mishears like that? There are actual grammatical issues that pop up semi-frequently in this route, but this is the most egregious screw-up to me. At the end of the day, after playing through both translations, I would say that the Steam version of Clanad has a better script, even if it comes at the cost of proper widescreen. I guess I can't be too mad though, as so many jokes still hit their marks perfectly. Take this scene where Botan utilizes one of his seven skills and pretends to be a plushie so Tomoya can hold on to him for Kyo during class. Everything goes smoothly until Botan farts during the lecture, causing all eyes to turn towards Tomoya. The teacher recommends he head to the bathroom if he isn't feeling the best, so he takes the opportunity to drag Botan out of the room with him. Just before he's out the door, the teacher asks why he's taking his stuffed toy to the bathroom with him, and he responds with it's lonely to go by myself. To help him combat his loneliness, Kyo catches him in the hallway and shows him a love letter. She's quite vague about who it's from and who it's for, causing Tomoya to think it's from her to him. He thinks it's odd because he feels like she would be more upfront with her feelings if she had them. However, she immediately contradicts these sentiments by telling him that she was purposely being vague to make him think the letter was for him. In reality, it was from some guy in the soccer club to Ryo. And Kyo does the right thing by ripping it up because screw those guys. She then shifts the conversation over to Ryo with all the grace of a paraplegic toad and thus begins Operation Get Tomoya and Ryo together, final name pending. Over the next few days, she tries to put Tomoya in close proximity with Ryo by making him eat lunch with her, wait for her after school, and walk her home. It's very intentionally unnatural, and yet Kyo still manages to exude charm every step of the way. Who could forget the time she handed Tomoya a letter from Ryo where she forgot to put her name on the back of the envelope? When he tells her this, instead of just having him open up the letter, Kyo grabs the envelope and scribbles Ryo's name on the back of it in the shittiest handwriting the world has ever known. Ryo is just as awkward as these two have suddenly gone from hardly interacting with each other to being shoved into these stereotypical high school romance scenarios. Every now and again she embraces her Kaginato side by going for bold plays though. Like here where she wipes a grain of rice off Tomoya's mouth and... <laughs> what? I'm just like... I'm just like imagining right now what I'd be thinking if I was in this situation, I'm pretty sure I'd be completely speechless. There are also moments where they genuinely get to know each other a little better, like during their walks home. You can see how attentive and caring they are in their own ways. Ryo picks up on Tomoya's subtle changes in body language and expresses concern whenever he seems upset. Tomoya makes an effort to snuff out her self-doubt by encouraging her to not be so negative all the time. The way he treats her reminds me of
life is dynamic with Nagisa in a lot of ways. Also, the good news is, is that they both seem to like spending time together, even if one of them is getting a lot more mileage out of this than the other. And while all of this is going on, we have several scenes where Sunohara slides into frame with perfect timing like a sitcom to give himself the impression that Tomoya and Kyo are dating right now. It happened while Kyo was talking to Tomoya after the rice eating incident. It happened right after Kyo scribbled in some foreign language on the back of Ryo's love letter. And while a lot of the interactions the game gets out of these misunderstandings are super fun, these scenes are crucial for Sunohara's pivotal role in this story. By now, you might have pieced together what's happening here. Kyo is doing her best to get Tomoya and Ryo together, but the universe seems to disagree with these actions. From Tomoya seeing an aggressive girl in the Queen of Spades rather than a gentle one, to the juxtaposition between the dead-end conversations these two often have and the way these two go together like peanut butter and chocolate, to more on-the-nose stuff like Sunohara's over-the-top misunderstandings, this route is doing everything in its power to make this relationship feel as unnatural and off-putting as possible without outright saying it's wrong. These melancholic feelings hang in the air as Tomoya meets Ryo for her confession. She's as earnest as it gets, and Tomoya does his best to respond to her feelings honestly and properly. He tells her that at the end of the day, he still doesn't know her very well. However, keeping Kyo's advice in mind, he says he wouldn't mind getting to know her better through a serious relationship. In response, Ryo does what she does best, and wait, no, no, she doesn't orchestrate his downfall here at all, no, that's, uh... <clears throat> in response, Ryo does what she does second best and cries. This causes Kyo to jump in and immediately assume her new role as babysitter for these two. Because even though we're dating Ryo now, Big Sis still feels the need to tag along and push us closer together. Speaking of us, during this part of the route, we're asked if we prefer long hair or short hair, and uh... Yeah. Honestly speaking, I could go either way, but something about today is putting me in a long hair kind of mood, so regardless of how many brownie points I'm going to lose for it, let's go with honesty. Besides, I'm sure we'll have plenty of opportunities to win some back. In fact, here's one right now. During Tomoya's first real date with Ryo, Kyo tags along to micromanage things because her sister asked her to for some reason. She wastes no time telling us that window shopping is the perfect opportunity to sniff out some gift ideas, and it's seems like this jewelry store here is going to give us one. The twins sift through all the displays and both find themselves eyeing necklaces with different gemstones in them. Ryo takes an interest in the tanzanite stone while Kyo sets her sights on the amethyst stone. Interestingly enough, their stone of choice corresponds to their eye colors, so that'll at least make it easy to tell who wanted what. Tomoya gives a thumbs up to Kyo to signify that he knows what to do, and the date continues as the sun begins to set. Jack? What? Do you know what day it is tomorrow? I have no earthly idea. The next few days involve a lot of eating lunch, specifically a lot of avoiding eating Ryo's lunch because she cannot cook to save her life. Of course, sneaking off to eat lunch with two girls every day would arouse suspicions from Sunohara. So each time the bell rings for lunch, Tomoya goes to the bathroom with him and locks him in his stall with a mop handle. It gets funnier every time it happens because Tomoya writes increasingly incriminating information on the stall door. Tasteful stuff, like my very own own room, then love nest, and finally rugby club. <laughs> Oh, that is evil. But this torment doesn't last very long, as during the next scene, our attention is shifted to a far more pressing issue. Kyo catches Tomoya leaving his classroom and asks him why he isn't staying to walk home with Ryo. He tells her he was going to go wait by the school gate, diffusing the situation and prompting her to accompany him there. And as they begin to move, Tomoya's narration hoists a red flag high in the sky for all to see. The two of us start walking towards the shoe lockers, quietly and shoulder to shoulder. The noise of our shoes tapping the ground fills the hallway. It only makes me think about the person next to me all the more. When they get to the gate, he asks her if she wants to walk home with them, thinking it'd be a lot easier to have her around since she's so easy to talk to. She says no to give him and Ryo more alone time, leaving him with a tinge of sadness. If you remember my last video about Sunohara's route, you know how much this guy values comfort when it comes to his relationships. Maybe that's a detail about himself he 
remembers subconsciously as he subtly reaches out to Kyo in this scene. But you know, this feeling can take all kinds of forms, and it can come from even the unlikeliest of places. While walking Ryo home that same evening, Tomoya finds himself wiping away her tears as he once again reassures her that confidence is king, taking in and processing the authentic affection he's receiving. I wonder what this feeling is. This sense of comfort and peace I can feel deep within my heart. Does it feel so satisfying to be needed by someone? At the very least, I think I want to let this feeling, this atmosphere continue. And continue it will. Although I do recommend getting a handyman down here sometime soon because those cracks in the foundation might prove to be troubling, and the effects of leaving it be could rear their ugly heads much sooner than you think. The next day, Tomoya finds Kyo and Botan while they're out on the town. And while walking and talking, the three of them find themselves in the field where Kyo and Botan met. She laments that this land might be developed someday and Botan might lose the most special place he knows because of this. So you're telling me that fun and happy things like this place will eventually change? Huh. Anyways, as Tomoya says, there's no doubt that the most precious place for Botan is right next to his owner. After hearing this killer one-liner, Kyo changes the subject to kissing. Wait, hold, hold on, did I read that? Y yeah, yeah, I, uh... <laughs> <laughs> oh no. She frames it as practice for Ryo since they haven't done the deed yet, and eventually Tomoya caves. As their faces inch closer and closer, Tomoya notices how uncanny Kyo's resemblance to her sister is. Because when you're this close, the only thing you have to tell them apart are those bright amethyst eyes. Tomoya closes his as the critical moment looms just beyond the horizon, as if to accept that he's willing to go through with this. And just then, Kyo stops him. He opens his eyes to see a familiar set of purple ones staring back at him. As they both seemingly come to their senses, Kyo takes her leave after thanking Tomoya. He tells her he was just tagging along with her and Botan because he had nothing else to do, so it's no big deal. But she corrects him by saying she wasn't referring to just today. The next day, Tomoya heads back to the jewelry store to purchase that necklace for Ryo. We're actually given the opportunity to choose which stone to buy, almost like the game is testing our memory or something. Well, since you asked, if I remember correctly, the color of the stone was the key to remembering who wanted what. Thinking back, there's only one color that popped into my and presumably Tomoya's head. Acting on these impulses, we choose to purchase the Amethyst Necklace. I'm sure Ryo's going to love it. Speaking of her, their date the next day goes about as well as you could ask for. Sure, Tomoya overslept and forgot the pendant as he rushed out the door, but he can give that to her anytime. He does, however, end up giving her a deck of tarot cards that Kyo provided him with. He also finds himself holding her hand as they walk through town. And at the end of the day, thanks to Kyo's practice, he ends up kissing her as he stares into her deep blue eyes. Oh, this is where the guilt and regret really began to build up for me. Because even though this is obviously fictitious, the amount of time I've spent as Tomoya has long since put me in his shoes in the way only a video game can. And even if I didn't feel this way, the decisions I chose to make in this story so far have already made me complicit in whatever happens from here on out. I also want to add that I really appreciate the way this route never lets you breathe a sigh of relief. Every time you strengthen your connection with with Ryo, you're immediately reminded that the consequences for your actions are coming. For example, right after the date is over, Tomoya returns home and gets ready for bed, making sure to take a glance at the pendant he just purchased, as if to spite the player before closing his eyes. The next day, there are rumors about Tomoya's love life circulating throughout the school, but not in the way you might expect. Turns out, somebody caught Tomoya and Kyo getting it on in the park, and now whispers of this event echo throughout the school hall always. Kyo ignores Tomoya twice throughout the day before finally having an upfront conversation with him, telling him to steer clear of her for now to not add more fuel to the fire. As Tomoya finds himself conflicted about this new development, Kyo continues to take matters into her own hands by dragging Sunohara out of the classroom to tell him that somebody wants to confess to him after school. This really bothers Tomoya, and he lies to Ryo by saying some business came up after school so he can't walk her home today. 
Hiding out in the bushes, he watches in sheer disbelief as Kyo confesses her feelings to Sinahara, who seems to be having trouble believing this situation too. In response, she says she'll prove it's legit and wraps her arms around his neck. A choice is then given to the player, run out or walk away. Well, regardless of what we want and regardless of what Tomoya wants, with all due respect to Sinahara, I think it's safe to say that this isn't what Kyo wants. But just before Tomoya can run out, Sinahara solidifies his position as the number one bro character in fiction by pulling back and asking her if this whole thing is really about Tomoya. If you'll remember, he's been the number one proponent of Kyo and Tomoya's compatibility thus far. Guided by both his personal beliefs and the circumstances he's found himself in time and time again over the last few days, Tomoya gets caught, Kyo runs off, and Sinahara ends the scene by asking Tomoya how he felt while he was watching them from the bushes. We don't hear a reply, but his sentiments are crystal clear. And this is why only fools are protagonists. Because you never know when some lunatic writer will come along with a sadistic choice. Let die your newfound love, or suffer your true feelings. Make your choice, Spider-Man- fuck, I mean Tomoya. Yeah, sure man, but give me like two weeks to think about it. Oh, this is going to suck, isn't it? From here, we start to notice a shift in behavior from both sisters. Ryo starts making bolder plays. She asks Tomoya out in front of the rest of their class. She wraps her arms around his as they walk. She convinces him to start calling her by her first name. She instigates a kiss for the first time. She says she doesn't mind getting dirty, damp, and deep with him after he jokes about going to a love hotel. And the most bizarre of all, she weirdly badmouths her sister during a date. They pass by a ramen place and she comments that Kyo always puts a lot of pepper in her ramen when she eats it. That's disrespectful to the ramen restaurant when she does that, right? It's like she's saying that the work they put into making the soup is all a waste. What the hell is this shit? This isn't you, at least I hope it's not. Pushy, flexible, first name basis, vocal about her opinions. Cause I'm having deja vu here. This is all starting to remind Tomoya of somebody who he's been trying to desperately stop thinking about as of late. Speaking of which, Kyo continues to interact with Tomoya in a similar manner to how she did at the beginning of the route, with one major difference. Their conversations still flow well, they still crack jokes with each other, but nothing about their interactions feel lively if that makes any sense. This slight air of awkwardness looms, as if both parties are are putting their words and movements under heavy scrutiny. That freeform say whatever you want comfortable vibe is gone. And I suppose the same can be said about his dynamic with Ryo now that her behavior has taken a strange turn. The situation becomes all the more uncomfortable as Tomoya once again kisses Ryo. But this time he can't stop himself from thinking about her sister as he does it. I think it's worth mentioning that in the PC translation for this route he slips her some tongue, which was edited out in the updated translation. Translations. Honestly, like with most of these changes, I prefer the old version, as this was the moment where I put my head in my hands at the sight of how damn stupid this guy is. I think it's much more effective narratively to show him furthering his physical relationship with Ryo while thinking about her sister rather than just doing something he's already done five or six times at this point. I see it serving two purposes. First, as a forced action on his part in an attempt to convince himself that he can be content the way things are now. And second, as a non-verbal way to communicate the level of affection he has for each of them. Ryo may see it the same way, as lately she seems to be more observant of what's going on in Tomoya's stupid little head. But try as she might to salvage things, we still find him running off during class after he catches Botan out of the corner of his eye shivering in the rain. He knew that Kyo left school early today, so Botan being here could only mean that something is wrong. As Botan leads him to his destination, he mentions that he feels feels hope and anxiety, confidence and doubt, as well as uneasiness. Feelings I'm sure many of us have experienced all at once before, but in the context of this story, it's hard to feel a nostalgic sense of attachment to these words. There's no fantasy high school romance, nor a cheesy rom-com love triangle where wacky antics constantly ensue. It's just a guy running through the rain, contemplating the fact that he's about to do something that he both should and should never do. Kyo is firm in the should not camp as she tells him to keep away from her twice when they finally come face to face. 
saying that she's the one person he must not care about. Tomoya notices her grip her arms as she appears to be holding everything in, and in a moment of honesty, she confesses that it hurt to see him and Ryo together. You know, wasn't this whole idea yours in the first place? I seem to recall somebody who pushed these two together with a smile on her face as if it was her god-given purpose to do so. No matter how awkward or pushy she had to be, the job was taken care of, and her sister got exactly what she wanted. How can you justify going against a wish that you granted, let alone for the person you care about most in the world? She didn't, and that feeling of dissatisfaction fueled by self-hatred became harder and harder to suppress as her sister inched closer and closer to the promised land. Was it selfless? To a fault, yes. And while it's part of her personality to go out of her way for others, this is beyond excessive. This brings us to today's theme, something that seeps its way into every character in this story. Fear. Why throw away your own desires? Why hand deliver them to others? Why force yourself to watch somebody else live the life you want? Because the more I want something, the more I want to achieve, the more I put myself out there, the worse it's going to feel when I fall short of my ambitions. I don't try because I don't believe I can succeed. I don't like the person I am, so why should I be allowed to seize opportunity? And the more doors I close for myself, the more I reaffirm these beliefs. Sure, it's completely cliche, but that's because I imagine it's easy for most of us to relate to. Stories are a reflection of ourselves, you know, and in my opinion, out of every story that includes this theme, none resound louder than Clanad, and Kyo's inner struggle is just one piece of this awful, wonderful puzzle. Tomoya stands completely still as he thinks about Kyo, himself, and their current situation. His interpretation of these events is almost opposite to hers, but it does continue contain similar sentiments. He scorns his own behavior, telling himself that he shouldn't have pretended not to notice. And by extension, the player bears some responsibility for this as well. Sure, Tomoya clearly ducks out of situations like this because he's scared of what will happen if he doesn't. This is something we see all the time in the anime. But in the visual novel, you have control over several decisive decisions that he makes. And no matter what you do in this game, Kyo is always in the background, silently observing. She'll pop her head in every now and again to check up on you or express disapproval of your actions, all in ways that allude to the way she feels about Tomoya. Hell, in Yukine's route, they outright reveal that she likes him through the use of a magic spell, long story. And every time this happens, the player puts their head down and pretends not to notice as they trudge forward. Because real or not, I find it incredibly sad to be put in a situation where you are unable to give a character the happy ending you know they deserve. It's almost funny how the character who was closest to Tomoya when the game began ended up getting shafted so badly in every single route including her own. Sure, it's undeniably a good thing narratively because it effectively shows off the crippling side effects of losing your battle with fear, but my god do I just want to give her a hug. So that's exactly what Tomoya does. Rather than mulling over which words to say in this moment, he throws his own fears to the wayside and acts. And if I can just say, this is my favorite CG in the entire game. People like to rag on Clanad's art, oftentimes rightfully so, but I think this image rivals even the KyoAni anime in terms of visual appeal. I especially love the way the rain creates this natural outline around these two, making them pop right out of the background, allowing you to soak in every little emotion much easier. Now, this would normally be where the resolution takes place. Tomoya is preparing to confess, and while it's far from ideal, at least he's finally being honest with himself. But as I'm sure you all know, this is a two-way street, and Kyo isn't ready to walk down it. She tells him she's sorry that she likes him, cuts him off as he retorts by reminding him that she's Kyo and not Ryo, and then says her goodbyes. Tomoya walks back to class to get his bag, only to find Ryo waiting for him there. She tells him that he can depend on her because she really cares about him, as she hugs him despite his protests. Fuck. The next day, she makes a special dish that Kyo is known for because of course she does. And then we see Kyo smile and wave at Tomoya from the courtyard. Baffled, he runs down to meet her and finds the same cheery girl we knew from the beginning of the route. Yeah, Shikokuma. She's smiling, she sounds so lively, happy music starts playing, and this is so painful to read through. 
I vividly remember when I first came to this scene over two years ago. The first thing I did was start crying, because of course I did, I'm me. Then I said, out loud, to my monitor, with no other living soul around to witness it, you've got to be kidding, please stop. If that doesn't speak to my level of investment in this story at this point, I'm not sure what does. After playing through it again for this video, I found myself wondering if they made Kyo so similar to how she usually is in order to illustrate that all the fears and anxieties she clearly still has inside of her now are things she carried throughout the entire game. I wouldn't put it past these guys to do something that smart. And speaking of which, the way they drag out this route's conclusion is as clever and evil as it comes. This final push towards the finish line begins with Ryo recapping the events of the story through a tarot card reading. For once, her fortune telling is on point, and all of Tomoya's dirty laundry gets aired out as Kyo and a crowd of bystanders watch. She talks about how he fails to change, how he's currently confused and timid, how a rivalry is driving a wedge between him and his happiness, even how his inner desire is unspeakable love and faithlessness. And I mean, she's not wrong, because soon after we see him finally gain the resolve to break up with her after another fantastic pep talk with Sunohara. The MVP reads Tomoya's thoughts and tells him that if he's thinking of distancing himself from both of them, then he truly is the hopeless loser he believes he is right now. Don't think you can get out of this one clean. Right now, no matter what you do, you're going to hurt one of them. The longer it takes, the more it'll hurt. That's awfully hypocritical of you to say, Clanad. As you shamelessly pad out the runtime by having Tomoya break down Ryo's fortune telling during class because you want to elongate my suffering as much as possible. As he's about to do it, the girls who were there for the fortune telling incident interrupt because of course they do, leading to Tomoya thinking that he'll get the job done after class. As he walks back to the classroom, he finds Kyo in the hallway. She greets him cheerfully, and he asks her what she would do if he broke up with her sister. Immediately, her mood changes, and she demands that he tell her this is all some big joke. He lies and says yes, but as he starts to walk away, she stops him and asks if he's doing this because he wants to be with her. She tells him she doesn't want that because she doesn't want to hurt anyone, echoing Tomoya's concerns throughout this entire story and leaving him with just one thing to say. Yeah, you're right. That's what I thought too. His mind is made up. And even though he feels like crying just thinking about what he's going to do to somebody whose company he genuinely came to enjoy over the last few weeks, he presses on regardless. Ryo, however, reads what's about to happen and desperately tries to shut him up by repeatedly cutting him off. She then has this moment of honesty where she tells him that she knew the entire time that Kyo liked him. And even so, she still fell for him and asked her sister for advice about him. According to her, Kyo looked surprised at first, but then then right away she smiled and said just leave it to me. Ryo then tells him she can learn to be more like her sister, something she's been working towards for a while now, so that should be enough for them to stay together. Finally, she runs away before he can tell her what he brought her here to say. <sighs> Alright, this has been a long time coming now. So you're telling me that this girl knew how Kyo felt, that she's felt this way for quote, a very long time, and even so, exploited her good nature in order to get herself closer to Tomoya while also getting rid of a competitor. When the cracks started to form and she realized that Tomoya's mind was slipping towards her sister, she didn't roll over and accept defeat. She instead began acting like Kyo in order to keep Tomoya with her. Not to mention, there are a lot of strange scenes where we see snippets of what life at home is like for these two during these awful last few days. You have Ryo straight up ignoring her sister as they walk by each other in the courtyard. The same day Kyo left for school early to let God give her a bath because she just couldn't take this anymore. Was there some kind of Heisenberg ass moment where Ryo came knocking on Kyo's door and said, Stay out of my territory. You might think I'm exaggerating, but just let it really sink in that she willingly put a loved one through this much pain just so she could steal something that they've wanted for over a year at this point. Ryo Fujibayashi is sweet, likable, and undeniably passionate. But make no mistake, she is also a conniving bitch. And as hard as it may be to believe, I completely understand where she's coming from, because every action she takes ties back to this route's main theme. While fear causes Tomoya to hide 
hide from new opportunities and Kyo to give up on her goals, it makes Ryo do the opposite. She ferociously pursues self-preservation during this route out of fear that she'll soon lose everything she ever wanted. She becomes more like her sister, cooks like her, even badmouths her because she feels like it's necessary to stay happy. It isn't right at all, but I get it. And this route wouldn't be complete without this crucial third pillar. Anyways, now I'm going to talk about the worst scene in the whole game. Let's be real. Without Sunohara, Tomoya would have taken much longer than he does to do the right thing. To repay him for this, in his final scene in this route, he gets a textbook lodged in his forehead and the shit kicked out of him by the rugby club. What did he do to deserve this? Well, frustrated by Tomoya's failure to break up with Ryo, he makes an off-color joke about taking the twins for himself in order to spur him into action. Ew, gross. Looking out for his friend in a way that's consistent with his character? Now I see where you're coming from, Clanad. This guy deserves the chair at minimum. I get the impression that the writers were concerned that Sunohara wasn't getting into his usual antics enough in the latter half of the route, so they just shoved this in there to make up for it. Personally, I think this scene should have been removed entirely. And I don't even have to imagine what that would have been like, because it's the one possible positive thing I can say about this route's anime adaptation. See, this story is clearly soulbound to Tomoya's love life, so when it came to putting it in the anime, it had to be cut off from the main timeline, what with the whole Nagasa existing thing. This left us with a 23 minute OVA to cover the entire 6 hour long route. Cuts were obviously made. And for context, the first scene in the episode is Ryo confessing to Tomoya, an event that I didn't get to until 5 pages into this 13 page script. This is why I took you all through the full story today. I doubt that many of you watching have experienced this route before, and if you have, it was most likely through this OVA. Based on all the conversations I've had and reviews I've read, I think I can safely call it the black sheep of the anime adaptation. I'm personally not a fan because I believe this route's strength lies in the tension and dread it builds up over an extended period of time, as well as the extensive exploration of these characters and the hopes that the audience comes to understand their unsavory reactions. Both of these qualities are time sensitive and are unable to flourish in just 23 minutes. I wouldn't recommend against watching it, it's got gorgeous animation as usual for KyoAni, but I would be a little sad to hear that it's the only way you've ever experienced this story. And should you choose to read through the visual novel, you'll be graced with an endlessly satisfying conclusion. After being told by the rugby club guy that Ryo was looking for him, Tomoya makes his way to the school and finds her standing by that one little tree area outside the back of the building. It's not the courtyard, I actually have no idea where this is. If any of you guys know, please tell me. But anyways, Tomoya tells her that he loves her sister a lot more than her, prompting her to run up to him and start going to town. Tomoya tries to stop her, but he can't break free. That doesn't sound like Ryo at all. And as he continues to struggle, he hears his name called in a familiar yet unexpected voice. Kyo looks up at Tomoya with her hair cut down to size as he stares back in disbelief. She explains that Ryo told her not to run away after seemingly accepting that this has gone too far. And in a fit of poetic justice, encouraged her sister wearing the mask of her twin to go out and win the day. Tomoya pulls out the amethyst pendant and gives it to Kyo saying, now that I think about it, I may have made up my mind back then. But if you'll remember, we can trace his feelings all the way back to the beginning of the route with this unassuming playing card depicting a queen and the symbol for a sword. Thus, we've come full circle. Hours of playtime have been rewarded, and the credits roll as relief washes over anguish. Dear lord, this image is cursed. In an epilogue, we see Tomoya patch things up with Ryo, where she tells him not to apologize for his actions, because that would make it seem like the time they spent together was all a lie. In a story where everybody got their hands unfathomably dirty, I couldn't ask for a better resolution. And don't worry about her either. Kyo actually tells us she met some new guy at a hospital she's working at. Believe it or not, we've actually met him before, but that's a story for another day. These 
these two are all lovey-dovey now, and as the screen fades to white, Kyo makes a promise to Tomoya that calls back to the first decisive decision the player made in this route and hints at the extensive longevity of their new relationship. I'll grow my hair out again. We get another light orb, we're sent back to the title screen, we speed run through the route again to get Ryo's ending for an achievement. Alright, blah blah blah, short hair, and yada yada, Tanzanite, whatever, uh, our journey begins here. Yeah, our journey to the next video, we need to wrap this shit up. So, I like this route a lot. I genuinely feel like it's made me a more active and confident person, as it's something I always think back to whenever I find myself thinking up an excuse to back out of an opportunity out of fear. After all, don't you think it's a shame to give up on something you've started no matter what it is? It kind of feels like you lost to yourself, no? I don't expect this route to be able to be there for all of you like it has been for me, but I think it's important for everyone to find something that can, and for us to share the special stories that do. Thank you for watching. You know, I think this is the first time I've used an exclamation point in a video title that wasn't for Kaon, which should speak volumes towards how passionate I am about today's topic. I love almost everything about Clanad, including its ending, which is a divisive one to say the least. I mean, even the friends I've shown Clanad to who were over the moon about it felt disappointed by its ending. Well, I can't wait any longer to throw my hat back in the ring. You guys think Clanad had a Deus Ex Machina ending? Well, I'll do my best to explain explain why I disagree, and just maybe we'll- Oh, uh, I'll hold that thought for a second. It looks like this is a letter from the higher-ups. Uh, this is a little unorthodox, but I guess I can read this while recording, cause, you know, we have a pretty good working relationship. <clears throat> Dear dumb f Yikes, okay, uh, <laughs> that was a little rude. We regret to inform you that this is an ongoing series and you are not at liberty to discuss Clanad's ending quite yet. Regardless, we expect a sound argument as to why Clanad has a fantastic conclusion. Enclosed in this envelope are two routes that quite frankly have very little to do with each other, but figure it out? Work that microphone, promote that Patreon, get those views. I am in your walls. Love, corporate. <sighs> This is what I get for hiring a boar as my manager. Okay, let's see which routes Mr. Pigshit left for me. Oh, this actually works out nicely. So some of you might remember my after story video where I used Yukine and Masai's arcs to explain these things. If you've been following along with this series so far, you know what they are, but probably not where they come from or what they're capable of. Withholding information like this from the audience might be troublesome. Say these things play a major role in the plot somewhere down the line, then whatever they do will come across as contrived. Well, thankfully, both Key and Kyoto Animation recognize this, so they highlight the importance and not so subtly foreshadowed the nature of the light orbs in their own ways, and then a good handful of people still called contrivance upon finishing the story. Based on what I've read, this issue stems from a lack of understanding of what these orbs are and how they tie into the themes and world of Clanad. So welcome to Light Orbs 101 with a side of side routes. I'll be going through today's routes as normal while drawing as much attention as possible to their relationship with the light orbs. First on the list is Yukine, and good thing to too, because for all you anime onlys out there, the visual novel version of her story will come as a surprise to you. From my understanding, the original plan for the visual novel was to make Yukine a part of the main cast, but she was relegated to a side route because the team thought her story wasn't strong enough to justify the upgrade. That is correct, however, this is by no means a bad route. In fact, much like the reference room it takes place in, I see it as a safe haven full of fun and relaxation. As Tomoya stumbles into the room on the 18th in search of his old napping spot, he meets a strange girl who appears to be at his beck and call. She offers him coffee, which he gladly accepts. Then she waits attentively as he drinks it, giving him an idea for some deadpan sarcasm. He asks for omelette rice, which she regrettably explains she can't make for him. Why is she still waiting for me like that? Don't tell me. Then I'll have a haircut. Please leave the sideburns as they are. Uh, 
This is more or less the vibe of the entire route. Yukine defeats Tomoya's facetious remarks by always taking them literally, but seemingly not out of any form of stupidity. It's almost as though she accepts him for who he is, strange behavior and all, the second he walks through that door. As Tomoya puts it, I feel like there's something about her that lets you truly be yourself. And Yukine takes be yourself to heart herself. God, I cannot write to save my life. She does magic spells because she's interested in them. One of the most charming parts of visiting the reference room each day is doing your daily spell. Take this one for example. After doing a chant, Tomoya must do a lap around the school, and whoever talks to him first has a crush on him. As he begins to move, people pass him without even meeting his eyes. He sees more of the same as he drags his feet past his own classroom. There are people all over the place, but nobody has any interest in speaking with him it seems. He thinks to himself that maybe he really is as hopeless as Sinahara. Admittedly, it comes as a small shock to him. I guess it is what it is, right? Maybe some people are just destined to- What? Oh god, what the hell, guys? I just got done with this. <sighs> You know what? I refuse to let you cloud my pleasant feelings with guilt. Now you better hope this flashbang wipes my memory and we'll start over from scratch. Okay, what was this video about again? Oh, that's right, Sunahara. When he enters the picture, the enjoyment of this route multiplies tenfold. Giving Tomoya and Sunahara a place where they have free reign to be idiots together for an extended period of time was a stroke of genius. I said some not-so-nice things about the way Tomoya treats his supposed best friend not too long ago, but in this route, the comedy outshines any sense of pity I feel for the guy. You've got classics like Tomoya emotionlessly pushing a button to scald Sunahara's hand with hot water, the scene where he freaks out and starts throwing desks at Tomoya after he calls him a clown, which is a bit that's only become funnier with time. There's Sinahara's best line in the entire visual novel, which reads as so. Listen, brat, if you're a man, stop chasing after your sister's ass. And no, I will not be giving any context for this quote. Even the standard Sinahara getting dragged away to get murdered off screen has a good punchline for once. After Tomoya gets him into trouble with one of Yukine's gang friends, it cuts to him standing in an empty classroom. Sinohara is gone. The empty chair only reminds me more and more of him. Gone are the days we fooled around, laughing with each other. I wonder why I can only remember your crying face now. Why can't I remember any of your happy expressions? Is it because I've only done horrible things to you? But even though I was always like that, I have always... Crap, I'm hungry. Guess I'll go have some gyudon on the way home. <laughs> I have so many questions right now. But let's address one of yours first. Did I just mention something about Yukine's gang friends? Yep. Every so often, a handful of gang members make their way to the reference room to see or be treated by Yukine. The mystery of why the hell they're so attached to her in the first place is intriguing enough to keep the player playing. But beyond that, they add more humor and charm to a route that's already overflowing with it. A lot of them adopt the say something stupid with a straight face comedic style, which which instantly puts them on my good side. I'm a fan of these big, intimidating, shady types of characters who turn out to be really goofy and heartwarming. Seeing the way they react to Yukine slowly getting more intimate with Tomoya is a joy to see. It's that spleen rupturing combination of I'm okay with this and I'm totally not okay with this. Take this scene where Sunahara and one of the guys watch from the window as Yukine embraces Tomoya in order to give herself strength for a big event today. Shortly afterwards, they enter the room and tell them it's time to leave. As they make their way there, Sinahara tells Tomoya he's walking on a tightrope right now, saying the gang member crushed a rock with his bare hands while watching. I suppose they don't tear him limb from limb because he reminds them of Yukine's brother, a friend of the gang who tragically passed away one year ago. After hearing this, Tomoya gets some wonderful characterization as his self-conscious, always nitpicking mind goes to work. He goes off of the assumption that Yukine only treats him differently from everyone else because of these similarities, failing to realize that it was his choice and by extension the player's choice that made him stand out from the rest of the crowd. As for that big event, it's the anniversary of her brother's death, so Yukine and the others are going to visit his grave to pay their respects. This is the climax of the route. Not some big Naruto-ass fight scene with a heaping helping of melodrama. No, this is a very quiet and reserved scene. As they all huddle around the grave, Yukine 
Akine gives this big speech about how she came to open herself up to her brother's friends after seeing the kindness in their eyes at the funeral. She feels truly happy knowing that she has so many people in her corner now, all because she worked up the courage to go and talk to these guys. Over time, they warmed up to her, and as a result, she became the inviting and comforting little sibling to anyone who needed her support. She'll cook for you, treat your wounds, and listen to what you have to say when nobody else will. Hell, she'll even defend you in front of people who might as well be brick walls, as seen in one of the best scenes in this route. Also, small thing about the art in this CG, I kind of expected the gang members to look a little more, you know, intimidating, because I'm pretty sure the feeling I'm supposed to feel while looking at these guys is not I can take on three of you at once. Anyways, among all these guys is Tomoya, who may seem completely out of place, but the fact is there's nobody else this shoulder to cry on would rather have by her side, because he's the one person who gave back the comfort that she provided to so many. Admittedly, this route doesn't hit the emotional heights of the other routes, because quite frankly, the sad part is already over. Her speech reads more like a celebration of how far she's come since her brother passed, and as she expresses this joy, Tomoya notices a small ball of light slowly drifting down from the sky. He reaches out his hand and absorbs it, feeling warmth inside of his body. Sometime later, Sinahara tells Tomoya he noticed him stretching out his arm, but couldn't see what he was reaching for. Two things have just been confirmed for us. First is that these light orbs are in fact real objects in this world, confirming that all of these post credit screens actually happened. That may sound obvious, but if it weren't for this scene, it'd be pretty ambiguous. Second, only Tomoya can see them. Why is that? Good question. The conversation we have with Yukine after the credits may help us learn the answer. According to books in the reference room of local history, aka this town, nobody knew what the light orbs were physically, they just know that they showed up whenever something good happens. Yukine then says that nowadays, most people don't seem to believe they exist at all, and yeah, tell me about it. This next part where she suggests that Tomoya is special may make you roll your eyes, but don't tune out just yet. She corrects herself by saying that everyone else must have changed. Her interpretation is that if people were still deeply connected to this town like before, they'd be able to see them. This puzzles Tomoya as he straight up hates this place, so why would they show up for him and nobody else? Well, think back to the one thing that separated Tomoya from every other character in this room. Route. If the light orbs show up when people are happy, and the town's interests align with these orbs, don't you think the person with the strongest connection to the town will be someone who constantly brings happiness to its residents? Wouldn't the guy who steps up to the occasion time and time again to put other people's needs before his own be the perfect candidate to see the light orbs? It doesn't matter what he says or feels. His actions... Your actions as a player are what make you special to this town. You don't see the light orbs because you're the main character. You see them because you earn them. Like it or not, their history is established in this universe, and your ability to see them is consistent with said history, which completes one half of this argument. We now have an understanding of why light orbs appear, but the crucial piece of information we still don't know is what they're capable of. This is where Masai's route comes in. If you don't remember, she's the dorm mother at the boys' athletic storm that Sunohara lives in. Tomoya gets to know her by constantly stopping to teach her new ways to beat up the rugby club whenever they misbehave. Got up a kick! But more important than these guys getting their just desserts, one day Masai invites Tomoya to her room for tea as thanks for rescuing her cat from Sunohara. And as they interact more and more with each other, my exceptionally high opinion of Tomoya as a character begins to decline ever so slightly. This guy falls in love like 15 times in this game, but this is the only time where I found it to be annoying. He takes a very obsessive and lustful approach that just doesn't jive with me at all. The first thing he does does when he's invited into her room is stare at her chest. When he hides in her futon as she consults a rugby club member about his constipation, he gets a good whiff and is all, oh yeah, that's good stuff. He also gets really into hearing about a previous boyfriend of hers and uses some underhanded tactics to get her to spill the beans about him. For starters, we have Nagasa. You help her out on the first day of school and talk to her a couple of times after that before getting locked into Masai's route. However, Tomoya decides that she can get her to go take 
love advice from Masai to see if she'll say something that makes her talk about her ex. Admittedly, this is a really cute scene. Masai tells Nagasa not to get romantically involved with Tomoya, listing off all his stupid behavior in this route as reasons for why. And then she's just like, um but I think he's a good person. It's an interesting tidbit, confirming that Nagasa liked Tomoya from day one, but it's also just so sweet the way she defends him like that. After she leaves, Masai tells him to just go out with Nagasa because she's literally perfect, and his response is to ignore Nagasa for the rest of the route, and instead put up a bunch of flyers around the school advertising Masai's relationship counseling in order to get more opportunities to hear about this other guy of hers. Okay, Tomoya, I still love you, man, but I think you're gonna need to sit the rest of this one out. You're too busy MILF hunting to be a good character right now. MILF, as we all know, standing for mom. I know you're watching this, please don't look that up. Anyways, after a convoluted set of choices leading to Tomoya ultimately expressing his love for Masai, she starts to cry, causing her cat to show Tomoya a vision from the past. A mysterious voice tells us that we have a charm with us. Inside of it is a light orb. Its ability is that it can grant one wish. Our job is to take this light to Masai and grant her wish. This orb has been entrusted to Katsuki Shima, a boy who feels indebted to Masai because she kept him company while he was sick in the hospital. As for plot details, I don't have much to say other than it's a decent enough unrequited love triangle story that's nowhere near as special as most of the other routes. Shima, however, is a great character and I wish we saw more of him outside of this story. But back to the light orb. I just said it can grant wishes, so case closed, right? Well, no not quite. Because Shima here is actually that kid from the hospital's pet cat. See, he passed away, but the cat was turned into a human who looks just like him, who was then sent to grant Masai's wish. Whether or not this was through the power of the light orb was inferred, but based on what we've been told, I believe the orbs have the ability to use magic to change a situation to fit somebody's wish. Say that Shima wished for Masai's wish to be granted. There's no way he would know what her wish is, so the orb sent the cat in a suitable form to go find out. Her wish ended up being, I want you to stay by my side forever, which the light grants by turning Shima back into a cat, who then became her pet, which she still has to this day. It's a weird monkey's paw type situation where she technically got what she wanted, but not really. This leads me to believe that light orbs are not the best at granting wishes individually. However, their abilities stack when they're together. There are two reasons why I think this. The first is it's impossible to get Clan Ad's true ending, the one that so many people have a problem with, without first obtaining all 13 light orbs in the game, insinuating that whatever happens would not be possible without all of their power combined. The second has to do with Akio, who as we'll learn in a future route, had an experience with the light orbs himself. We know that he's done enough to earn some of his own thanks to another route I haven't covered yet, and that once again his wish was granted, but not in the exact way he wanted it to be. I realize I'm dancing around the subject a lot for the sake of spoilers, but I think you get what I'm trying to say with this video. The light orbs are a tangible force in this world baked into the history of this town. They show up whenever somebody experiences true happiness, and only those who have a deep connection with this town can see them. They tie into the major theme of change because their perception among the public is greatly affected by change across generations. I also see it fitting into the game's theme of family. Clanad builds up up the family you choose for yourself as a support system that gives you back even more than you put in. The same way a light orb rewards making somebody experience pure joy with a wish. Speaking of which, the light orbs grant wishes. Plus the more of them you have, the better the outcome. And now we know more about the light orbs than most people know about high school math. Keep in mind that out of every piece of information I just listed, like 95% of it came exclusively from these two routes, both of which are required to see the true ending. I feel like I can rest my case, your honor. Whether or not these little balls of light give you the ending you want is for you to decide. All I'm saying is the one thing you can't do is say they're contrived. And by the way, you may notice that we didn't collect a light orb for finishing Masai's route. All I'll say is hang in there. You know, we didn't actually bring her true happiness here. But if I know my boy, I'm sure he'll get around to it eventually. 
This is the story of a boy revisiting and reconsidering his hatred for a certain girl he knows. Whether or not this exercise proves to be beneficial for their relationship is yet to be seen, but there's one thing we know for sure. This boy is actually me, and the girl is a fictional character. Wow, I can hear you saying. This just went from interesting and kind of endearing to really sad and pathetic. Well, to that I say, ouch. But this is also a rare opportunity for me. The list of things I dislike about about clan ad is very small, and the list of things I might actually change my mind on is even smaller. See, I really didn't care for Tomoyo's story when I first read it a couple years ago. I thought the writing was weird, the characters inconsistent, and the themes unappealing. It could be because there are some real problems with this route that I could only put into words after replaying it. It could be because I was a stupid dum dum and didn't understand what it was trying to do. Or there's the most probable outcome. I hated this route because somebody at key thought it was okay to put a character called Tomoya and one called Tomoyo in the same story. Pro tip if you ever want to give a YouTuber a panic attack, give them two names that sound exactly the fucking same and then tell them to put them in a script 50 times each. <sighs> you're lucky you're my favorite, Clan Ed. Lucky might not even begin to cover it, especially since the prep work required to get the most out of this route is absurd. It's no coincidence that this is one of the last routes I'm covering in this series. You need to make sure you have Masai and Komura's routes done. The former you need for a light orb, and the latter of which I haven't even covered yet, but don't worry. We'll be getting to him in due time. You also need to be buddy-buddy with Nagasa for a few days, or else you'll just straight up fail the route with no warning. And if you want a secret achievement, you better be ready to do the baseball route all over again and talk to as many people as possible. This route is the main reason why I advise people to go into this game loosely following a guide, because no matter how thorough of a player you are, you're going to miss something your first time through. So that was immediately off-putting to me. And as I pressed on regardless, I learned that this was just the beginning of my grievances with this route. Things start out innocently enough, with a daily reminder that Sunahara is a stupid, stupid man. Ooh. Are you pretty dog to eat miracle? He and Tomoya witness Tomoyo decimate a group of bikers trespassing on school grounds, and he gets the idea that the whole thing was an act. Because there's no way that a girl can be stronger than a guy. What the fuck? Go outside, dude. These thoughts end up costing him dearly, as for the next few days he gets the crap kicked out of him by Tomoyo while Tomoya watches from the sidelines. Turns out that fight was legit, and our prim and proper Miss Excellent here has a bleak past full of violence and, uh, more violence, Jesus. The Sunohara bits are as funny as they always are, with lines like the iconic, even a Buddhist master can't win against a surprise attack splitting my sides open. But what really kicks the plot off here is how she interacts with Tomoya. She seems very relaxed around him, saying that the vibe he gives off makes him easy to talk to. The brief exchanges they have between Sunohara's beatings gave me the sense that she was always trying to figure him out. And I suppose she must have liked what she noticed, because from here, things escalate at a brisk pace. After the reason behind Sunohara's harassment gets revealed to Tomoyo, she gets super self-conscious and tells Tomoya to touch her chest to prove she's a girl. He obviously refuses, opting to be sensible about things and just believe her. Then there's the scene where he protects her from being hounded by the judo club to join up with them. As he leads her away by the hand, he tells her she should clear up this misunderstanding whenever she can. She says, nah, I don't mind if you don't, then abruptly changes the conversation by saying, we get along quite well. What? Do we? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. At this point, things were starting to get very jarring for me. I decided that if I was still confused after the route, I would give Tomoyo after a look to clarify some things. It's a sequel to her route, released as a standalone visual novel in 2005. But once I told a friend my plan, he begged me not to use the Steam version, but instead use a different copy of the game he'd acquire for me. I thought that was fine, especially since I don't even know if I'll need it. Still hasn't gotten back to me though, I wonder when that'll happen. Anyway, Ways, as they're walking home, Tomoyo's all like, oh, by the way, you'd better stay glued to me just in case those judo guys come back, and it's like, D okay? Then she says, and I quote, please protect me while looking incredibly cool just like before. Okay, stop. 
To provide some context for the headspace I was in when I first read this route, I was just getting into anime as a medium. I had seen K-On, Angel Beats, Haruhi, and maybe like 5-10 to 10 other shows. I was slowly descending into the abyss that was anime, and as I slid down, I was wary to avoid certain pitfalls. Look, you and I both know that anime has some very strange tropes, and the last thing I wanted to do was wake up one day and realize that I was into some weird shit. So when Tomoyo here was all like, Oh my god, you're so big and handsome and strong and never leave my side and, uh, Sugoi. <laughs> my immediate thought was this is cheap, pandering wish fulfillment and I will not be enticed as so many have before, including one of my best friends. Damn, she's got... She's got blue eyes, that's actually kinda hot. You need to relax. <laughs> And as the route continued, this resentment only grew. The two of them end up getting together in spite of their clearly conflicting ideals. Tomoyo has aspirations of joining the student council, and Tomoya is the delinquent with an irrational distaste for anyone involved with the school. However, we still hear stuff like God may have left you here specifically for me as my eternal lover. Lady, you have been dating for two days. And then they start going at it in the cafeteria, and then it cuts to the evening and she's all like oh i can't believe we were thumb wrestling with our tongues for that long oh my god and then they break up because tomoya's way of life was holding her back which is true and then they just get back together at the end you know i didn't follow much of the discussion surrounding this game when i first played it but from what little i read it was clear to me that many people found this scene to be very impactful i mean it was nice to see them get back together but i felt like their relationship was so awkward and forced that it cheapened the moment and there you go that's the route a special thanks to patrons which could be you one day or yeah this was how i viewed tomoyo's route when i first played it i didn't think it was bad but out of all of clan ad's routes i believed it was the weakest and the reason why i gave you context about my mindset going into it is because this is a classic case of some stupid mental barrier barring me from appreciating a story it's not a foreign problem for me and i'm sure that can be said for many of you as well for example about two or three weeks ago i started watching a show called bochi the rock it's a musical slice of life starring an introvert with social anxiety who wants to play in a band. My first thought was, wow, what a cool trope. I'm sure that'll make this show super popular with all its hashtag relatable moments. I think I'll pass. And in doing so, I completely neglected the stellar writing, beautiful animation, genuinely funny jokes, great music, heartwarming moments, and, to my past self's dismay, deeply relatable characters. This is what happens when I fixate my mind on one perceived flaw and let it ruin the the entire thing for me, failing to realize how my own preconceptions might be coloring my experience. I stumbled across arguably the best show I watched all year, and I dropped it. So, before we go back to Tomoyo, here's a quick word of advice from me to me. Get the fuck over yourself and give everything a fair chance. While Tomoyo's route may still be the weakest route of the main five in my eyes, I find it to be a unique and well thought out addition to this collection of some of my favorite stories. First things first, Tomoyo herself. She plays off of Tomoya and Sinahara really well. There's a lot of sass and sarcasm in her words and she's very good at responding to it on the receiving end. However, if she's teased about something she's self-conscious about, she drops her IQ down to room temperature and takes it super literally. Like when Tomoya does the whole let's break up joke after he realizes that dating Tomoyo means waking up early every morning. Instead of firing back with something like how about thanks for waking me up jackass, she's all like what no, anything but that. It's little details like this that make a character endearing. There's this plot crucial detail disguised as a running joke where Tomoyo behaves like a no nonsense mother to Tomoya despite the fact that she's younger than him. It comes across in scenes like this one where she tells him not to eat in the halls so he tries to shove his bread in his mouth in defiance, only to end up with her hand in his mouth because she's just too quick. There's the bit where he gets dragged off to school by her so they can make it on time. As they reach the gate with seconds to spare, Tomoyo inquires about his classroom. Where's your classroom? I don't know. 
How do you not know? That one always puts a smile on my face. And when he's late the next day, she confronts him about it. He tries to weasel his way out of a confession, but she just says she'll ask one of his classmates if he was here all day or not. With his back against the wall, Tomoya channels his inner six-year-old and says this. Yeah, I'm late, and is that so bad? You ask me whether it's bad, but I can't give an answer other than yes, it's bad. <laughs> This is a fun character, okay? Sure, she's not as entertaining as Kyo, who ironically steals the show in a few scenes like she always does, but she's more than capable of holding your attention to the end credits. And I'll say, one thing she has over Kyo, just one, sorry I'm so biased, is her relationship with Sunohara. Sure, 70% of the time it's just Sunohara doing a dumb thing and getting kicked then insulted. However, that opens the door for the euphoric rush of seeing two characters who don't really get along on a surface level showing glimpses of respect and kindness towards each other. I talked about this in the Dragon Maid video. I think this is my narrative fetish. Like when they go to the cafe and Tomoya makes up this story about how Sinohara brought her here because he secretly wanted to go to a cafe with a girl and she's all like, you can consider me a friend of yours. I'm just like, man. I kind of wish that this was what the end of this route looked like. And of course, Sunohara once again earns his bro status when shit hits the fan in this route. Sensing the tension building between these two as Tomoya starts distancing himself, he lies about being a rich model to them and says he's going to take them out and buy them food. He's always disguising genuine efforts to cheer his friends up behind his usual goofy antics and I love him for it. Also, I lied, there is one other thing that Tomoyo has over Kyo, and that's her interactions with with this man. I mentioned him once in the baseball route and not really again, because he doesn't play much of a role in any route other than Nagisa's, except this one. If you'll remember, Tomoya and his dad really don't get along. He's had a grudge against his old man ever since his shoulder was dislocated during a routine fight with him, causing them to become more distant as time has gone on. This is the household that Tomoyo stumbles into as she continues to insert herself in Tomoya's life. After an incident where he sprints out of the house at the mere sight of his father, she finds him messing around at Sunahara's dorm and asks him what happened, worried that this was all her fault. It wasn't, not at all, but can you blame her for thinking so when she sat down and had a nice breakfast with his dad after he left? He didn't seem like the boogeyman Tomoya builds him up as at all, but that's not to suggest that there isn't a valid reason for his bitterness. It opens the door to the possibility that this isn't just our one-dimensional bad father villain, but instead this is a complicated situation that we don't have all the facts for. Something that, hopefully, the game will conclude in a satisfying way, wink wink. Recognizing this, Tomoyo tells him, I'm sure that only you know the pain you feel. Choosing to be honest rather than lie by saying something disingenuous like I understand. This is a decision that Tomoyo respects, and it's proof that Tomoyo coming into his life was undeniably a good thing, which makes what comes next all the more heartbreaking. The word of the day is expectations. The expectations people have for you, the expectations you have for yourself, and most importantly, how these expectations affect the people around you are ideas that I find to be inseparable from this route's climax. I mocked Tomoyo's assertion that she and Tomoya are alike a bit ago, but in truth, they are similar in many ways. The way they almost immediately feel comfortable around each other, their shared history of being rebellious miscreants, and the unique way in which their personalities complement each other paints the simple picture of two kindred spirits coming together. The distinction between them, however, is the expectations of what they can attain. Tomoyo reformed herself for the sake of her family, and her aptitude, can-do attitude, as well as her proper demeanor ensure that the world would always see her as a winner. She's the model student, the easy hire, the girl who can achieve anything she sets her mind to. Tomoya, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. It. The delinquent the loafer. Mr. Thank God I'm not that guy. He goes to a well-renowned prep school and has the distinction of being one of the few students enrolled who can't make ends meet. His peers have made a habit out of always assuming the worst in him. Take this scene where a faculty member automatically assumes that Tomoya is in the teacher's room for sexual harassment, an act that he has zero precedent of committing. So imagine how hard this teacher and the rest of the world shit the bed when their little prodigy began to associate with this 
this guy. Teachers discuss the situation with both of them frequently, flat out saying that Tomoya is holding her back and should be forgotten. Students who are interested in Tomoyo's growth as a person tell him to break up with her. Others vandalize posters for her student council campaign just because they're together. All of these actions collectively scribble down a message which is then hand delivered to Tomoya. You are going to cause her to fail in life because you're you. Do not drag her down with you. I can only imagine how fun it must be to hear that, given the fact that this is a guy who we know already thinks very little of himself. You know, I will agree with one thing my past self said during his first playthrough. This is wish fulfillment, and it was all done to make this guy and the player feel all the more inadequate during this part of the route. When Tomoya seriously considers breaking up with Tomoyo despite her saying that everything is fine, it's hard to not see where he's coming from. She constantly shirks her responsibilities as student council president to be with him, something that negatively affects her peers and everyone's perceptions of her. Not to mention, there's her goal of preventing the Sakura trees on the Hilda school from being cut down, as they're very special to both her and her brother. That dream being crushed is one of the reasons Tomoya brings up as he tells Tomoyo he wants to break up with her. As she tells him over and over again that she can make time for both in vain, Tomoya tells her that what he felt for her wasn't love. All he ever wants to do was just play around. That sounds in character, right? Like something only a true delinquent would say? Well, regardless, it works. And as Tomoyo walks away, Tomoya realizes that what he felt truly was love. The story is awfully quick to contradict him, almost as if there's a clear distinction between his perceived self and who he truly is. Sunohara is quick to recognize Tomoya's fake this was for the best attitude and attempts to comfort him in the same way he always does, by goofing off and giving him something to laugh at. But as as you all know, things change. The cold winds of winter roll in to signify that graduation is approaching, and it's long since been time to consider what comes next. Sinohara heads back to his hometown to find a job like he promised his parents, something Tomoya can respect, seeing as how he's always been slow to accept change. But time marches forward whether you're ready or not, so Tomoya makes his way to the job hunting room at school. Nobody else is there seeking help but him. He doubts that any anyone has ever needed to come here. The teacher running the service bluntly explains the fruits of his years of loafing and unsatisfactory behavior. Employers simply don't care about the leftovers from a prestigious school, and the way you are as a person will probably be off-putting. But don't give up regardless, you'll eventually find a job you can come to terms with. Nice wording there, chief. As someone who's currently filling out application after application in preparation for graduation, the thought of being told that my my life up to this point has led to a forced compromise is absolutely horrifying. Tomoya searches for some jobs on his own, but unfortunately all of his hopes were crushed. He ends up accepting some manual labor job the teacher suggested to him. He sees it as a sign of things to come and becomes depressed. As he sits in Sinohara's dorm all alone, he wonders if he'll ever find anything in his life from now on. Everything truly important to him. His family, basketball, Tomoyo, even Sinohara is all buried in the past. Right now, can't things just stay the same? Just after he seals his fate by accepting the job offer, he makes his way back home as snow begins to cover the ground. Walking down the long, winding hill to school, he attempts to comfort himself in vain as it becomes clear how much of a toll his resignation to his expectations has taken on him, and as all hope seems lost, he sees a familiar face waiting for him at the bottom of the hill. Tomoyo tells him that she succeeded in her goal. The Sakura trees are not going to be cut down, and when her brother starts high school next year, they'll be able to have that conversation about them they always wanted to have. Well, that's good, if not a little bittersweet. But she continues, saying that achieving this dream took away a lot of time, time she should have spent by his side. Tomoya doesn't believe her at first, but soon finds himself in a repeat of the conversation they had months ago. He slips back into the same position he took then, saying that she's much better off without him. Some of you are probably shouting at your phone slash monitor slash whatever you're watching this on right now, but you gotta understand something. Yes, there is an obvious solution to this 
this problem, but if the extensive detail I went into explaining the months of inadequacy, guilt, and anxiety that Tomoya experiences throughout this route are anything to go by, he is the last person who should be making this decision right now. He's going to take up a job he doesn't want. She'll go off to some university far away from here. He'll be working hours a day for scraps in a town that he can never leave. She'll be meeting the expectations of everyone she comes across. He'll always be a failure, she'll always succeed. With the entire world and yourself feeds you the same narrative, I wouldn't blame anyone for believing it, nor would I blame them for not seeing through the endless sea of doubt and drivel to lay their eyes on what truly matters here. If you believe what Clanad believes, that people gain meaning in life through those they interact with and grow close to, then the only thing that matters here is how these two feel. Tomoyo confesses that she still cares for him, even more than before. She tells him she's willing to come to where he is as long as he lets her. Tomoya gives it some thought, and that same feeling he felt in this very spot months ago returns to him, but this time he'll catch it before it's too late. He still loves Tomoyo. That's one of the few things in his life that hasn't changed, and it never will. So what the fuck are we still doing standing here talking about it? I know now that I didn't like this scene when I first read it because I didn't take into account any of the buildup. Like Tomoya, my mind drifted to pointless white noise. The vapid expectations I had created clouded my ability to appreciate this route for what it is, so I'm very glad that I was able to give it a second chance. As time passes, we see Tomoya in work clothes walking up the hill to school to meet Tomoyo. Her little brother is with her today, basking in the fruits of her sister's labor as Tomoya inches ever closer. The memories they make, the dreams they pursue, and the goals they achieve aren't shown to us from here. It's likely that both of them will need to make compromise after compromise to accommodate their relationship, but the way that they talk to each other in this scene makes it impossible for me to believe that this wasn't for the best. And as Tomoyo walks off to go back to work, he leaves Tomoyo and her brother to have that conversation they always wanted to have under the blooming Sakura. So yeah, Tomoyo's pretty great and and, uh, oh, uh, oh, sick, the game is ready. Good timing, too. I was worried I wouldn't get to talk about Tomoyo after it all, but it looks like... Yeah, so... Tomoyo was always the worst character in Clan Ed. That's just a joke, by the way. I know Tomoyo after isn't just like that. Play the Steam version if you want it free of age scenes. Alright, enough explaining. Bye-bye. If I asked all of you to bring up a forgotten anime character for me, I bet I'd get a very wide range of responses. You've got people who just started watching bringing up unpopular characters from Attack on Titan and Demon Slayer. You've got people who yearn for the glory of the mid-2000s, throwing out names like Kamina and Haruhi and, don't worry, legends never die. And then there's the guy with 45 days worth of anime watched on Mal talking about some show that probably doesn't even exist. But I'm going to raise you all by taking things a step further. How about a character who was never even given the chance to appear in a show? Someone so infamously forgotten that even his creators poke fun at how much neglect he's received over the years. <laughs> This is Kape Haragi from Clanad. And for all you anime onlys out there, you might be looking at this saying, Oh, I know Clanad, but what the, the hell is this thing on my screen right now? You just drew that and threw it up there, didn't you? Well, no, he's from the visual novel. And he is, in fact, the only major Clanad character who was cut when Kyoto Animation made their adaptation. But if you've been keeping up with this series, like all the coolest people in the world do, you would already know that. So, so what's this guy's deal? And why was he the only one from this franchise left by the wayside? More importantly, could leaving him buried in the past actually be a good thing? Well, let's go through his route and see if we can- d Hey, d dude, I'm still fucking talking, why are you rolling- <clears throat> Alright, I get it. Intros are boring. Speaking of which, if you choose to play this route, I hope you're comfortable with wasting away like 7 days, because you can't actually meet Kape until the 21st. I mean, granted, you have to talk to Yusuke at some point because he's important for later, but other than that, you've got nothing but fast forwarding to do. And even when the day finally comes, I wouldn't blame you for missing him. See, when Kyo tries to murder Tomoya by ramming him with her bike like the charming little sweetheart that she is, you have to specifically choose to dodge 
dodge to the right in order for her to miss you and slam into Cape. Again, you should never feel bad for wanting to use a guide to beat this game. Not like you'd have time to anyways. As the saying goes, you can feel sorry for yourself only after you've taken care of the body. <laughs> I need to go to bed. <laughs> Good news, though. He's alive. Bad news, though. He's late for a job interview and runs off before we get to know too much about him. Well, maybe the resume he accidentally left behind could shed some light on him. Most of it is blank, you know, as it should be. Why answer more than you have to? His favorite subject is lunch. I think it's cool that he's showing his potential employer how much he appreciates a good meal. Motivation, want money. Great answer. Gotta respect the honesty on that one. Interest, not something I can tell people. Not Nice. Let the interviewer envision all the wonderful things you may or may not do in your spare time rather than just telling them. Current health. I'll sue if this is sexual harassment. Yeah, I, I mean, you can never be too careful these days. And finally, strong points. I think guys should aim to be men. You know, sometimes the best answer to a question is something that has nothing to do with it at all. So, uh, this guy is an idiot? Something that only becomes more apparent when Tomoya meets him again to return his masterpiece to him. But you know, I can't pretend like it's not pretty endearing at first. You've got the resume itself, the funny moments where Tomoya capitalizes perfectly on how forgetful Cape is, and the ridiculous bit where he tries to repay Tomoya for his kindness by buying him a soda. He sprints down to the machine but ends up coming back like eight times to ask some trivial question about his preferences or get changed because he doesn't have any. Tomoya begins to think that he's bullying him and, well... When you eventually find out what this route is about, you realize that what he did was not bullying. It was torture. And I kinda maybe sort of think that Cape deserves it. Look, I don't remember when it was, but I'm pretty sure that I mentioned I'd be bringing up the issues I have with Clanad at some point. I've been sprinkling some criticisms in here and there, but I feel like I haven't been leaning into that as much as I probably should be. So it's a good thing we're talking about this route today. You wanna know the answer to the title and thumbnail of the video? Yes, I think Cape being left behind was 100% for the best. Poof, retention gone. But if you wanna stick around and see me lose my marbles, go right ahead. I'm making a spirit bomb with the negative energy from the clan ad movie Chikai in School Days videos to rip this man in half. And, uh, <laughs> it looks like you're in the splash zone. God dang it. Did I mention that you can financially support me for writing like this? Alright, first things first. I find that Cape stops being endearing after you've interacted with him for like 20 minutes. His clueless yet earnest behavior quickly devolves into whiny self-centered entitlement. He has this running gag where he gets upset with the people who interview him for super small stuff. Like them requiring him to have a driver's license for a pizza delivery job or a fast food joint not offering him tea during the interview. There's this one scene that always irritates to me where Sinahara accidentally shakes a soda and gets it to explode in Cape's face. And he gets super mad and says he's going to beat him up the next time he sees him, failing to remember that he literally just did the same thing to Tomoya not too long ago. He's also really obsessed with manliness, which get it? It's funny because he looks and sounds like a girl. There are some good bits that come out of this whole thing, but if anything, it's really just indicative of this game's age. Which is why it brings me great displeasure to say that Sunohara's entire existence in this route is built upon this one joke. He sees Cape and falls in love with him, sinking super far into delusion as the route goes on, and it's just kind of sad to watch at points. Like, oh, oh my god, no you don't, dude, wake up! Of course he gets no sympathy or help from anyone, and you're just supposed to laugh at it. Most of the time I can do that, because usually Sinohara deserves whatever he gets since the people he imposes himself on don't deserve his harassment. But Cape is so unlikable that seeing Sinohara agonize over him is really annoying, if that makes any sense. Like, Tomoyo kicking Sinohara because he attacked her first and made a bunch of baseless accusations, or Kyo attacking Sinohara because he asked his wife to marry him. Totally fine, you dropped this king. But Mr. Hypocrite Douchebag over here hating this guy because he made the same mistake he did? Yeah, no thanks. Also, another point, this route forces you to skip out on playing laser tag. I don't even need to explain myself on that one. Here's something that does deserve our full attention though. The Fujibayashi twins play a big role in this route, specifically Ryo, but let's talk about Kyo first. As usual, she's a part of a lot of this route's highlights. We get more great teasers for her route, and there's some funny stuff like when Tomoya has to desperately try to stop Cape from telling her he plans to 
to cook Botan. I wish I could give you more examples, but she doesn't stick around for very long. Kape and Ryo start dating in a love at first sight kind of way, to the astonishment of both Tomoya and Kyo. She does some funny overprotective stuff and worries about whether or not this is going to work out, and then the writers start setting the stage for something wonderful. Kyo tells Tomoya that she feels like Ryo is moving ahead in life without her, so Tomoya says, why don't you go get a boyfriend? Personally, I think this would have been a great opportunity for Kyo to finally gain the resolve to ask him out since Ryo is gone and she's out of excuses, but why do this? Well, for one, it'd give us more of these two while they're dating, something the visual novel has a criminally small quantity of, and when things take a turn for the worse, instead of Tomoya and Ryo being the ones to deal with it themselves, you now have this third pillar that has proven time and time again to be exceptional in a group setting. Just thinking about how they would all comfort, encourage, and think through a big problem together, taking into account their vastly different relationships with each other sounds like a characterization wet dream. But uh, what actually happens is she says, nah, I'm not going to be in the mood for that for a while, and then leaves. This is the last time she appears in this route. Keep in mind that while the exact time frame is kept in the dark, this route has like four time skips and one of them is five years long. So at minimum, we're looking at the better part of a decade. Say what you want about my proposal. It's too unrealistic because Kyo has notoriously cold feet, and Tomoya has like a 50-50 chance of saying yes to her even if she does ask. However, I think that makes a lot more sense than her just disappearing from Tomoya's life because she's sad that Ryo is dating someone. At the very least, she could have come back later, but no, she's just gone for years. It screams, I need to find a way to get rid of this character right the hell now to me, and as much of a coward as Kyo is, I don't think she'd ever do something like this. This route really did her dirty is my point. Although, you never know, maybe this was an act of mercy, sparing her from the big emotional climax of this route, and by far my least favorite part of the entire game. I know I said that a few videos ago, but I mean it this time. The funny thing is, it ain't even that bad for the majority of its duration. While playing through this route, astute readers will notice that Cape might have some kind of health problem, seeing as how his bag has a bunch of pills in it, and he clearly lies about them, saying they're just antacids. Another clue is him getting a job as a rehab assistant at a hospital. And there's also the fact that Cape is a noticeably fast sprinter, at least according to Tomoya. Wow! He's fast! And finally, one day Sinohara notices something bone-chilling in a newspaper article and hands it over to Tomoya. It tells the story of the tragic high school sprinter, a prodigy who collapsed just before the end of an important race due to leg pain that he hid from everyone he knew. The picture confirms that this was in fact Kape. And just before Tomoya fully explains what happened, Ryo gets brought into the room by Masai. She starts crying in his chest, building up the suspense, and then Tomoya finally reveals Feels Cape's condition, osteosarcoma. What? What? What the fuck? Oh, cancer. It's prefaced to us as something that needs to be treated very early on, and in order to treat it when it's in your legs, they need to be amputated. Cape doesn't want to do that, as he explains to Tomoya in the hospital. See, he's an orphan who's never felt like life was worth living. But one day, a musician showed up at the orphanage as part of some TV program to talk to the kids there. He told Cape to find one thing in his life to believe in and push forward. He chose running. The praise and recognition he got for his talents made him feel alive, but after he was diagnosed and took his tumble during the finals, he resigned himself to his fate and decided to wander the country popping painkillers, attempting to enjoy what time he has left with his legs intact. After hearing the story, you can poke a lot of holes into his irrational thought process, but I suppose it isn't too hard to see where he's coming from. Credit where credit is due, too. Tomoya brings up every single point that I would have made to try to convince him to do the surgery, and then we see Cape struggle to weasel his way back into being stubborn. Why can't you just live for Ryo's sake now that you have her? Because I'd be a burden. Well, why did you even date her in the first place? Oh, I just kind of do whatever I feel like in the moment. All right, scumbag. Well, I want you to live. Running can't be everything to you. I mean, I got to know you after all this stuff happened. Yeah, no, sorry. I'm still gonna die. Mom says to stop trying to give yourself cancer. Just gonna get a little bit of cancer, Stan. Tell mom it's okay. This is 
frustrating, and I think it's supposed to be. Like talking to a brick wall that's going to get torn down unless you can convince it to move, and also for whatever reason you're friends with it. Tomoya puts it well when he says a kid who knows nothing just explained what it means to live. I still don't care about Kape at all, but I can empathize with somebody trying to help a friend whose conviction is equal only to their delusion. Yusuke then shows up and hears Tomoya and Ryo out, then reminds us that we are in fact playing clan ad by tying us back into this game's main theme. He bitterly mentions that what the musicians said to Kape was irresponsible, hinting that maybe someday we'll hear the other side of this story. Then he bluntly explains that people can stand up and walk forward because of other people. It's something we already tried to convince him of. However, this conversation gives Ryo the conviction, the courage, and the determination to march right up to Kape, put her foot down, and say, I'm pregnant. What? Kape is confused, because unless it's not his, that's impossible. And instead of quitting while she's miles behind, Ryo doubles down. While you were sleeping, I... <laughs> Shut the hell up! But then, of course, things turn serious. Ryo spills her whole plan to get married and start a family with him. Dreams that will never be fulfilled if he doesn't go through the surgery. Tomoya chimes in beautifully, saying that he never had a mother. His dad always looked so pained whenever he asked him about her, and he imagines that Ryo will look the same way if Kape keeps being stubborn about this. This eventually convinces him, and he gains the balls to lose his legs and keep living for the people who love him. Him. All's well that ends well. Like, I've had my nitpicks way more than any other route in the game, but hey, at least things ended on a- wait, what's this? After a little time passes, we learn that Kape is being transferred to another hospital, because there's this technique called quick freezing that will complete the surgery while allowing him to keep his legs. That's... I... this... man, I don't... I don't think Contrived even begins to describe this. Cape hasn't done the surgery yet, so very little time has passed since we last saw him. Ryo never says that this is a new surgery technique, just that it's not that well known yet. So you're telling me that this surgery has existed for some time, and yet Cape never thought to do a second of research to discover something that completely solves the dilemma that he has resigned himself to death over. And you two, especially you. Why the hell didn't either of you think to look into alternatives? Isn't that like the first thing people do when they try to help each other out with a big problem? Also, you've been in the hospital for weeks. There were doctors talking to you. There is no way in hell that none of them knew about it, and yet they never told you after hearing your story. What kind of hospital? <laughs> Do they want you to die? Also, now that I think about it, you were a rehab assistant. You shouldn't have even needed to hear this from the doctors. Oh my god. No longer is this a semi-touching story about a guy I don't care for but can still empathize with gaining the resolve to push forward despite losing his dream. Now it's the story of some writer trying to solicit cheap tears out of me before pulling the rug out from under me and saying that none of it mattered. There was no build-up to this. If anything, it goes against Clan adds themes of learning to live on despite the hardships life brings, and I think it makes everything about this route feel so cheap and hollow. I would have been fine with calling this route at most good if Cape just lost his legs and still pushed forward, but now, I can't do more than say it's average. Like, yes, you can still have a good time with this route. It's got funny moments that can pull on your heartstrings at times, but it's the combination of everything I've talked about in this video that holds it so far back from greatness for me. It's mistreatment of Kyo, it's stale and mean-spirited Sunahara jokes, Kape's unlikability, the fast pace that makes it hard to get invested, the way this relationship feels so forced, and finally the god-awful ending that destroyed any goodwill the climax had built up to that point. Call it harsh, but dude, this is Clan Ed. The story that's left me crying my eyes out more than any other. The story that inspires me to embrace change and always strive to be the best me I can be. The story that gives me hope that no matter what life throws at me, I'll be okay. Through all my triumphs and failures, I don't think there will ever come a day where it doesn't stand among my friends, my family, my hobbies, and my dreams as the guiding light between them. Average is isn't good enough for you, and it never will be. Now, we have one little detour to make before we reach our final stop in this journey, and I can't wait to show you just how perfect this story can be in spite of all its blemishes. 
The absolutely absurd amount of information in this video would not have been possible without Florde Andromeda, who created the original version of this iceberg and helped me out when I inevitably got stumped in my research. Clan Adman, whose expertise on all things key was invaluable for shedding light on some of the more obscure stuff on this iceberg. If you're at all interested in key, pay attention to what this man is working on. There's also Blue Solar, who made this video happen to begin with by notifying me about Floor's iceberg on Reddit it a few months back. There are other people who I'm going to thank throughout the video, also Patreon. Alright, let's do this. Hey, have you guys heard about the time Fuko got a police officer fired in real life? Yeah, me neither. There are so many fascinating and weird fun facts about Clanad that I couldn't help but make a full-fledged video about them. Consider this a bonus episode for Clanad is perfect for me, as I'll be tying up a lot of loose ends before we embark on the final route in the game. Also, I know that for these iceberg videos, people usually have clever and funny names for each tier, but I'm neither of those things, so instead you're getting WikiHow's recipe for making making Dongo from scratch. Keep in mind that spoilers for Clanad will be discussed, and let's get started. Tier 1. Mix the tofu and sweet rice flour in a clean bowl. Visual Novel. This is the source material for Clanad, released on April 28, 2004 by Key. It was their third visual novel release, the first two being Canon and Air. Today it's available on all modern platforms except for Xbox, thanks to Sekai Project and later Prototype. Sekai Project's Kickstarter funded the 25th 15 Steam release where they were the publisher, and for the 2018 PS4 and Switch releases, the keys were handed to Prototype. Illusionary World The Illusionary World is an integral part of Clanad's story, and you'll be keeping up with it frequently throughout your journey. It follows a girl and a sentient robot made out of junk as they attempt to leave the world together and go someplace more warm and happy with lots of people in it. It's a big old metaphor for the main story, and the two are tied together at the end, so make sure you pay attention to it. Kyo Anime. In 2007, Kyoto Animation began the finale of their trilogy of key visual novel adaptations by turning Clanad into an anime. It had two seasons. The first one covered Fuko, Kodomi, and Nagasa's routes from the visual novel with an OVA adapting Tomoyo's route. The second season, titled Clanad After Story, covered the baseball route, May's route, Masai's route, Yukine's route, Komura's route, and After Story. Three OVAs were released for this season. The first covered Kyo's route, the second adapted Nagasa's story from Clanad's side stories, and the third was a recap of the entire series narrated by Tomoya, with an extra little bonus scene at the end. This episode also confirms to us that Tomoya remembers the bad ending world where Nagasa, Ushio, and presumably himself pass away. This gives us a grand total of 49 episodes. And yes, as I covered in depth in my last video, Cap A is nowhere to be found in this show. Movie. One month before Kyo Annie's adaptation began airing, Toei Animation made an animated movie based on Clanad. It was directed by legendary director Osamu Dezaki, and it takes a lot of liberties with Clanad's story. AKA, it sucks. Wait, are you allowed to be biased in an iceberg video? Sorry, um, uh, hold on. This movie exists. Side Stories Clanad's Side Stories is a short anthology featuring many of Clanad's characters both before and after the events of the visual novel. It was released in Japan in two parts back in 2010 and was brought over to the West in 2016 thanks to Sekai Project's Kickstarter reaching its second stretch goal. It plays like a drama CD more than anything. There's no player input, you just sit back and listen while reading the text. Tomoyo After Tomoyo After is a sequel to Tomoyo's route in Clanad released in 2000. 2005. You can buy it on Steam and Switch today, but it'll be the all-ages version without any of the 18-plus scenes, because unlike Clanad, Tomoyo After had those originally. Tier 2. Separate the dough into about 30 small round balls. Gay for Sunahara. This refers to the secret Sunahara ending in Clanad where the player must meet and reject the routes of several female characters before being left with no one but Sunahara. He'll ask Tomoya if he thinks he's handsome enough to be a model, and you gotta say yes if you want the ending. It's also worth an achievement, so make sure you do it when you play the game. Atsuko Okazaki. She is Tomoya's mother, the one who died from a car accident when he was very little. We know next to nothing about her, but the Clanan movie of all things allowed us to catch a glimpse of her with this picture. The funny thing is, she kind of looks like Nagasa, deepening the parallels between Tomoya and his father further. Nice touch. Irish band name. So Clanad is also the name of a 1970s Irish band that as of right 
Odin is still touring to this day. As the story goes, June Maeda thought that the word clan ad meant family in Irish and used it as the title of this game about family. It doesn't actually mean that, but that's a different entry on the iceberg, so we'll come back to that. Mangas. Believe it or not, there was a manga series for clan ad all the way back in 2005, with story and art by Masaki Jury. It covered the entirety of Nagasa's route and after story in eight volumes. I own them all, but cannot read them because they were never released in English. There is an unfinished fan translation out there though if you want to get an idea for what this manga was all about. There's also like five other clan ad manga out there. One of them started in 2007 by a mangaka named Sha, and they appear to be in this weird horizontal format. If the cover art is any indication though, these might actually be really good. Then you have the short-lived clan ad, uh, oh god, Hikari Mimamoru Sakamichi Day, which is another retelling of the main story. And finally, two one-shots adapting Tomoyo's route and Tomoyo after respectively, both written by Yukiko Sumiyoshi. There's technically one more out there, but we'll get to that later in the iceberg. Akio wants to kill Botan. This is one of the lesser known running jokes in this story. Every time Botan and Akio interact with each other, Akio makes it very clear that he wants to eat him. While asking Tomoya to walk Botan home from school, Kyo tells him to make sure to watch out for cars, crows, and a baker with a menacing look to him. Later on in After Story, Ushio refers to Botan as Nabe, saying that that's what Akio calls him. Nabe means hot pot, which is a type of stew. Yeah. <laughs> Heartbeat Academy. Oh, hell yeah. So, this is some stupid choose-your-own-adventure book that Sunohara keeps in his room that the player can complete for an achievement. It starts with a guy trying to ask a girl out at school, but quickly devolves into a zombie apocalypse with so many intentionally frustrating insta-kills that nobody would ever see coming. The best part about this whole gag is Sunohara saying that he was enthralled by it for hours. I recommend viewing every option because they're all gold, but if you want to get to the end as fast as possible, choose Watcher Watcher walk away, keep watching, confess, shake her off, go with Steve, fight on your own, ignore it, then go left. Kaginado. Kaginado is a series of short episodes revolving around the casts of Clan Ed, Little Busters, Air, Cannon, and Rewrite interacting with each other. It is the greatest thing ever made by man, and if you are familiar with some or most of these stories, I can't recommend it enough. Also, Season 2 added Angel Beats, which made it even better. Fuko's Light Orb. As it turns Turns out, me, you don't get a light orb from Fuko's route. In my Fuko video, I said that if you don't date Fuko, then you won't get her light orb. In reality, you just don't get her achievement. Fuko's light orb comes later on in After Story. I pinned a comment correcting myself to that video, but I don't know how many people actually read that, so I'm saying it here. Sorry about that. Tier 3. Bring a large pot of water to a boil on the stovetop. Kotomi is autistic. This is a very popular fan theory, and that's about it. Sorry that this isn't a long one, but I don't have much to add to the discussion. Sanai's bread gag is an act. This refers to the often forgotten implied truth that Akio and Sanai originally began doing their famous bread gag to make Nagisa laugh. It helps keep things lively and happy, not only for her, but for the neighborhood as well, so they've kept at it since. The Dandelion Girl. This is a short story written by Robert F. Young in 1961. It's important to Clan Ad because it was the main inspiration for Kotomi's route, and you'd already be well acquainted with it if you saw my Kotomi video. Komura's route. Fun fact, I cut this route from my Tomoyo video for the sake of pacing, so I'm going to talk about it now since this is a big info dump plus tying up loose ends thing. Komura, if you don't remember, is the old teacher who looked after Tomoya and Sunahara a lot throughout their years in high school. In a very short route that ends with Tomoya letting someone else take the last shot in basketball, locking us out of Nagasa's route, we learn that Komura intentionally pushed Tomoya and Sunahara together so that they could become friends, thinking that they wouldn't be okay with getting kicked out of school if they had a friend who went there. It worked, and when Tomoya and Sunahara graduate, they both express their thanks to Komura as they move on to the real world. There are some really nice bits of characterization here, where we learn that Komura used to be a total hard ass who taught a ton of delinquents in his day, contrasting with the snarky and playful approach he always seemed to take with these two. He also retires the year that they graduate, almost as if he could tell that by pushing these two screw-ups through high school, he'd finally come to the end of his long journey. What a great little story. I love this route. <laughs> 
<laughs> Shut the hell up, dude. Kiyoani censorship. I'm not sure what this is referring to specifically, but there were a few things from the visual novel that were toned down in the anime adaptation. Fight scenes are much less violent. Like, for example, you'll notice that blood is not pouring out of these two gentlemen as they fight like it does in the visual novel. Some scenes are much less suggestive. For example, breaking Yukine's storage shed spell only requires Tomoya to remove his shirt in the anime, while in the visual novel he has to take off his pants. There were also some bad words that were taken out of certain scenes, that kind of thing. Funny thing is, it isn't even the only version of Clanad that was censored in some way. Translating for Clanad, I'd like to take a moment to thank you, the YouTube commenters, because this next segment wouldn't have been possible without you. More specifically, uh... Ah, great name. And his buddy, who actually did the translation and localization for the Kyo and Cappy routes in the Steam version of the game. He personally wrote the pig shit joke that split my sides open when I first read it, making him my new personal hero. Anyways, they were kind enough to let me ask some questions about localizing the game, the full thread of which is in the comment section of the Kyo video. Here are some of the cool bits of info I learned. When translating Clanad for the Steam version, there were five total translators and a small number of editors. He wasn't 100% sure how long the whole process took, but he believes it took somewhere between 6 to 7 months to translate the entire script. This is probably why this game cost $45. It took a lot more work than most people give it credit for. The reason several scenes were altered in the Switch and PS4 versions of the game to be less risque or vulgar was because of the publisher change from Sekai to Prototype. Also, the ESRB ended up making some demands too. This led to the removal of the greatest joke in the history of man as well as some other stuff, like Tomoya slipping Ryo some tongue. Storage Shed Scenes Speaking of risque stuff from Clanad, meet the Storage Shed Scenes. There were five in total, one with Nagisa, one with Akio, one with Tomoyo, one with Kyo, and one with Sunahara. The premise is Yukine has Tomoya do a spell that puts him in a classic locked room scenario with whoever he's thinking about when the spell begins. Kyo's is almost identical to how it is in the anime, but it's still worth checking out regardless. If only to bring you ever closer to completing the Dongopedia. Nagasa and Tomoyo's are definitely the most erotic of the bunch. The situation being they accidentally fall into the shed because the baseball team hits a line drive right at them, and then something heavy falls on top so they're stuck there. In Nagasa's one, Tomoya has to convince her to pull down his pants while they're on top of each other so he can break the spell, and in Tomoyo's he does it himself, making her very confused and then she's all disappointed when the door opens because you can guess why. Oh, also, while recording footage for Tomoyo's, I remembered something else. When you come back to April 17th after completing the game, the animation for Sunahara getting kicked by Tomoyo will change, and his face will gradually become more dented and distorted as it continues. There's even new dialogue that addresses it, and the KyoAni anime followed suit. It's a fun little easter egg. Sunahara's storage shed scene is a bit of a filler one for if you can't make up your mind, but it's still pretty funny regardless. And finally, we come to the undisputed king of comedy, Akio Furukawa. This fucking madman ends up convincing Tomoya that he's in the mafia and it's been years since he last saw his daughter. They play it completely seriously and Tomoya never figures out that he just had a gun because he plays laser tag. Also, Akio blows up the door to get out of the shed. The next day, Tomoya tells Nagisa her father's final message to her. And not even here does he realize that this was all one big misunderstanding. Unironically, one of Clanad's best bits. And it's locked behind one of the most obscure sets of choices you could ever make. What a fantastic game this is. Oh, and if you were wondering why I'm using the Steam version of the game here, embarrassingly enough, I don't actually have my PS4 disc with me right now. That's what I get for buying physical media. Four Coma. The Clanad Four Coma manga is just that. A collection of four panel shorts featuring the cast of Clanad. I don't really like Four Coma, but some of this stuff is genuinely pretty good. It was a collaborative effort featuring well over a dozen mangaka and it was released just three months after the visual novel came out in Japan. Nagisa's favorite food. Most people assume it's Anpon because arguably her most iconic line involves her wishing to eat it, but reality is not so simple. She just says Anpon because that's usually all that's left by the time it's her turn to order in the cafeteria. Her actual favorite food is pork cutlet. Tier 4, drop the dough balls into the boiling water. Jet the Saito. Jet Saito is a really weird character who can only be seen by choosing one 
one of two very specific sets of choices, and here they are. The Saito characters are a running gag among Key's franchises, as some version of him appears in almost all of their stories. You have Mask the Saito from Little Busters, Fishing Saito from Angel Beats, Flying Saito from Charlotte, and Saito the Hopper from Tomoyo After, just to name a few. Okay, let's see. Sororado? Sorarado? I don't know. This is a remix album for the Clanad visual novel, released before the game even came out on December 28th, 2003. It contains six songs in total, and exactly one year later, a sequel was released called Sororado Append, Masai's Age. Another running joke where several characters question how old Masai really is. The best assumption we have to go off of is Sinahara's, who places her age somewhere between 23 and 99. <laughs> So, there's that. The hill represents life. The long, winding hill to school is one of the first uses of symbolism we see in Clanad. The game and the anime start with Tomoya giving Nagasa the courage she needs to keep walking up the hill, serving as the beginning of their lives together. Later on in the story, when Nagasa passes away, we're brought back to the hill where we find Tomoya standing still, alluding to the five years of stagnation he's about to go through, while Nagasa turns around and walks back down down, showing us definitively that her life has come to an end. Yukito, Kiyosuke, and Kaneko cameos. In episode 6 of the anime, you can see Yukito from Air sitting down in the background about 20 minutes in. We also see Kaneko from Tomoyo After appear as the girl who Sinohara tries to hit on before being stopped by Tomoyo. I doubt that she and Takafumi even know each other in this universe, but regardless, that's pretty funny. Finally, in episode 17, one of the gang members who corner Tomoya and Tomoyo at the school gate bears a passing resemblance to Kiyosuke from Little Busters. It's feasible that this was a reference to him, but it's not concrete like the other two. Anthologies The Clanad Anthology comic was a backer reward for Sekai's Kickstarter, and today it can be purchased standalone for 15 bucks, 13 digitally. It contains three stories, one following Tomoya and Tomoyo, one following Tomoya, Ushio, and Nagasa, and one following the whole high school gang going ghostbusting in the school at night. Tier 5. Boil the dough balls and cook them for 2-3 to three minutes after they float. I am not sure what this says. Or that's what I would say if someone in the Discord didn't translate it for me. It says Ushio's Lullaby. It's a version of the track The Place Where Wishes Come True that has lyrics. You probably wouldn't recognize it if you heard it, and that's because it's a relatively recent release that wasn't featured in the visual novel or the anime. It's part of a 2017 album by Jun Maeda called Long Long Love Song. This might have been for the best though, because with lyrics like these, this song might have killed me if it played in the anime. <clears throat> it's alright if it's not now, but someday I want to tell you about the days I spent with your mommy. Oh. Oh god. It's alright if it's not now, but someday when you've grown so much, I want you to come with daddy to the beach. I'm sure by then you'll look just like your mommy, and I want to watch the ocean waves next to you just like on that day. Ah, oh, damn it, that is so sad. <laughs> AI Space. In more lighthearted news, did you know that Clanad had its own MMO? Well, kind of. It was called AI Space, and featured locations from three different visual novels, Decapo 2, Shuffle, and Clanad. It's classified as an MMOSG or massively multiplayer online social game. Looks like people just made a character, hopped into the world, and just hung out with each other. If you grew up the same way I did, then I guess you could just call it like anime webkins. It was released on October 15th, 2008, and was permanently shut down on June 30th, 2011, which explains why all the footage of this game out there really sucks. Bad endings. So, like any visual novel, Clanad has bad endings for if you screw up a route. I've never actually seen any of them, so I went back into the game and purposely messed up a bunch of crucial choices, and here's what I found. Starting with Tomoyo, you can get her to resign to a life of complacency with you by selecting things are fine like this on May 5th. Tomoya doesn't feel any obligation to help her with the election, and she loses to some random dude. Tomoyo then throws herself at Tomoya as if to reassure her that he's enough. Later on, she says she'll drop out of school when Tomoya graduates so they can live super shitty lives together, because 
because why try to do anything more in life when you have each other, right? With Kodamis, I gave up on the last possible choice and left her garden unfinished, to which Tomoya says it's pointless, and he walks back home with the feeling that he'll never come back again. Then we get one of two generic bad endings that I found. The first one has Tomoya sitting in an empty classroom wondering if his life will ever change as he closes his eyes, stating that time is his only ally. Generic bad ending two is when he wakes up at home and scorns his family situation, saying that he doesn't have one or anyone else. He starts to think about his future, but shuts it down by saying it's bothersome. He just wants to live carefree forever, even if it means being alone for his entire life. He thinks that might actually be terrible, but as he stands up to get dressed, fatigue takes over and he flops back down on his bed, hoping that when he wakes up, something will change. Back to Kodami, if you just watch like an asshole while she talks to her parents' co-worker instead of instantly intervening, on May 4th, she breaks up with you. She says that she needs to study more and more and won't have any time for this, behavior that we know is only to atone for her parents' deaths, but Tomoya isn't aware of that yet and lets her go. We then get generic bad ending 1. For Kyo's route, I did everything right except for buying the wrong pendant, which caused Tomoya to break up with Ryo on the spot after the rain scene with Kyo. This leads to him keeping his distance from both of them. It hurt him a lot at first to ignore them, but as time went on, it felt normal. Empty but normal. It then gives us generic bad ending too. I also tried to screw up Cape's route and see if he actually dies, but unfortunately no such luck. You just never see him again and then immediately get generic bad ending too. With Fuko's route, I had Akio carry Fuko up the hill instead of myself, which fails you because I guess your connection to Fuko isn't strong enough to remember her when the time comes. It ends with the part where she brings Tomoya and Nagasa's hands together, except this time there's no big revelation afterwards, and all Tomoya hears his thank you very much as Fuko disappears forever. For Nagasa's route, I picked a choice that only a sociopath would choose and told Akio that he's a terrible father. Tomoya then says he'll help out Nagasa by himself. He fails. And then we have this awful scene where he's trying to comfort her in the drama club room. He keeps saying that he'll be the one to save her as she just sits there in silence. Alright, that's enough of those for one lifetime. Nagasa is the soulless robot. This is the very plausible theory that the second robot that Ushio and Tomoya tried to build and bring to life in the illusionary world was supposed to represent Nagasa. They build the body, a soul never gives it life, and then the two bury it while Ushio comforts Tomoya. The Past Path The Past Path is a fan-made clan ad visual novel released in 2011 that follows Tomoya's father while he was in high school. Fuko suffered brain damage. So this was put on the iceberg originally because it's a fan theory, but believe it or not, there's a lot of ironic truth to it. During an interview with Jun Maeda about Clanad, he stated that Fuko was originally supposed to be a calm, big sister type character, but that all went out the window when he saw her finished character design was short and cute. He then decided to pivot to a quiet and reserved personality, but he felt that was too boring. In an attempt to make her more entertaining, he created the bubbly, energetic, and really freaking stupid character we know and love today. Tier 6, Ladle the Balls. <laughs> Sorry. Tier 6. Ladle the balls out of the water and lay them on a paper towel lined plate. Nagasa predicted the end. After Nagasa performs her play, which is essentially a retelling of the illusionary world story, she mentions to Tomoya that she remembered the rest of it. She says the girl and the robot leave the sad, lonely world they were in to travel to a warm one full of people far away. And at the end of their journey, they sing a song. Sound familiar? Because unbeknownst to the reader at the time, that's exactly how this long, long journey comes to an end. Tomoyo is Maeda's waifu. According to interviews, Tomoyo's characteristics align very heavily with his own personal preferences. He likes aggressive characters who lead the story along, just like her. And when asked to rate his difficulty writing her out of 5, he gave it a point .5. Because apparently he would just talk to himself while writing her and whatever popped into his head first fit her character. Pretty neat. Lost Winter. Clan Ad Lost Winter is another fan-made visual novel that was released back in 2010. It follows Ushio as a young adult, and unlike the past path, this game doesn't have an English translation yet. All endings are canon. In the visual novel, collecting all the light orbs is what allows the true ending to occur. If the true ending is canon, which it undoubtedly is, then at minimum, every ending where you obtain a light orb is canon too. It's not much of a stretch to include the others in there too, but I'm not 100% sure that the writers intended for something like Jet Saito to be taken so seriously. Either way, this 
this is what I tell myself when I start feeling sad about there never being a Kyo After story. Cancelled Kyo After. Kyo After is a concept that we know has been tossed around at Key a few times. Specifically with this 2014 tweet from scenario writer Kai who said this. It's Clan Ant's 10th anniversary, so I'm throwing it out in commemoration. The sealed plan, Kyo After. The reason for the seal? After the release, I will definitely be stabbed. Now, this could either be hesitancy to make the game because he thinks fans wouldn't like it, or he's poking fun at the fact that in 2003 he actually was stabbed while riding for Kyo's route in Clan Ad and had to take time away from working on the game to recover. Good news is, is that he's totally fine today. Tier 7. Skewer 3 to 5 Dongo and lightly browned them in a non-stick frying pan. What happened to the bad end world? So, remember how Tomoya left the world where Ushio and Nagasa died to live in a new one where they're both alive? Well, that implies that this sad world may still exist out there somewhere. In the recap OVA for After Story, Tomoya even refers to it as the other world, which gives this theory at least some ground to stand on. Spooky. Clan. This is the actual Irish word for family, and what Jun Maeda probably meant to call this game all along along. Honestly though, I think Clanad has a lot more personality to it than stupid ass clan. Anna is a ripoff. Anarchy Gordon, a song that goes by many names but we'll just call it this, is a Scottish folk song that was first put into print sometime in the early 1800s. It tells the story of Jeannie, spelled like this, who falls in love with this dude Anarchy Gordon, but her father is trying to marry her off to this wealthy guy named Lord Sultan. The dad is a huge dick to his daughter, and the day of the wedding, Jeannie loses loses all hope and just dies of a broken heart. Anaki then returns from sea, hears the news, then dies from the same pain after he sees her. Clanad's track Anna took this very sad Romeo and Juliet ass song and morphed it into a very touching beacon of optimism and admittedly laughter, I mean look at those lyrics. Regardless, like the dandelion girl, I find it endlessly fascinating to see where Clanad took its inspiration from. If you'd like to compare the two tracks, I highly recommend using the, sorry if I butcher this, Lorena McKinnett version. It's the version of the song that sounds the most like Anna in my opinion. Also, huge thanks to Fujikid for bringing this to my attention with their comment on the Fuko video. Tier 8. Enjoy Dongo while they're still warm on their own or with a special sauce. Clan Ad got a police officer banned. So, this is a thing that happened and aired on local news. Only Channel 9 learned an officer just sent a text with a racial slur to his supervisor. So he had this meme of Fuko that contained the no-no word, and he sent it to his supervisor while bragging to him about winning $32 from the lottery. Real life is insane. Chubby Sanai. Originally, Sanai was supposed to be very chubby, as seen in this concept art here, but the idea was ultimately scrapped. It was kicked around that Tomoya's choices in the game could potentially make Sanai gain a bunch of weight throughout the story, but this was scrapped too. Wolf Boy. Very little is known about this guy, except for the fact that he was raised by wolves and would not wear clothes at school because he was not accustomed to wearing them. His concept art bears a striking resemblance to Cape, so it seems like he was repurposed into him. Steam version of Clan Ad changed a lot of the music. 14 songs from the original game were remade for the Steam release of Clan Ad in 2015. They include Ushio, that's like the wind, Kodami's theme which I refuse to pronounce, Spring Breeze, The Day's Leisure, Tea Party in the Reference Room, Dumb, whose remix is also known as as Sunahara dubstep by the community, A Pair of Idiots, Return to Ashes, Roaring Tides, White Clovers, Spring Breeze Afternoon, Spring Breeze Tempo Up, and Spring Breeze Piano. Out of all of them, the only one where I couldn't immediately tell the difference was with Kodami's theme, but after listening closely, the Steam version seems to have much more reverb. I highly recommend giving these a listen if you haven't already, they're pretty interesting. Fun fact, since I first experienced Clan Ant through the Steam version of the game, the first versions of these songs I ever heard were these remixes. Unused OST. Lurking in the depths of disc 3 of Clan Ad's original soundtrack are Unused Track 1 and Unused Track 2. They're both pretty upbeat and not that bad, but what I find interesting is how Track 1, at least to me, seems to have a striking resemblance to the insert song over from the anime. If you don't remember, that's the song that plays during the tennis match where Tomoya shuts down all the harem stuff that's been going on in the last few episodes. You might listen to 
the two of them back to back and think I'm crazy, but who knows. Maybe it was repurposed into that song. Tier 9. To reheat Dongo, simply pop them in the microwave for 15 to 30 seconds until they're warmed through. OST in a news report. In 2014, a Peruvian news station aired a story about families living in poverty not being able to afford Christmas presents for their children. I didn't understand a single word they said, but that did not make this any easier to watch. Throughout the story, though, they used both the piano version of Spring Breeze and White Clovers from the Clanad soundtrack. If you're wondering how it was even possible that I came across this, well, I didn't. The Iceberg's creator discovered it on a whim while researching for a presentation about poverty. This is about as deep of a deep cut as a deep cut can be. A ver, ¿es este robot? ¿De quién es? Clan Ad at the Olympics. If Clan Ad music being played for a news segment blew your mind, how would you feel about Clan Ad music being played at the Tokyo 2020 Olympics? We all know that anime had a big presence at our most recent Olympic Games, but unless your eyes were glued to the screen during an intermission for equestrian dressage, I don't even know what that is, you would have missed it. Whoever was rocking that acoustic though, you knocked it out of the park. Have a quick listen. Clan Ad Man. Shortly after Kai was stabbed, Jun Maeda suggested to him that he could finish Kyo's route for him. From this conversation came the joke that there could be a character named Clan Ad Man, who is a really lame superhero with powers like Clanatic Brush, which lets him brush his teeth really fast, and Clanatic Cleanliness, which lets him clean his room very quickly. Anyways, in Maeda's version of Kyo's story, the two sisters would have been somehow trapped in a burning building and Clan Ad Man would have saved them. I don't I don't know how, I don't know why, all I can say is I'm really sad that they didn't go through with this. Maeda's original concept. In an interview, Maeda said that he came up with the original concept for Clan Ad soon after he finished Air. He thought of Air as more of a personal project, so he wanted to appeal to a large group of people with Clan Ad and make something truly entertaining. He then put this vision into words by saying this, I wanted to present a story about a town and its people and the relationship between those people. Just a quick Quick heads up, this next theory has some major spoilers for Little Busters, so timestamp, and uh, I, I guess I'll give you like five seconds. Just waiting for the Little Busters. The light orbs created the artificial world of Little Busters. This theory suggests that Clanad's world and the world of Little Busters are connected, because both stories feature artificial worlds created because of a wish. You know, I thought I'd have more to say about this, but I really don't. I, uh, hope the potential spoiler was worth it? Photon Cookbook. This is only here to appease the people of the Clanad Discord who thought that this was really funny. There is, unfortunately, no official Photon Cookbook. However, I did find this recipe for roasted wild boar on the internet. Hopefully that's good enough. Tier 10. You can store Dongo in an airtight container for up to two days at room temperature. Tomoya broke his shoulder himself. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm just imagining him sitting in his room one day and being like, I have an idea. <laughs> Snap. Anyways, Tomoya likes punching walls when he thinks about his father. He does it twice in the anime and has to hold himself back from doing it a third time in the visual novel. He also has a very skewed view of his dad that wouldn't put him past being an unreliable narrator. Therefore, the theory goes that he might have broken his shoulder while taking his anger out on a wall rather than in a brawl with his dad. Either way, the story works, so pick your own interpretation. It is worth mentioning that the Clan Ad movie frames the whole thing as an accident. Let's make babies. This is probably the second most cursed thing I know about Clan Ed. So, among the many decade-old Clan Ed abridged videos that exist out there, there is but one that stands among them as the king. A Clan Ed themed parody of Carly Rae Jepsen's Call Me Maybe, where all the female leads in the story try to have Tomoya's kids. Everyone's voices are ear piercing and the lyrics will make you die of secondhand embarrassment, but I do not care.
I genuinely find this hilarious. As of right now, it's sitting at a criminally low 15,000 views, so on the off chance that this video gets any amount of attention, I'd like for all of you to go fix that. Clonad. This is actually the most cursed thing I know about Clanad, and every day I wish I could forget that it exists. But, all my knowledge must be exposed for the sake of this video. So now I gotta find some way to talk about this without getting murdered by YouTube's new rules. Well, this is an unlicensed adult film retelling of the first season of Clanad. A very bad retelling, interspersed throughout are naughty things, like sex, fucking, and intercourse. You've got stuff like this in scenes where they never were before, like Tomoya and Kyo getting locked in the storage shed. Then afterwards, Kyo's just like Lamau, let's forget that ever happened. So they do. Then they recreate the scene where Tomoya chooses Nagasa over the other girls at the tennis match. Then they proceed to go home and <laughs> immediately start f***ing. I, I just... <laughs> I should just stop talking. <laughs> this has been the Clanad Iceberg. See you next time when we'll be talking about anything but Clanad. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to go listen to my Hurry Starfish hip hop remix so that I can feel better. Do you believe in the perfect person theory? You know, the idea that the right person is out there for you somewhere, like true love and all that. There are a lot of people in the world, so happenstance is bound to bring those who complement each other together eventually, yeah? Well, even if that isn't true, it can definitely be applied to fiction. Not just for the people in the story, either. You can craft a character who's the ideal match for the story itself if you're skilled enough. Have you ever watched or read something and just thought, man, this would be so much better if this character just acted like this instead of this? Of course you have. Happens all the time. But fear not, there's a light at the end of this long, mediocre tunnel. Allow me to introduce you to a character who not only entertains, not only compels me to care more than any other, but one who fits so perfectly within the themes, drama, and overall message of my favorite story that it feels like divine intervention. By process of elimination, you should already know who she is, but it bears saying regardless. Nagasa Furukawa is perfect. For me. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously though, here's my number. Give me a call if you ever stop being fake. Speaking of which, I know a good handful of you were probably disgusted by that overly sentimental intro. Because there's a large population of people out there who really dislike this character. She feels fake, she's boring, all she does is be kind to people and cry when she's sad. She never does anything for herself. I hear you. And hopefully I'll be able to show you new sides of her character today that'll improve your opinion of her. As for the plot of her route, you could honestly piece together most of it from all the times we've had to go through parts of it in this series so far. Tomoya encourages her to go up the hill to school, they become delinquent buddies, something something drama club, they play basketball, the choir club sucks but not really, and something happens with like a big play at the end, I didn't really talk about that much so it's like kinda hazy, I'm sure everything goes off without a hitch though. I'll definitely be covering my bases when it comes to the actual story being told here, but I do want the majority of this video to focus on how great Nagasa is, especially since we'll be spending a lot of time with her in the near future. First things first, like with most characters. I find that the most endearing qualities about Nagasa are, ironically, her flaws. Flaws, of course, are negative traits. A great example being not pledging to my Patreon. <laughs> Anxiety is a struggle for all, but a borderline handicap for Nagasa. She doesn't give herself a break ever, and she has very little confidence. She has to remind herself that she's going to eat lunch today to encourage herself to walk to school. She'll always brush aside compliments or throw them back at people. When Tomoya says she should have no trouble making friends because she's so likable, she immediately 180s it by saying, no, 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 no. What would really happen is a bunch of girls would flock to you because you're so cool and attractive and then push me to the side. And of course, there's the classic line from Kodami's route where she walks into the drama club room and then says, I saw a bunch of people having fun, so I thought I was in the wrong room. Which, that's really funny, but oh my god, you did. <laughs> You deserve happiness too, you know. When it comes to other people though, she's the exact opposite. She always assumes the best in others, and while this ultimately allows her to become close to Tomoya, it also means her kindness is frequently taken advantage of. The whole choir club situation is the perfect example, as all it takes is one sob story identical to Tomoya's to cause her to give up on her dreams. This stark contrast between how she views herself and how she views others guides a lot of the decisions she makes in this story. I find it very interesting 
interesting to explore because of how true to life it can be. I'm sure you've met people like this. I don't know if this personality has a name, but if you cracked open your high school English textbook, I'm sure it'll fall under like tragic angel or something equally pretentious. I admit though that these traits are a scary combination that have a high likelihood of transforming a character into an unlikable pushover. It also doesn't help that physically she's very feeble too. Thankfully, this was recognized and balanced out by her stubbornness and work ethic. And that I think about it, can stubbornness even be considered a flaw? I guess it can be both good and bad, but yeah, yeah, it's definitely both. And nothing is ever going to change my mind about it. Fuck you. This is the attitude Nagasa carries into battle whenever she gets really passionate about something. Tomoya is going to loiter around and not go to school? Well, I'll just stand right here and not move until he does. My dad wants to give me free food even though I want to pay for it? Well, I'll just refuse and then the dude caves instantly because he knows how I am. And of course, there's the wonderful putting it aside jokes as I'll call them. Nagasa will sometimes fixate on an offhand comment Tomoya makes. Like, say he mentions as a joke that the big Dongo family are going to rob a bank. She says Dongo would never do that. And Tomoya tries to stop the conversation from getting derailed by saying putting aside whether or not a Dongo would do that, to which she replies with I'm not putting it aside. Dongo would never do that, and you're going to fucking agree with me, I'm paraphrasing. This addition contributes to a lot of great jokes, and helps give her a sense of presence in the story that makes it hard to write her off. And even stronger than her will is her dedication to working harder than anyone else. If I had to pinpoint my favorite thing about her character, it'd probably be this. Because she's so weak, so down on herself, and so, for lack of a better word, stupid, she takes it upon herself to overcome her weaknesses by giving it her all, regardless of how much she can feasibly give. And the best part is, they never really dwell on it. Tomoya or some other character will make a comment about how Nagisa is growing or she really is doing her best, but there isn't that constant hammering down of oh my god you're so amazing that plagues so many mediocre stories. These isolated incidents without excessive fanfare make it feel more real, like you're standing right beside the characters and observing these admirable qualities that it feels like the rest of the world is missing out on. It's things like hearing her worn out voice the day after she rehearsed for the drama club information session for hours, the way her laser focus on her play leaves no room for any outside sensory input, the level of courage and determination it takes for her to major spoiler, and especially to super major spoiler for something I'm not even talking about today. Believe me, we'll get to both of those. This mix of traits keeps her interesting and far from annoying in my eyes. She's anxious and too trusting, but she's stubborn and still thinks for herself, influencing the people around her like any normal person would. Her dedication to her work is admirable, and now that we've established how great she is as an individual, now we get to talk about how she gets even better when combined with all the other characters, particularly Tomoya. I know I said that was true for all of Clanad's characters, but it's especially true for Nagasa. Now, we know Tomoya. Basically take everything I just said about Nagasa and flip it upside down. Trusting and openly kind? Uh, no. Are you gonna be my new friends? No. But in this case, opposites attract. One of the many reasons why I recommend people do Nagasa's route last is because you get to see how differently Tomoya treats her compared to every other character in the game. A fun detail is he gives his name to her without being asked. While in every other route, when he meets a new character, it's always, what's your name? Okazaki. What's your first name? Then something along the lines of, why should I have to tell you that? Whatever, it's Tomoya. He's awfully forward about liking her, and not in the lustful Masai route way, like Jay Genuinely. It's very sweet, and the best part is, it's easy to see why he feels this way. Because in my opinion, Nagasa doesn't strike me as a character who is made to appeal to the audience like so many anime characters are. She was made to appeal to Tomoya, someone whose strengths complement his weaknesses and vice versa. This guy who lives in a home without an ounce of love in it is suddenly being invited into a warm household with a real family who cares deeply for each other. Every wall he puts up is torn down with ease as her trusty nature refuses to believe that he's as bad of a person as he says he is. She even figures out his family situation from a blind guess because, for once, she was right to put her faith in a stranger. She's someone who reaches a hand out even when she expects to get it torn right off. One day, she unknowingly opens old wounds from Tomoya's crushed basketball dreams. Then she gets a fever from running around in the rain and is out for a while. When she returns to school, she follows Tomoya's advice and waves to him from the courtyard, fully 
expecting to be emotionally shattered by his response. And most importantly, Tomoya learns that his dreams are able to live vicariously through this person, the one who wants nothing more than to give back what he gave to her, never realizing that fulfilling her own dreams would be more than enough for him. This, of course, goes both ways. Next, we meet a girl who feels trapped by the unstoppable hands of time. Everything changes while she's left behind, and it feels like nobody in the world would ever stop to recognize her. Then along comes some other reject who gives her the courage to continue as if it were no big deal. This girl who can never trust a positive word that comes her way is now face to face with a guy who only tells the truth, whether it wants to be heard or not. An asshole for sure, but to someone like her, it's the most reassuring thing in the world. And while his words often cut deep, so many times he encourages her to get back up and trudge forward. Through having to repeat a year, through the student council removing her posters, through her unintentionally crushing her parents' dreams. Whenever you feel the need to cry, come find me. This was the promise he made, and it's something that couldn't possibly mean more to anyone other than than her. No matter where you are, no matter what pastry those tears fall on, I'll be there to make things really awkward before cheering you up. I snatch the bread away from her hands and tear off the part wet with her tears. I toss it into my mouth. I'm not sure what she thinks after seeing that. It's just, I felt like drinking her tears, that's all. You know, you might be an idiot, but that's fine because I'm an idiot too. We're in the same place, a place far away from all those people who are good at getting on in the world and playing politics. It's not the most glamorous place in the world. It's certainly not one people envision when they think of an ideal life, but seeing them there in this place, supporting each other every day, it makes me believe that these two can climb to the same heights as the so-called winners of the world. So when I see the yes or no prompt to the question is Furukawa just a curiosity to me, quite frankly, it offends me that they even asked. Look, I, I know it sounds like I sit around every night drawing hearts out of flowers around framed pictures of these two, but it's not like that, really. I only do that, like, twice a week. And even so, you all know me. Nagasa will always be second place to this purple-haired charm factory right over here. It turns out I'm pretty caring. Go ahead. Why did you make it sound so genuine, you asshole? But I will concede. Nagisa is just the perfect choice for him, and their romance is on God one of, if not the best that I've ever seen. And if you know media, you can tell that by way of me being a living, breathing creature on this planet, I have heard hundreds, if not thousands, of romance stories. Of course, things go beyond the special bond these two share. This route is just the prologue to something greater, and knowing Clanad, the seeds for it are planted far in advance. There's so much going on here that I'd like to drop a cliche ass where to even begin, but that decision was already made for me, because the first spoken lines you ever hear in this game also happen to be some of the most important. Do you like this school? I really really like it. But I know that sooner or later, everything changes. The fun things, the happy things, all of it. Nothing can stay the same forever. Even if things change, will I still be able to enjoy it here? Keep this question in mind, especially as we move on to the actual final part of this story. It's not just about school, but I'm sure you get that. You're smart. You know what a microcosm is. Tomoya's advice to her in these moments is rather interesting, given that eventually, he'll find himself in a situation where he'll desperately need to practice what he preaches. You just have to find more things that are fun, more things that make you happy. That's all. That can't be too hard, right? Huh, <laughs> I guess we'll see about that. Those of you who know how this story goes will have your minds blown like I did when Tomoya confesses to Nagasa. Unlike in the anime, it happens while she's crying about giving up the drama club so the choir club can fulfill their dreams. Nagasa is ashamed of herself for tearing up, but then Tomoya says this. That's fine. Something sad happened, so it's okay if you cry. And as he says this, he embraces her. Are the dots connecting? Did I accidentally coat your walls with a messy shade of crimson? This is such a subtle parallel that I had to replay the game to notice it, and it makes the most moving scene in the entire game that much more special. Later on in the story, while Nagasa and Tomoya are talking, Tomoya apologizes for having such a sharp tongue, but Nagasa tells him she wants him to stay the way he is. She doesn't want things to change. It's because things changed that she found herself all 
all alone at school. She seems to truly mean it when she says it. As inevitable as change is, there will always come a time where we want to fight against it to preserve the things that are most important to us. Weathering the fallout from this impossible task is a true test of character, and one that we've seen many characters in this story go through over the course of this game. But now, more than ever, I urge you to keep this theme in mind. So many special memories are made throughout the course of this route, and the iconic symbol for all of them is Tomoya and Nagasa writing their names next to each other on the chalkboard in the drama club room. They say it themselves, it's a memorial of the time they spent together, and since nobody ever bothers to come in here, hopefully it'll stay that way forever. Hopefully. And as if they hadn't already set the stage enough, we get this gem of a line after Tomoya leaves his father's house to crash with Nagasa's family for a while. Will we really be able to overcome everything? Nagasa and I? Finally, we have Akio's iconic line. You're 10 years too early to see my daughter's ass. This is a special one, drenched with beautiful irony. Because later on in the story, Tomoya totally, uh, hmm, <laughs> wait... I uh, can't say that on YouTube. Okay, well, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But moving on, do you remember all the way back in the baseball route when I said a hundred or so years from now we need to talk about the illusionary world? Well, time flies when you're clonading all over the walls. The illusionary world is a story about a world that has ended. The only person who lives there is a girl, and she builds a robot doll out of junk which is brought to life by some unknown person's soul. Eventually, the two decide to leave the world together, and must do so before the company I mean, winter permanently halts their progress. You'll be told the first 10 chapters of this story periodically throughout the duration of Nagus's route, and there are several important details that connect this seemingly random tale to the events of the main story. First of all, there are light orbs everywhere in this world. I trust that by now you know that makes this place very important to the outcome of this story by default. The lights seem to have a purpose for the robot, as they stop him from moving on past this world in the first chapter. There's this fake Fabled other world from the robot's memory, a place that was warm, happy, and had a lot of people, the exact opposite of this one. Going back to the main story, the play Nagasa wants to perform at the Founders Festival is identical to the story of the illusionary world. She thinks it may be a play or a book from her childhood, but extensive searching reveals that this just isn't the case. It's kind of strange. What's more is Tomoya gets a serious sense of deja vu from the story, almost as if he was there. I know I'm telling you all to keep a lot of stuff in mind for the future and yeah, I'm sorry, but this stuff's important. It's alright though, there shouldn't be too much to cover now. We have a few side characters that need a little attention, like Akio, Fuko, Sanai, Kyo, Tomoyo, Mei, Yusuke, Sonohara, everyone in the choir club, Komura, Naoyuki, fuck my life. <sighs> Alright, let's rapid fire this. We'll be dealing with Akio and Sanai later on. For now, just know that they have a secret they're keeping from Nagasa. And also, they're hilarious as always and make this route a hundred times more entertaining. Fuko's condition is brought up in this route, which plants a small seed which will hopefully bear fruit in due time. If you'll remember, Fuko's route kind of ended on a cliffhanger, and I kind of hinted at the fact that they would resolve this eventually. Kyo is important because she's the only morally, and hopefully when I'm done with it, legally, acceptable choice for your basketball partner. I think that I have to specify that that was a joke. Anyways, I chose Tomoyo because I had never picked her for basketball before. And as much as I appreciate the relationship she has with Nagasa and the funny moments that come from this choice, it's still an unacceptable sin, as we'll learn in due time. If you ever play through this route, on April 28th, make sure you choose search the new school building, look around the third floor, then explain. You'll thank me later. Anyways, the actual basketball game is cool mess around with the other options all you like, but I urge you to finish your completed save file with Kyo. Also, the symbolism of Tomoya making an awkward shot thanks to Nagasa's encouragement that ends up making it in the end is real good. Mei shows up in this route, which, cool. It's basically the same interaction she has with everyone in the anime. She's a fun character, so it's good to see her. Sonohara is the same goofy boy he's always been, but I think his interactions with Nagasa help shine a light on both of their personalities since they're such polar opposites. I always love the bit where Sinohara is all, I'm gonna beat the shit out of the choir club, and then see Nagasa go nuts about it. Komura's here, just like with Mei, it's great to see him, even if he isn't the most important character. The choir club, like I said above, ignite one of the major conflicts in this route, and they may or may not be semi-important later on. But two people I can't beat around the bush about are Yusuke and Tomoya's father. They are extremely important, and while not much has changed from what I've already told you about them just yet, they'll pull a clan ad 
soon enough. Also, as I briefly mentioned, Tomoya became further estranged from his father and is living at Nagasa's place now. At said place, Akio tries to prevent Tomoya from snooping around and looking for the illusionary world story, in fear that he might find something else. His and Sanai's past. See, he used to be an actor and Sanai was a teacher. Their busy jobs prevented them from spending a lot of time with Nagasa. Even though back then she was as frail as she is today, she ended up getting very sick while they were out and almost died. However, by some miracle, she survived. From then on, the two vowed to give up their dreams and switch careers to something that would allow them to be with her, and thus the bakery was born. Although Nagasa doesn't know it, they've resigned themselves to living out their dreams vicariously through her. Sound familiar? Well, regardless, knowing her, she'd blame herself for what happened. So they hid it away, and Nagasa would never uncover the hidden truth of... <laughs> Alright, that's my cue to stop talking. Photo albums, journals, their entire history laid bare in front of her, and immediately she connected the dots. Seeing as how she's unusually perceptive when it comes to other people's feelings, a deep depression takes over, and just before the Founders Festival too, uncertainty clouds the air as Nagasa's performance draws ever closer, and it'll stay that way all the way up until she steps out on that stage. Unless of course you were a bitch and told Akio he's a bad father. And Anyways, instead of doing her play, Nagasa recalls the dream she feels responsible for destroying and begins to cry. Ugly cry, in front of everyone. It's a very uncomfortable scene, especially in the anime, but in a good way. And seeing that she can't just brush this aside and be happy because of the guilt, Akio and Tomoya, thanks to the player of course, decide to clear up this misunderstanding. They scream out to her, saying that her dreams are now theirs, because that's what families are. That's how they support each other. That's the happiness they they've chosen to pursue. After it sinks in, Nagasa gains the courage to perform her play. It really is quite similar to the illusionary world story. And towards the end, the girl and the robot decide to travel to a different world, one that's warm and happy and has lots of people, like the one the robot used to know. Whether or not they end up singing Dongo Daikazuku when they get there though, well that might have been shoehorned in there by Nagasa. Or maybe it's another instance of really good foreshadowing. Who can say? I've actually never played this game before. This this isn't the case for Nagasa though, who looks like she'll be starting her third playthrough of senior year pretty soon. She got sick again, same mysterious illness, same awful symptoms leaving her bedridden, same ineligibility for graduation knocking on her door. And unlike the acquaintances she had last time this happened, Tomoya feels deeply affected by this. Time is forcing him to change and move on, while leaving Nagasa behind in the same awful situation he first found her in. I couldn't even imagine repeating one year of school, always being paranoid about who knows, sitting through lectures you've already had, wasting your precious time away, and going right back to square one in terms of your social life. Regardless of the circumstances, I'm willing to bet that it feels downright demoralizing. I can imagine that this was what was going through Tomoya's head as tears trickled down his face after graduating. He goes so far as to say that he should have repeated two just to stay with her. He was always waiting for his life to change, for anything to come along and make some kind of impact. Impact. But now that he finally found happiness through Nagasa, he wants everything to come to a standstill, regardless of how impossible that is. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, you get it. And what does she say to all this? I'll try hard for another year. I... <laughs> Look, I know it's not fighting a demon, or losing your family to some freak accident, or whatever else those other fictional characters have to overcome these days, but I genuinely felt the strength it took to say that. And as she takes Tomoya's hand to walk with him, sealing their promise to be together forever, I only had one thing to write to finish up my notes for this route. I love this character. I'm all in. I'm invested, and I want more. I want to see if Nagasa will be able to graduate. I want to see all the characters' stories come to a satisfying close. I want more of these two being perfect together. I want to know what comes after this story. And while that may sound dismissive of this route, that couldn't be further from the truth. I think it's great on its own, and it deserves its spot among the other main five. It's funny. It's charming. It involves a lot of great characters. It pulls on the heartstrings. It talks about change. It's Clan Ed. And I kind of like Clan Ed. I'm glad it chose you to be its female lead. Now let's get going. We're almost at the end of this long, long journey, and it'd be a shame to stop here. 
If I asked you to use one word to describe clan ad after story, chances are 99% of you are going to give me some kind of synonym for sad. Even if I gave you as much time in the world to get your point across, I'll bet the first thing out of your mouth is still going to be, it was a sad one. Now, please stop breaking into my home just to ask me about clan ed. And I don't blame you, but I also want you to know that I only kicked in your door to prove a point. See, with media, there's often one prevailing emotion that gets attached to any given work. This one is funny. This one is brutal. Brutal, this one is disgusting, etc. Time passes, things change. And as our memories become hazier, it becomes easier to boil down a work into the simplest of terms. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I find that the media I love the most tends to encompass every emotion in some meaningful way to create a rich and endlessly fascinating experience. And I think the way our brains work necessitates something always being there to remind us how special a story is to us, even as we and the rest of the world change. This is for anyone who was deeply affected by Clan Ad After Story just like I was. Whether you just finished it, whether you've been playing through the visual novel since 2004, or even if you've only seen the anime, it's a love letter to a phenomenal story about change, family, and what it means to live. I know, look, okay, I know, that is the corniest thing you've ever heard, but dude, I cannot contain myself today. I will try my best to calm down while you stare at the intro, because hey, I haven't used it in a while. Yeah, that didn't fucking work at all. So, anyways, after story begins right where we left off. Winter is coming in the illusionary world, and a freshly graduated Tomoya wakes up at Furukawa Bakery then goes, oh, that's right, I'm supposed to get a job. This initial period of fumbling about sets the stage perfectly for this messy yet earnest transition into adulthood we see our boy go through. Akio jabs at Tomoya for being so unprepared after graduating, but offers him a job working at the bakery for now, which he happily accepts. Whoa. 30 yen an hour? <laughs> That's, uh, 22 cents. I might as well get this out of the way right off the bat. Throughout the entirety of After Story, you are blessed with numerous interactions with Akio, and somehow he is even funnier than he was in every other route. The drum bit with Yusuke, the father-in-law joke, MC Akio, the horoscope bit. Every time this game lets him cook, he puts Gordon Ramsay out of business. I'll be laughing at his jokes as they come, but there's no way I can cover them all. That alone should be incentive enough for you to play this route if you you haven't already. Anyways, Nagisa is getting beaten up by life right now. That optimistic, courageous, I'll try hard for another year energy is still there. But Tomoya can tell that she's been struggling a lot at school again. Nobody joined the drama club despite her best efforts. In fact, some kids tore down her recruitment posters and it wasn't even the student council this time. Tomoyo and the choir club girls aren't in any of her classes. And since Komura retired, the new drama club advisor is some gym coach who clearly doesn't give a rat's ass about the role. Not that it really matters since the club eventually shuts down due to lack of members. What I love about this part is seeing how much pain Nagisa is internalizing here because she doesn't want Tomoya or her family to worry. It probably isn't the healthiest behavior, but it fits her character and reaffirms how much she's grown since we first met her. She's in the same situation she was in last year. But instead of standing paralyzed at the bottom of the hill, she grits her teeth and goes to the same lesson she's already taken twice every single day. Completely isolated from her peers. A very powerless feeling washes over Tomoya as this goes on, and perhaps this is what compels him to desire the ability to protect Nagisa with his strength alone, as he puts it. I like how this next part is handled in the visual novel way more than the anime. In the anime, Tomoya talks to Yusuke one evening, then goes around to look for apartments. Then, he runs into the Fujibayashis. He explains that he can't find any cheap apartments, and Ryo says she knows someone whose older brother is moving out of their apartment soon. Tomoya Tomoya then puts two and two together and runs back to Yusuke to ask for a job. In the visual novel, he talks to Yusuke one day and the first thing out of his mouth is please hire me. I guess I just respect the opportunistic, reckless behavior here a lot more. It's also so much more in line with what Yusuke tells him the first day on the job. You look like a child who's fighting with everything he has to become an adult. By the way, you know a story has great writing when you can pick out like two dozen banger quotes from it. This is just the beginning. With his new job and apartment, secure, we get another change from the anime as Tomoya asks Nagisa if she wants to come live with him right away, which she, of course, says yes to. He then tells Sanai, who is, of course, very supportive of it. Finally, he goes to tell Akio, which, of course... <laughs> 
proves to be very difficult. He finds him checking his horoscope in the newspaper, which reads, Someone may snatch away something precious of yours this month. You will probably be holed up in bed for a while from the shock of it all. He gets frustrated by it, then hands the paper over to Tomoya to check his. This month, you'll be able to artfully steal away something owned by another. They'll be furious, but that won't matter as long as you get away. <laughs> <laughs> they continue this bit for a while, until eventually we see Akio and Tomoya walking up to the neighbor's house to apologize for breaking yet another window with a baseball. Akio is reluctant, like a child, as he exclaims, I shouldn't have to apologize for being awesome at baseball. <laughs> but as they talk to the neighbors, Tomoya takes notice of how Akio's wacky antics seem to keep a smile on everyone's face. This man has the power to make people happy, a fact that the player should be intimately familiar with by now. As they walk home, Tomoya gains a new resolve and breaks the silence by saying, you know, I... I want to make people laugh too. Yeah? Try tickling them. <laughs> can you stop being a perfect character for like five seconds so we can get this out? The conversation turns to Nagisa, and Akio finally responds by saying that if she wants to be with him, there's nothing he can say. He's lived for Nagisa's sake for so long that he understands her better than anyone, and it seems like the time has finally come to pass the torch on to Tomoya. I'll keep that smile on her face, just like you did before. Yeah. You do that. If Akio was just a comedic genius, I don't think I'd adore his character nearly as much as I do. These serious moments that portray him as an experienced, mature, and thoughtful man who cares more than he ever lets on is what makes him truly special. And I'm happy to say that we'll be seeing a lot of that side of him in After Story. Anyways, work sucks, dude. Tomoya's muscles get thoroughly shat on after every shift. I can't say I've been an electrician before, so I don't know what it's like, but dear lord do I never want to find out after reading this story. Like I said in the anime adaptation video, the best part of this section is Tomoya's dedication to working himself to the bone for Nagisa's sake. I especially love the relationship he develops with his co-workers and the boss. It seems like every day he comes in, he gets a slightly friendlier greeting until they eventually accept him as one of them. The manager is a super cool dude, and Yusuke is just easily one of the greatest characters in this story now. I didn't think that was even possible. He's the perfect mentor for Tomoya, and so many exceptional parallels are drawn between the two of them, much like how it's been with Akio. He's a total hard-ass, but he's still respectful and friendly when it counts. You can tell he cares about Tomoya, and Tomoya clearly wants to make him proud. It's a tried-and-true dynamic that is so fun to experience. You have the part where he notices Tomoya's messed-up shoulder, but doesn't tell anyone because he respects his dedication to overcome his handicap. The whole situation with the Founders Festival is, as you all know, phenomenal. Tomoya makes a mistake on one of his first solo jobs, causing Yusuke to go fix it the next day without telling him, since Tomoya has a date with Nagisa at the Founders Festival. Tomoya finds out though thanks to the manager, and rushes over to take responsibility, missing out on the date. It's one of those weird situations where you know that this guy is a moron for doing what he did, but you can't feel anything but admiration. For that to be his first instinct, even though he had important plans today, really highlights the quality of his character. Time passes, we get a lot of great scenes with Nagisa, Akio, Sanai and Yusuke, as well as some clever foreshadowing as Tomoya starts to become disillusioned with changes in the town and technology, before something comes up that'll make all you anime onlys out there do a double take. See, Akio's old friends are going to be putting on a play, and they invited him to come because he's a cool dude. Nagisa suggests that Tomoya take his place at the bakery so he can go, and we tell her absolutely not, because we can't actually do this sub route right now, and I refuse to try to make people happy if it's a suboptimal play. However, it's worth mentioning that if you do try and fail to go down this route now, you get to see more of Go-Getter Nagisa, which is always a treat. Sanai, on the other hand, has a visual novel exclusive story that we can go through right now. You know how in the anime they show you Sanai's cram school which she runs in the bakery for a quick joke and then you never see it again? Well, here's what they skipped out on. One day, Tomoya visits the bakery and finds a newspaper paper that tells of a new, proper cram school opening up in the area. The guy who teaches there is one of Sanai's former students, someone who really looks up to her and swore to become a teacher just like her when he grew up. That's very sweet, but the burning question on everyone's mind is won't that put Sanai out of business? Well, it's complicated. See, the dude wants Sanai to come teach at the new cram school, right on, but that would mean she has to leave the bakery, which she doesn't want to do because she's very passionate about it. Plus, business would go down 
down since a lot of their customers only come to see her, which is understandable, right off. Because she's not the selfish type, she plans on just handing over the kids she's teaching to the new school so they can have better facilities. She smiles as she tells this to Tomoya, who isn't surprised to see that she's taking this on the chin but still feels like she's holding something back, and tries to comfort her a little by saying, I would have loved to have you as a teacher. She responds that she would have liked it too, but unfortunately she only teaches up to a high school level, so he's a little too old for her to teach him anything. This causes Tomoya to have a flashback to one of Akio's offhand comments about Sanai teaching Tomoya how to have sex after Nagisa inadvertently calls him impotent, which, as you might think, leads to the best line in the visual novel. There is one thing she can teach me. <laughs> and then he just screams no out loud. Call it karma for the player admitting they love Sanai and Nagus's route. And if you thought the torment was over, you're dead wrong. Tomoya keeps coming back to the bakery during breaks at work because he's worried. And one day, he finds Sanai there alone. She wonders why he started visiting so often, and then asks if it's because he loves her. He admits that he does, and Sanai gives him a hug. Tomoya starts to think, oh crap, this is bad. But then the situation flips from comedic to wholesome on a dime as Sanai begins to stroke his head almost like a mother would. She tells him she knows about his mom and wanted to try comforting him just like she did when she was still alive. I've said it before and I'll say it again. This is one of the kindest and most genuine characters ever written. What's important though is how her actions in this sub route beautifully contextualize the actions she'll take later in this story. Three things to keep in mind. She's ridiculously kind. She loves this guy as if he was family. And most importantly, she, much like Nagasa is now, is the type who will grit her teeth and put her emotions aside when she needs to make sacrifices for the greater good. Also, Yusuke sees Tomoya and Sanai doing all this stuff, assumes that she's Nagasa, and asks to be introduced to her. One of the funniest scenes in the entire game, no question. Back to Akio, he proves that he's more mature than Tomoya twice in this side story, reinforcing Tomoya's position as a kid trying to become an adult, and Akio as a genuine role model. Unlike Tomoya and Nagasa, who try to make something happen by rallying together Sanai's students, Akio hangs back because he understands her feelings, and gets that forcing a solution would only make things harder on her. Guilt from being selfish is the last thing someone like her wants to feel. If something's going to happen, she needs to do it herself. And thus, with no means of opposition, the end came. As the kids are all reluctantly walking away from Sanai, she starts to cry as it hits her that they won't be coming back. Tomoya tries to verbalize his thoughts, but Akio beats him to it for maturity point numero dos. I think you're wrong. Deciding what's best isn't something for others to do for you. Why don't you just decide for yourself? It doesn't matter how awkward it is, just try to push on. Come on, shout. Just be selfish. And in true clan ad fashion, we get a heartwarming scene of all the kids running back to Sanai as she yells out to them. It's a short but sweet story that gives her character the attention it absolutely deserves. It gives After Story a lot of new narrative seats to work with, and it gives us another light orb. What, you thought we were done with these? Nah, not even close. Now, I think I repeated myself like four times saying Tomoya is still just a little baby boy in a grown-up's world, but as the story will so fervently tell you, things change. From here, a lot of big events are going to happen, and almost as a way to prepare both Tomoya and the player for it, Yusuke decides to tell us a story as one of his songs comes on the radio. I'm sure you've heard something similar to it before. A kid ends up finding an activity they're really passionate about. For one reason or another, they give up on their dreams and become troublemakers. And then, when things seem their darkest in this town, a loved one brings out the best in them and shows them a better path. Obviously, events happen in a different order than in Tomoya's story, like for example, Yusuke threw his singing career down the toilet after meeting Koko. But it's better this way, because not only do you get the matching broad strokes of story to draw parallels with, you also get a tale that feels wholly unique due to differences in time frames, structure, activity, the issues the characters face, all that. It has its cake and eats it too, which is pretty damn impressive. I think my favorite part is how realistic the imposter syndrome Yusuke faces is. His work began to take on a much grander meaning to others than he ever anticipated it would, and he felt as though his words were no longer his, leading him down a dark path of singing for the sake of appeasing others, rather than just doing it because he loves it. It's a trap you see so many creative types fall into, and it's certainly one to be wary of. 
of, so I really appreciate it being brought up here. Anyways, the moral of the story, which is stated outright in the anime, is don't lose sight of what's important to you. I know I still keep telling you to just remember stuff for the future, but like, we're getting there, trust me. You're, you're doing great, I'm proud of you. There's more to this whole Yusuke story arc in the visual novel, which is a super fun read. Tomoya tells Nagasa the whole story and has her listen to Yusuke's CD, which I think think they got from May? Either way, she loves it, and decides that she wants to go tell Coco her thoughts. I chose to go along with her, and while Coco is initially shocked, our genuine feelings about the CD seem to make her realize something, and she decides to convince Yusuke to work on an independent album. You know, as time goes on, it seems like that line Tomoya dropped back in high school about how Nagasa changes everyone she interacts with only becomes more true. We see more great evolutions in their dynamic as Nagasa fully adapts to Tomoya's ruthless insults firing back and using his own logic against him as if she's become a professional at dealing with him, which is about as heartwarming as a conversation where two people are constantly calling each other stupid can be. You're a stupid girl, aren't you? In that case, that makes you a stupid girl's boyfriend. I may be a stupid girl's boyfriend, but at least I'm not stupid. We're living together, so you'll catch it soon enough. Oh, get fucked, dude. <laughs> Anyways, the album eventually comes out, and there are some highlights I want to briefly go over. First, Tomoya assuming Akio can play the drums because in most movies there's always a jack-of-all-trades character hiding under everyone's noses is exceptional. And when I first played the visual novel, I totally believed he could do it before the rug was pulled out from under me, resulting in one of the biggest laughs this game has ever gotten out of me. I always liked how when Yusuke tells Tomoya he's going to work on music again, the first words out of his mouth are just, rejoice, my fan. I love the part where he talks about what a big pile of poop the indie music scene is, how it's just a money bonfire that takes an exceptional amount of hard work just to accomplish meager results, but ultimately says it's worth it just because he enjoys doing it. Hell yeah. It really brings his story full circle and proves that he's overcome his imposter syndrome. Also, getting his album gives us another light orb. Awesome stuff. Speaking of awesome, Tomoya is killing it at his job right now. He's getting along with everyone, things are going great with Nagisa. It seems like nothing can possibly go Hey Tomoya, you should go visit your dad. <laughs> Shit! Nagasa has been a huge proponent of the stay in touch with your dad thing ever since she first learned about his situation, believing that there's still a relationship to be salvaged here. From what we've seen from her route and Tomoyo's route, it still feels like there's a lot missing and there's a lot of one-sided hatred here. But for the first time in this visual novel exclusive scene, I think we get to understand Tomoya's feelings a little more. He and Nagasa visit Naoyuki for lunch, and while they're eating, a similar scene to the Tomoyo route plays out. Tomoya's part partner and his dad are getting along just fine while he sits there shitting himself. And just then, we get a knock on the door from quote, a friend from work. Tomoya's lost any faith in his dad's ability to make rational decisions. And since he doesn't recognize this guy who introduces himself as an antique dealer, he tells him to go away and never come back. And if he sees him around here again, he'll beat the hell out of him. Here's reason one for him resenting his dad. He's an idiot. Always going off about hunches, betting away way too much money, always getting drunk, and getting involved with these shady-ass antique dealers. He reprimands his dad for recklessly jumping into yet another venture that's doomed to fail, and he gives him back the same old I feel like my luck is about to turn around routine. Tomoya's last resort is to try to appeal to whatever bond they have left by saying that like it or not, they're family, so he's concerned for him. Now Yuki's response is to shift the conversation to talking about Nagisa. Tomoya's anger spikes as he sees it as yet another attempt by him to distance himself from his son. I totally understand where he's coming from here. This is a lot more concrete for my dumb American brain to understand than something like Naoyuki using honorifics that were at the time considered too casual for family members when talking to Tomoya. But with this guy, I have a tougher time understanding why he just changed the subject out of nowhere. Does he really resent Tomoya and want to distance himself from him? Or maybe he said what he said because there's something else regarding his kid that's really troubling him. Keep this conversation in mind as we move forward with his story. The player is then given a choice, punch the wall or hold it in. And look, I'm all for messing up somebody's deposit, but let's leave the drywall alone for today. That evening, he thinks about how if he hadn't met Nagasa, he would have been swallowed whole by life with no one to stand by him. And the thought scares him as he moves over to Nagasa's futon for comfort. Much like Koko has been to Yusuke as well as Akio and Sanai are to each other, Nagasa has served as a guiding light that's shown Tomoya the right path to take so many times in 
this story, and she'll have to work her magic again soon since Tomoya just got a call from one of Naoyuki's old work friends, saying that he was arrested. And because small town in early 2000s Japan is small town in early 2000s Japan, word travels fast, and the rest of the world snubs their nose at the son of a criminal even though he did nothing wrong, resulting in a much higher paying job offer falling through Tomoya's fingertips. He's knocked down from cloud 9 to rock bottom, feeling like he's been set back to square one because his father and this town clearly hate him. Even when he goes to the police station expecting his father to beg him for forgiveness, he just sits there with that same stupid smile on his face. Tomoya, overcome with anger, storms out of the building and drives his fist into a nearby wall. This is what hard work gets you, huh? You can grind your bones into dust for hours on end just to achieve something for you and your loved ones, and then circumstances completely out of your control can just take it all away. Poof. And it's gone. Why the hell should I even bother? Oh. Yeah, that's right. People sure are stupid, huh? What was it that Yusuke told us? Don't lose sight of what's important to you? Well, for a split second, Tomoya did, and look at where it got him. He's all worked up, thinking nasty thoughts, his hand hurts like hell, and he has the person he cares about most in the world all distraught. Now that he's realized this, he knows that being by Naga's side is the only place for him. So despite how pathetic he feels right now, he speaks his mind. Hey, Nagisa. Hi. Do you want to get married? Hi. She answers without a moment of hesitation. Hey, Nagisa, will you always be by my side? No matter what, for the rest of our lives? Yes. Knowing that makes me feel like I'll be able to keep getting back up no matter how many times I get knocked down. Well, that's good to hear, because you're about to get knocked down by your new in-law a lot. When Tomoya goes to break the news to Akio and Sanai, Akio controls the conversation to get them to make a wager. Hit one of my pitches, and I'll listen to whatever you have to say. Tomoya raises him to not just listen, but agree to whatever he says too. And so, the game is afoot. I love all the subtle ways in which Akio tests him here, as if he's fishing for signs of weakness in his character that would make him unfit to be there for Nagisa. The best one is when he noticed his messed up shoulder and asks him about it. Tomoya lies and says that he's totally fine, to which Akio responds with yeah, and don't use it as an excuse if you had an injury. Of course, you all know the somewhat cheesy yet still fantastic conclusion to this part. It's pouring rain, Akio is all, this is gonna be my final pitch, and then Tomoya not only hits it, but knocks it out of the park. Without even thinking, he sprints over to the old man and buries his head in the dirt, begging for Nagisa's hand in marriage. <laughs> I freaking love this game, dude. The plan is to hold the wedding after Nagisa's graduation in six months, so... Oh, wait, actually, I should mention that the drunk Nagisa bit is in here. Also, she gets sick again, but at this point in the school year, she'll still be eligible to graduate regardless of how many days she misses. Time passes, and she graduates at home without any fanfare. The girl who deserved to enjoy this special day more than anyone else was left all alone, in a bittersweet yet ironically fitting in to her high school career. Yeah, screw that. Let me call up the boys and we'll give you the ceremony you deserve. This is one of the best scenes in After Story. We get to see Sunahara again, Mei, Komura, the choir club girls, and hopefully Kyo. If you're following along with me and you see anybody other than her, you're a really bad listener. But enough about you. Nagisa gives her speech, and it's a wonderful and heartfelt recap of the story so far. Ending with the powerful declaration that despite it all, she still loves this school as much as she she did when the game first began, because it's the place where she really gave it her all. Distant Years, the song that plays in this scene, is perfection. The somber opening always made me feel like it was trying to portray hardships that accumulate over time. The way people struggle in life, fall down, get back up, searching desperately for some kind of light at the end of the tunnel. And as the smoke clears, everything gives way to this simple yet powerful piano piece, offering reassurance and this glimpse of hope, as both parts of the song combine for the final part of it, creating this beautiful harmony that so effortlessly conveys the intent of the narrative without a single spoken word. In spite of all the hardships you may face, 
giving it your all is always worth it. And there would be no point in giving it your all if you never faced hardships. These sentiments come across from Nagasa as we see her first tears since she promised to Moya she would only cry when she's happy from now on. And in this visual novel exclusive part, which is probably my favorite thing about this whole scene, we see the CG of Nagasa and Tomoya in their school uniforms, walking home from school, hand in hand, under the cherry blossoms. In the Nagasa route, it was just a daydream, something that seemed like an impossibility due to their unfortunate circumstances. But somehow, some way, they made it happen in the end. Hey, Pops, I'm getting married. You're still a piece of shit, though. Oh my god, Tomoya, we gotta, like, visit him and stuff all the time because I feel bad for him. Heh. <laughs> The only thing I feel bad for is the economy. <laughs> God. I need to stop writing for the day. Wait, hold on. What was the economy like back when... Okay, period of prolonged recession ended in 2002, referred to as the lost decade. All right, this is canon now. We get another great example of Nagasa growing as she applies for a job at a new family diner and confidently quells all of Tomoya's concerns when she tells him the news. It's a lovely scene, and of course, this job gives birth to the MC Akio bit, which is so much better in the visual novel because the man throws a fucking smoke bomb to escape from Sinai, and his disguise is literally just a pair of glasses and it still fools Nagasa. But I'm getting off topic here. While things are going great for Nagasa, Tomoya is still feeling a little disillusioned by all the change going on around town. The family diner was built on land that used to be nothing but trees, a place Tomoya once walked by every day on the way to school. He finds it ironic that even his own job is to make changes to the town. And on said job, Yusuke tells him about a new highway being built, as well as a road that cuts right through the mountains. Looking on the map, Tomoya recognizes several locations that the road is going to pave over. The final straw for him is Nagisa excitedly breaking the news to him that their high school is getting a new building, and that they're tearing down the old one to make room. But that would mean the destruction of... And the iconic symbol for all of them is Tomoya and Nagisa writing their names next to each other on the chalkboard in the drama club room. They say it themselves, it's a memorial of the time they spent together. And since nobody ever bothers to come in here, hopefully it'll stay that way forever. Hopefully. He slams his fist on the table out of anger before snapping back to reality and evaluating his feelings. Everything keeps changing, except for me. As time went by, I discovered something important to me and now I'm afraid of losing it. I used to wish so much for change, but at some point I began wishing for things to stay the same. And one little detail that I really enjoy here, this scene ends with Tomoya wishing that things could stay the same forever. And when we cut to the next scene, there's a time skip. Almost as if the narrative itself is saying, yeah, it doesn't work that way, buddy. By the way, you're having a kid. Good luck, jackass. Well, that's just about the biggest change you could ever add to your life. Sanai is ecstatic, Akio is fake angry, and Tomoya is just... I don't want to say indifferent because that carries a negative connotation. It's more like he doesn't know what to think. This is just kind of a thing that happened, and now he's going to do his best to make sure everything goes smoothly. Nagisa says she wants to have an at-home birth so Tomoya can give their child the first bath, leading to the introduction of Yagi, who is a midwife. Which, if you don't know what that is, like I didn't, it's this. This. Yeah, boohoo, you have to read. The best thing about this whole pregnancy arc, as I'm going to call it, is Tomoya's dedication to taking care of Nagisa. I don't know if anyone remembers this scene since I never hear people talk about it, but I adore the part where Tomoya reads up on morning sickness and wakes up at 2 and 4 in the morning to feed Nagisa even though he has work in a few hours. I guess it's not too important in the grand scheme of things, but I always saw it as such a nice gesture and it always put a smile on my face. But what comes next did the exact opposite to me, and it probably isn't what you're all thinking about. See, I've noticed that whenever I experience after story, whether it be through the anime or the game, the part that emotionally breaks me is always different. It's something I've grown very fond of because it feels like you gain new appreciation for the story every time you run it back. This time around, it struck me right as Nagasa began to feel sick a few months into her pregnancy. Because the sheer amount of kindness and support that Tomoya receives from everyone around him and the way he reacts to it just killed me. There's some stuff I got 
got to take care of in the middle of discussing this point, so apologies if this gets a little messy. It begins when Akio takes Tomoya to the construction site of a new hospital, one that we've seen foreshadowed in other routes numerous times. He decides to finish the story he told Tomoya before, the one about Nagasa almost dying when she was little. When things seemed hopeless, in a flash of desperation, Akio carried Nagasa out to a secluded clearing in the woods, then got on his knees and prayed. When he opened his eyes, it seemed as though the greenery around here embraced her, and in the morning rays of light, Nagasa opened her eyes. By this point, the player should have some kind of idea of what happened here, and almost as if he picked up on that, Akio delivers a message that resonates through the narrative to reach whoever's reading it. You're free to believe as much of that as you want, but you're probably going to have some hard times soon. But that's just more great foreshadowing, back to what really tugged on my heartstrings. When he's done telling the story, he calls Tomoya by his first name, which is beyond jarring since all he's ever called him was kid before. And to top it all off, he tells him outright that he has his full support, because they're family. Both him and Sanai give fantastic pep talks as Nagisa's situation becomes more dire, and the possibility of terminating the pregnancy is brought up. For Nagisa, however, this was never on the table, as having this child feels like the culmination of everything she's been working towards since this story began. She's weak, always has been. But through giving more effort than anybody else, she was able to eventually reach the same heights as her peers, graduating school, working a job, and now she wants to give all her strength once again to bring a new life into the world. Tomoya is understanding of this, and he tells her that being with her is his reason for living, and if her wish is to have the baby, then it's on her to make both of their dreams come true. So don't lose. And I know that the red flags are impossible to ignore here, but I do think the severity they treat this situation with is worthy of praise. Because when I think about it, most stories try to make horrific events surprising, so obvious death traps are always just swept under the rug, which ironically makes them more predictable. Let me be struck by... a flying ice cream truck. And live! <laughs> Like that's ever gonna happen. Meanwhile, in this story, you have Tomoya struggling to articulate how scared he is of losing Nagisa. And that just feels so much more real and might even convince you, just for a second, that everything is going to be okay. Back to stuff that made me cry. Tomoya asks Sanai if she resents him because he feels responsible for the pain Nagisa is going through. It's definitely in character for a guy who thinks very little of himself and also thinks too much in times of distress. And it really got the tears flowing. Flowing, especially as we transition to the next scene and Snowfield started to play. Probably the most infamous song in Clanad's OST because it always plays before something terrible happens. As if sensing the danger, Tomoya makes his way over to the hospital construction site where he finds Akio, watching over his special little spot as it's transformed into something new. Tomoya mirrors what he asked Sonohara about breaking windows at graduation, by asking Akio if committing some kind of crime to make the construction stop would help not Nagisa feel better. Obviously, he calls him a moron for suggesting it, then he says that regardless of his personal feelings, this hospital is undoubtedly a good thing. The town changes so that people can live in it, as he puts it. Tomoya mentions that he feels like he might start to hate this town, and Akio says, well, that's on you. Just don't let yourself give in to despair, alright? And if you ever feel like you have to commit a crime, tell me first. Are you going to stop me? I won't stop you. I'll do it for you instead, that's all. I never paid much attention to this visual novel exclusive line the first time I read it, but it really got me this time around. It was the perfect way to express just how much this man cares for Tomoya, and it couldn't have been more in line with his character. Maybe I was too focused on Nagisa's condition my first time through to really soak in and appreciate these Akio and Sanai scenes, but I know for sure that this time around they made me cry more than any other scene in After Story did. And the best part is, I'm positive positive that that's going to change the next time I read it. Anyways, time for pain. Nagisa goes into labor, and dear lord, it is not fun to read. It's worth mentioning that in the anime, they specify that this was weeks early and there's an awful snowstorm preventing her from being taken to the hospital. But in the visual novel, all you have to go off of is how unprepared they seem to be for it. But once it begins, it's nothing but darkness for hours on end, as Tomoya slowly but surely loses hope in this powerless situation. Much like the Kyo route, 
its strength lies in how drawn out it is, making you feel each agonizing second as if you were really there. The one-sided conversation Tomoya has with Nagasa after the birth is fantastic, as only when you can tell what's about to happen do they break out the pretending everything's going to be okay routine. I especially like how Nagasa's facial expressions get weaker and weaker as time goes on, and when it's all over, almost as if she transferred her life into the newborn Ushio, Nagasa passes away. A rendition of her theme that we've heard so many times before invades our ears with this melancholic, stagnant melody, as if the entire world is grinding to a halt. We're brought back to the foot of the hill to school. Nagasa turns around and walks past Tomoya as he contemplates not speaking to her in order to avoid all this pain from happening. However, he works up the resolve to call out to her regardless, causing her to turn around and address him, no, the player directly. No matter what life has in store for you from now on, please don't ever regret having met me. I want you to always live with strength. Is that too much to ask? Tomoya speaks up, saying no it isn't. He'll live on, never regretting the time he spent with her. She asks him to start liking the Big Dongo family too, and they walk up the hill together. Now, if you've seen the anime, this scene might be jarring to you, as in there, Tomoya doesn't call out to Nagasa. You might also think the anime's version of the scene makes a lot more sense, because it's consistent with how Tomoya acts after it ends. Personally, I think it works perfectly for both versions of this story. Remember, the visual novel is a game with player agency. I believe that this whole sequence was designed to encourage the player to not give up hope, as many scenes we've seen so far are. No matter what this game has in store for you from now on, keep pushing. There is a light at the end of this tunnel. You just have to find it. And hey, I'll even give you some time to think it over by making this a two-parter. Because Jesus, I'm at 12 pages of script already. Some things are worth taking extra time on. And I'll be damned if I rush the final part of this series because of some runtime concerns. So until then, take it easy. I'll see y'all in five years. Oh, hey, has it been five years already? Huh, time moves fast. Well, let's check in on our boy Tomoya and see how he's doing. <clears throat> I lived my life listening only to my body, not my mind. Wake up, go to work, eat, sleep. The same cycle of ingrained motions. That was how I lived those days. Oh, oh, that's bad. Why don't you take some time off? Yeah, yeah, th that's a great idea. Maybe you should. I hear those words so often that it feels like my ears ring with them, but I don't do that. I even give up my days off to keep working, but it's not as if I have a full day of work waiting for me every day of the week. There end up being times where there's nothing for me to do. One day, I try spending some money to fill that void. When I do, I realize it helps me forget about everything else more than I expected it to. Whoa, d dude, that is not... Like, at least spend it on something worthwhile, like my Patreon. <laughs> I just realized how bad that sounds, I'm sorry. <laughs> I start drinking, I start smoking, but whenever I take a look at reality, I feel like it's crumbling underneath my feet. Am I weaker than everyone else around me? Or is it just that I've experienced something more tragic than all of them? I can't figure out what it is, really. All I can say, though, is that it's too much for me. So I lose myself by moving my body, then killing time. That way, I won't ever have a spare second to think. Yeesh. Uh, to quote the Bible, this is a problem. <laughs> Ever since Nagasa passed, uh, spoilers by the way, did I mention this was a part 2 video? Tomoya has been spiraling into a deep state of depression, and if that intro was any indication, the game goes a lot more in depth with it than the anime, especially since we live inside Tomoya's sad boy brain. Two details that really sold this new characterization for me are how the game makes sure to mention that the guy does not get good sleep. In fact, he wakes up in a sweat more times than not. Kinda reminds me of my other favorite tortured soul. There's also the scene where Tomoya gets saddled with taking his daughter Ushio on a trip without Akio and Sanai. He initially doesn't want to, as he's been avoiding Ushio for the last five years because she reminds him of Nagisa. When Ushio realizes her dad probably won't take her, she looks as though she's going to cry. And Tomoya thinks this. Well, of course she is. She was looking forward to this trip, but then the two of them suddenly disappeared. It's not my fault if she starts to cry. It's those two's fault for playing a prank on us like this. At the risk of sounding like a psych one 
101 student trying to diagnose strangers with mental conditions. I think the deflection he uses here out of a greatly expanded fear for disappointing others is really powerful, and speaks to how far he's fallen since we last saw him. Hope, however, is in the air. Because while Tomoya may have tried to roleplay as Nagasa by disappearing from everyone who loves him, Akio and Sanai seem to be keen on pulling him out of despair, even after all this time. Once Sanai brings up the trip, she calls Tomoya asking him about it all the time. We'll call you in five minutes. Basically twisting his arm with kindness and persistence. But of course, once he gets there, the Furukawas decide to roleplay as Nagasa too. This gives birth to the father-daughter relationship between Tomoya and Ushio. Tomoya is not a good dad. He's pretty rude and standoffish, but without crossing the threshold into irredeemable territory. Like when Ushio breaks one of her toys, he's like, oh god, you're so stupid, but he still fixes it for her anyways. When she goes to the bathroom all by herself and announces it to the world, Tomoya hits her with the classic, I can do it by myself too, but you don't see me bragging about it. And after they kill a whole day in the bakery waiting for Akio and Sanai, they see the profiles of smiling kids and their parents going on some kind of vacation out outside the store. <sighs> Screw it. Let's go on this trip with just the two of us. And while Tomoya may immediately regret this decision since the train ride contains nothing but happy families with two parents, yes, the game makes sure to specify that because it's evil, I can't wipe the smile off my face because I finally get to listen to Country Train. Music that uses train sounds and instills a sense of adventure in the listener is my favorite thing ever. And this is the best incarnation of that idea. I cannot overstate how much I adore this track, and while I kind of wish it was in the game more, I think using it exclusively for this scene to represent new beginnings for Tomoya and Ushio works really well. It's also worth mentioning that the town has changed a lot since we last saw it. This is shown really well in the anime, and even in the visual novel, they updated the background art with a few tall buildings that were never there before. But the poster child for change right now, even more so than the town, is Ushio. It's almost jarring to see what we've only known as a crying, screaming, literally just got born baby transform instantaneously into a kid who can actually form coherent sentences. Not only that, but you can tell the old man and Sinai have been raising her. She's mature, polite, but still has goofy habits like impersonating baseball players. I bet if Tomoya opened up to her, they'd get along just fine. Speaking of which, what's he up to right now? Sam! Oh, screaming at a child. This outburst is, again, great characterization, and it shows off probably the strangest thing that Ushio was taught by the Furukawas in the last five years. She runs off to the bathroom in order to cry, tries to deny it, just like Nagasa would, by the way, but once it's coaxed out of her, she reveals that Sanai told her she can only cry in the bathroom. That's, uh, stupid. Tomoya tells her this, saying that she should cry whenever she feels like it, while she still has the chance, implying that he doesn't think he has the right to cry. But I'll be the first to tell you, you never outgrow crying. It's healthy even, so go ahead, start crying right now. I'll wait. <laughs> you should see your face right now. Savor it, because that's the feeling Tomoya's been denying himself for five years now. Anyways, they skip out on the planned trip to the zoo since they're a full day behind schedule, and make their way to the next stop on the itinerary, a big field of flowers. Ugh, the hell was that? A big field of flowers. I mean, that's cool, I guess. Tomoya hoists Sushio up on his shoulders so she can see it better, which is nice. And he watches her as she plays in the flowers with the toy robot he bought her. Almost like a dad would, you know? Words cannot describe how invested I am in this relationship. It's a combination of how much I love Tomoya already, how likable Ushio is, and how the game subtly drops hints that they both need each other more than anything right now. Tomoya, well, we know he needs companionship, dear lord does he ever. And for Ushio, it's clear that Akio and Sanai haven't completely filled the void that Tomoya and Nagasa left in her, seemingly by intention. Sanai has her go cry by herself, won't tell her a thing about about Nagasa, leaving that to Tomoya, and we can see at every turn that Ushio really wants this guy's attention and approval. So when Ushio loses her robot in the flower field and Tomoya is all, this trip accomplished nothing, I'm just gonna hand Ushio back to Akio and Sanai and then resume my shitty lifestyle. It like, 
hurts, dude. I mean, here he is with a chance to make amends with his kid, and instead, he's sitting here hearing the tithe, then standing up and walking to the cape where he meets his grandmother who tells him a story about his father. <laughs> Smooth transition, yeah. This game wasn't comfortable just building parallels between Tomoya and Sinahara, Akio, and Yusuke, no. We're gonna add his dad to the mix, too. Because as we know, Naoyuki also lost his wife shortly after their child was born. The difference being, Naoyuki didn't give in to despair because he still had a kid to raise. He doesn't make great decisions, always gambling stuff away and drinking excessively through hard times. But one thing the man never did was give up, even now. He's such a broken and distant person that he never even realized that his child was all grown up and able to fend for himself. And when you look at it from this angle, his past behavior starts making a ton of sense. Remember how he changed the subject to Nagisa while Tomoya was reprimanding him? Well, what if he was just more concerned about Tomoya's progress in life rather than how he feels about him? What if that bittersweet tinge of feeling like you're on your way out of something you've dedicated the last 20 years of your life to means more to you than anything else? And what if it's become the only thing you can think of to the detriment of everyone around you? To the point where you can't even comprehend that your job was done a long time ago. This guy is an idiot. Even his mom will say so because I guess being mean just runs in this family. However, as a father, he stepped up to the plate when nobody else would. And that makes him exceptional. Tomoya recognizes that and promises to bring Naoyuki back home so he can finally rest. But before we do that, I think you know what time it is. This is probably probably the most well-known scene in all of Clanad, and yeah, it's perfect. Tomoya tells a distressed Ushio that it's fine that she lost the robot. He can always buy her another one, but she says it's not okay. Why? Because, pussy, it was the first thing she ever got from daddy, now start crying. And that's not all. Tomoya realizes what he has to do and asks if Ushio wants to be with him from now on. She says yes and then tells him she's sad because she lost something special and asks if she can stop holding that in. Because you see, Sanai told her she can only cry in the bathroom and the one exception to this rule is if she's in her father's arms. I don't... How do you write something that gut-wrenching? It doesn't even make sense. And while the CG is really nice, I do have to give props to the anime for elevating this scene so much. The perfect timing of the track, The Place Where Wishes Come True too. Tomoya's VA killed it as he apologizes several times all choked up while Ushio is crying her eyes out, and the imagery of him hugging her in front of the bathroom showing us that there's no need for it anymore is phenomenal. Plus, when Tomoya finally opens up about not Nagisa and unknowingly takes his own advice about crying whenever it's needed, we get by far my favorite shot from any show, movie, or game. The look on his face as years of repressed sadness and loneliness wash over him while he's re-experiencing these long-gone happy memories is perfection. If I could own an individual frame from this shot like you see people who are way cooler than me do all the time, I would be so happy. But even with that shot, I still gotta hand it to the visual novel. They go into way more depth with the Nagisa recap, all while Anna plays in the background, and it's just so much better. I love the way he tells the story with so much nostalgia and appreciation. I love the way they show several clips of Nagisa telling him they'll always be together right before Tomoya starts to cry. And I especially love how Tomoya talks about why he was so in love with Nagisa in such a genuine and heartwarming way. But that's all in the past now. You can't live in dreamland forever, especially when it means leaving someone someone important to you behind. And to show us his new resolve, we get a repeat of the I went potty by myself scene, but this time Tomoya wholeheartedly praises her. Just bravo. And as an encore, Akio and Sanai shed their Nagisa roleplay and come back into the bakery. We talk to Sanai first as we stand in Nagisa's room for the first time in five years. It hurts just to be in here, but it's not impossible like it was before. Tomoya thinks about all the hardships Sanai must have gone through because of him, and he says if there's anything at all that I can do, I'll do it. Sanai is confused, so Tomoya puts it in more direct terms. I'd like to spend the rest of my life making this up to you. And in response, Sanai says three words that expertly encapsulate who she is as a character and ingeniously made my eyeballs fucking throw up on the floor. Then be happy. Tomoya says he loves Sanai once again. Then Akio bursts into the room with perfect comedic timing to yell at him, making us smile in his own way. Then they go play baseball together and man is it good to be back. Our work isn't done yet though. We still have an obligation to our dad and wouldn't you know it, my theory about him is proved right as he asks Tomoya if he's done 
done everything he needs to do. Another great heartwarming scene where two grown men bathe each other ensues, my favorite little detail being when he pats Ushio's head. Tomoya finally sees that warm smile on his dad's face that was buried in his distant memories again, and then we get a CG of him with that smile on full display. He leaves as Tomoya questions whether or not he led a happy life, but for us, that isn't up for interpretation as we receive another light orb. But enough about all this. Flower fields, positive change, familial love, it's all stupid and dumb compared to this moment. At long last, we can feast our eyes upon the promised land, and soak in the sheer wonder and joy that this character can give us. Please, allow me the honor of reintroducing you to Kiyo Fujibayashi- uh, wait. What the fu- the fuck is this? The fuck is Ishii? Right, so remember when I told you to pick Kyo to be on your basketball team like seven times? This is why. As you all know, I picked Tomoyo and am now paying the price for it. In fact, not seeing Kyo in this scene bothered me so much that I immediately quit out and started a new save so I could bring her back. Granted, it only took like five minutes because of fast forwarding, but the shame will stay with me forever. At least until I move on from it, which was a few months ago by now. Also, I'm pretty sure Ishii shows up in the anime as a sub for Kyo while she's off at training, which is a nice little easter egg. Kyo is still the same old character, aka Peak, so there isn't much to complain about. And we see a familiar sense of comfort surrounding Tomoya, which he hides behind a grim smile. She hasn't changed at all. She says she got the gist of what happened and gives the whole must have been tough speech, before they get right back to where they left off, teasing each other, which is nice. But it definitely feels like they could have pushed the support she provides him with further. I know they couldn't, seeing as how her showing up is completely optional, so what can you do, yeah? At least she's here, and so is Botan, who is now large and scary, but is still our little friend on the inside. Well, that was pleasant. It'd be cool if another character we knew made a return as well. Oh, hi, Fuko. Wait, I know you. We find her along with Koko and Yusuke in the park. I love how Yusuke is playing with Fuko and laughing like a child, but then the second he notices Tomoya, he immediately regains his composure and tries to act all professional. I love how Koko almost cries when she hugs Ushio because she looks just like Nagasa, but then pulls herself together. And I really love Fuko's role in After Story. But before we get to that, these two have some news to share. They're finally getting married. <laughs> At Sanai's request, she and Tomoya congratulate them, as well as Fuko for getting out of the hospital as loud as they can, right there in the park. Everyone around them stops what they're doing to turn and clap, and as the three thank them, Tomoya thinks to himself, what a kind town this is. I know I promised this like nine months ago, but here's your payoff for Fuko's route. She's out. Coco's finally gonna get married. Everyone's ecstatic for them. And now I've got the light orb to prove it. We skip to October. The wedding happens. Coco and the seven years they've been sitting on this still could not acquire a wedding dress and we get another light orb all right now on to fuko she is an unhinged little rat and i love it you'd think that tact would be you know required when approaching a situation like tomoya's but fuko doesn't give a fucko fuko can understand if you end up seeing traces of your wife in fuko <laughs> unless we forget her other famous line please be sure to watch your neck at night she does however end up providing that bit of comfort that kyo was missing, which is awesome. Tomoya starts to cry as Ushio describes Nagasa to Fuko, and she tells him she doesn't have any plans for a while, so he can invite her over anytime. That's nice. She still tries to kidnap his kid, though. She also says she has her scent memorized, whatever that means. <laughs> Wouldn't it be crazy if that was a setup for something down the line? Anyways, we have a little calm before the storm moment as we get more interactions with Kyo and Fuko as sports day quickly approaches. Tomoya gets back into his old groove as he asks Sushio if Kyo was bullying her. And that's good, because he'll need to be performing at his peak in all aspects of life if he's gonna have a chance at beating a Kyo in the relay. It's a head-to-head, one-on-one, Clash of the Titans, Remember the Titans, Teen Titans, Throwdown, and Dushio is sick. It's the same illness as Nagasa's, and there's nothing the doctors can do. So, I'll be the first to admit that this comes across as a little convenient at first glance. Honestly, whenever I show clan ad to people, I always get worried that they'll get fed up with this turn of events and quit out on me. But time and time again, I find that these fears are unwarranted. First of all, the likability of the characters makes you genuinely feel for them in times of distress. And while that doesn't carry you all the way, what picks up the rest of the slack is the consistency of the narrative. See, nowadays I don't see this scene as the writers trying to make me sad 
Ad again like I originally did. It's no secret that Clan Ad loves its microcosms. The hill to school represents the steep, upward climb everyone takes in life, while the town seems to be a stand-in for life itself. Constantly changing, evolving as new ideas and people enter the fray, swept up by the unstoppable flow of time just like everyone else. When Tomoya's at his lowest, he always says that he hates this town, in fact, that's the first thing we ever hear him say. And on the flip side, you'll remember that whenever he spoke positively about the town, it was when he was on Cloud 9. So when Ushio gets sick and the roller coaster descends, you can imagine what he says next. Is this town just toying with all of us? Does it give us happiness as a prank just to swipe it away from us later? Does it do that to sneer at us? To laugh at us as we drown in sorrow? I'll never forgive it. I swear I'll save her, even if I can't save anyone else. At the very least, I'll save her. This idea is expanded upon during the conversation Tomoya and Akio have in their secret spot, which by now isn't so secret anymore because it's a full-on hospital. Tomoya questions if Nagasa became connected to the town the moment she was saved in this very spot, and concludes that the town must find all this change painful, and that's why it's doing this. Akio swats away his theory, however, saying, I don't think pain has anything to do with it. It probably just feels like, oh, things are changing. He glances over at a little girl being sent out of the hospital with a bouquet of flowers. He then looks away as if he doesn't want to see it anymore and stubs his cigarette before delivering what is, in my opinion, his most iconic line. May happiness come to this town and its residents. That's all you can do, huh? Just hope? Pray? Change doesn't affect the town one bit, and it doesn't feel bothered by it, even if it makes people suffer? If there's no rhyme or reason, then what am I trying to do? What am I doing here? Tomoya ponders that last point as he walks Ushio to the train station in the snow. He knows she isn't going to get better, and she knows it too, which is why they're going to try to take that trip to the zoo they missed out on before the inevitable happens. They don't get very far, however, and a familiar scene plays out as a little girl struggles to stay alive in her father's arms while it's snowing. However, this time, their hopes don't come to pass. Back in the illusionary world, we see a bit of a triple parallel as the girl and the robot are struggling to make their way through the snow. The girl reveals that it's time for the robot to leave, but says she'll stay behind because she's the will of the world, whatever that means. The robot is distraught, but the girl spells out plainly the path to take from here. If there's ever someone you want to save, search for the light in the other world. Dongo Dai Kazuku begins to faintly play in the background as both of them recognize the iconic tune, and as the screen fades to white, the girl says her goodbyes to her father. We're brought back to the title screen, and that concludes our first playthrough of After Story. Gotta say, that was a pretty sick cliffhanger to leave us on. Who would have thought that Tomoya was the robot and Ushia was the, the, the girl? Like, am I right? I really gotta hand it to the, uh... Hey, what's with that look? What, you thought this was gonna be one straight shot? Nah, dude, this is a visual novel. We have two more playthroughs of After Story to go through, but don't worry, they're not nearly as long as the first. All you gotta do is reread a bunch of stuff and specifically choose one choice differently that you probably forgot all about in order to proceed. Did I mention that using a guide is a good idea? <laughs> Set choice happens after about a minute and a half of fast forwarding, and as you might have guessed, we can finally do a Kyo sub route. I would assume they did this to ensure that super careful players couldn't just steamroll through After Story all at once. You gotta do three runs just like everyone else. Anyways, this is a great little story that is criminally absent from the anime. I like how Nagasa convinces Akio to go watch his friends perform all by herself. By the way, Nagasa's alive again, say hi. <laughs> I like the callback they set up by having Sanai tell Akio you always disappear the moment I look away. And I especially like how Tomoya essentially lives Akio's life while he's away, expanding upon their parallel more so than any other part in the game. He bakes bread, he hands out the stuff they don't sell to the neighbors, hell, he even plays baseball with the kids in the neighborhood like Akio always does. I love how he feels super self-conscious about disappointing the kids, but snaps out of it when he thinks about what Akio would do. He realizes that the old man wouldn't think at all, and so he just challenges one of the kids to a home run contest. And they have so much fun that before you know it, every kid in town is joined in, it's such a fun and wholesome moment. As Tomoya thinks about Akio while he falls asleep, he says what's on his mind to Nagasa. He's a guy who does whatever he wants, but it makes people happy and they depend on him. Huh. 
Does that remind you of anyone? Maybe somebody who just used to do whatever and then get wrapped up in other people's problems, ultimately helping them out in the end? You know, problems like trying to reform the drama club, being a ghost, being haunted by trauma, trying to save some soccer trees, or just simply being a coward? Eh, well, no time to think about it. Because the next day, we catch wind that the bus Akio was taking to come back home was hijacked and he is now a hostage. Oh dear. Strange things keep happening as we watch the live news report. The bus keeps stopping to let more passengers off, starting with the women and children. And we catch wind that one of the passengers attempted to reason with the hijacker and was stabbed for doing so. Soon, everyone except the hijacker and the hostage who was stabbed are left on the bus. At another stop, the final hostage walks out of the bus, takes a megaphone from the police, shouts something, and then hops back on. And only when the news plays back the audio in a higher quality can we here with this tall, red-haired man with a stab wound and a cigarette in his mouth had to say, We're going to be setting out on a trip now. We've actually clicked with each other. We've become friends. The boy has someone he wants to see, his grandmother who raised him when he was little. He says she'd been bedridden ever since five years ago. He doesn't know how she's doing right now, but despite that, he's going to come see her. Tomoya, Nagasa, and Sanai all begin to cry with smiles on their faces as they continue to watch. That's just the kind of guy the old man is. Dude can make friends ends with anyone, even if they just ran a knife through his abdomen. Soon, the bus stops, and Akio is taken to the hospital, where he promptly sneaks out. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Tomoya finds him first and begins to scold him, before Akio cuts him off and says that the guy's grandma had already passed away, but he seemed to be content about it. He was the one who stopped the bus the final time after all, telling Akio he had done enough. Tomoya doesn't even realize what he's talking about for a second, it not occurring to him that hearing an update on this stranger would be anywhere near the forefront of his mind right now. Sanai then finds him and repeats that line about him running away with tears in her eyes, to which Akio Akio responds by saying he'll always be with her. He may be a Dumbo who goes too far out of his way for others, but one thing that'll never change is his dedication to staying by her side. Akio is just the best, dude. I love how this sub route explores his incredibly kind nature after so much of After Story focused on his more stoic and mature side. I feel like I've said all I can say about the man, he's just a perfect character, no two ways about it. And with that, we get the final light orb. We're brought back to the title screen once again where we can see all the light we've collected shining brightly. Something's changed. And now, I think we've got enough of them to do what we were told back in the illusionary world. Fast forwarding through After Story once again, we find ourselves back in the scene where Nagasa gives birth. Everything plays out the same, even down to us reappearing at the bottom of the hill to school as she begins to fade away. But as the bright light takes over, an even brighter light appears into Moya's hands. It's warm, and it envelops his entire body as we're taken through the town. We begin to realize realize that our long, long journey is finally coming to an end, and as Tomoya reaches out, together with the countless stars, he finds his hand wrapped in Nagasa's. She did it. She survived and so did Ushio. Still barely believing what he's seen as he gives Ushio her first bath, Tomoya hears Nagasa tell him to take a look outside. Upon drawing back the curtain, what first appears to be snow has begun to coat the town, but upon closer inspection, we realize that we're staring at light orbs, the physical embodiment of happiness covering this town which represents life, all while this wonderful miracle takes place in it. As we continue to process what's taking place before our eyes, Nagasa begins to speak. If this town had a will and a heart, just like a person, and if it wished for the people who live in it to be happy, then perhaps this town was responsible for this miracle. Yeah, that, that makes sense. But actually, I guess that wouldn't be a miracle. People who love the town live in it, and the town loves those people back. Those kinds of thoughts come from the emotions that we all have. Not just this town, it's true for any town. We love the town, and the town nurtures us. That's what I think. Would you say that the town is one big family? Yeah, a big Dongo family. Oh, so that's how it was. <laughs> Could she have known that since we first met? No, I'm sure she's known it for longer. That's why she can't hate anyone. She works hard for everyone's sake. Nagasa once again tells Tomoya that it's time for him to start liking the Big Dongo family. He responds that he already loves them, and Nagasa begins to sing Dongo Daikazuku. Tomoya can't help but laugh, then joins her mid-song before delivering his last line of dialogue. Let us sing forever. Let my memories from this day on 
be for this child and this town. The credits begin to roll, but Two Shadows has been replaced with a new song, a familiar one. The melody for Dongo Daikazuku enters our ears for the final time, now with lyrics that drop all the metaphors and any sense of subtlety to beautifully restate the main takeaway of the story, answering the first question that was ever posed to us in the game. Uh, I, I never do this while recording, I swear. <laughs> Answering the first question that was ever posed to us in the game. Do you like this school? Or, peeling away the metaphor, do you like living? Even if trauma from the past makes things difficult? Even if paralyzing fear stands in the way of what you want? Even if your circumstances are beyond your control? Even if you have to give up what you love for the greater good? Even when misunderstandings cause turmoil for your relationships. Even on the days when you aren't your best, and it seems like all you do is make mistakes. Even if the world changes around you, without you even noticing. The answer to all of these questions is a resounding yes. Because the time I spend with the people I care about, the work I put in to become a stronger person every day, and the inevitability of passing everything I've learned onto an even stronger generation is what makes it worth it. And that's... What what this is really all about, yeah? I bet that if three years ago somebody told me that a fictional story taught them the meaning of life, I'd say, whoa, cowboy, calm the hell down, it's just a story. But nowadays, though I doubt even I'd give Clanad that much credit, I am positive that it's come closer to doing that for me than any piece of media I've ever experienced. So if I can, I'd like to thank everyone who worked on this story. Whether you were on the original team, translated any of the English releases, worked on or acted in the anime, the side stories, the movie, hell, even if you're just a fan who's still keeping Clan Ad alive and well in the public eye after 19 years. Everyone who helped me make this series what it was, anyone who gave me advice, corrections, or even just a nice comment. The Clan Ad Discord for giving me the opportunity to document my full playthrough of the game and the creation of all these videos. I can't wait to look back on that text channel like it's a scrapbook full of memories, because in a way, it is. And of course, the patrons who ensured that I could see this through to the end. All in all, Clan Ad is a story that I'm sure you know means a lot to me. And being able to explore it so thoroughly over- fuck. <laughs> And being able to explore it so thoroughly over the last 11 months, longer than that if you count planning, has truly been a gift. The game, while it has some rough spots, is a wonderful experience that beats out every other story in my book. The humor, the drama, the characters, it's too much for me to briefly put into words. The KyoAni anime is as good of an adaptation as one could be for this story. And the sheer artistry behind so many shots live inside my head rent-free to this day. Tomoya is the perfect protagonist who, if you've seen the first After Story video, you know I relate to a lot. The way he thinks deeply about things, often to his own detriment. His cowardly behavior, juxtaposed by his clear appreciation for interacting with others. His short temper. His determination and drive to succeed once he gets invested in something. His god-awful sense of humor that mostly stems from making fun of everyone he meets, because A, it's funny, and B, somewhere inside him it makes him feel comfortable that there are people out there who let him get away with it. I could go on, but you and I both know I'm just stalling at this point. By sheer happenstance, this video is going to be uploaded either the day of or the day after I graduate from college. I don't know what comes next. All I know is that change is inevitable, even in places like this YouTube channel for instance. Nothing can stay the same forever, but even so, I'll continue to walk forward up this long, long hill, and I hope that all of you will join me. So, for one final send-off to this story, I'll just thank you one last time. For giving me so much joy and distress, in a good way of course. For being perfect, at least for me. And for being... Planad.
Also, uh, I'm obligated to shout out the patron names, even though it's a little awkward, so here you go. Special thanks to Silent Secondary, Mr. Chocolate Salmon, Make It Totter, and Volume Warning, Shrouded Sun! I hope it's okay that I just used a rainbow font for you this time since you haven't gotten back to me yet. I'm sorry for such short notice on that. If you're watching this, check your DMs and let me know exactly what color you'd like your name to be next time. And again, thanks so much. To you, to everyone watching right now, and of course, to the rest of my wonderful patrons. I'll see you guys next time.